immensely popular with some, not popular with others, which is not relevant at the moment, but because he puts his finger on, on something about New York, whatever you think of New York, no matter where you live in the country. This is a city which behaves pretty well in crisis. There's a, there's a public spirit here in this city. You see it in blackouts, you see it in snowstorms. This is not, uh, not the city of its, uh, of its um, it's not the city that we often criticize from other perspectives around the country in times of crisis. So when the mayor says he's proud of the people of New York as well as the fire department and the police, one should not be surprised. But it is fascinating and terrifying to hear what he says. You prepare for the worst and you never believe it'll happen. And his emergency management headquarters right down there near the trade centers, which are no longer possible to offer, this is what they put into place so that in the worst of circumstances, government would have a place to operate. And they can't operate from there. They've had to move uptown because the police department and city hall are not operable, if you will, under the circumstances. And he, the mayor, you heard it yourselves, said he never believed he would live to see anything like this. True of many people. George Stephanopoulos in downtown Manhattan with an eyewitness. Yes, Peter, I'm here with Neil Stevens, who was in his, his apartment downtown early this morning getting ready for work as he heard the explosion. Neil, why don't you tell us what you saw? Okay, I was in my apartment. I was getting ready for work. I heard a large explosion, and uh, I thought at first it was thunder because uh, there was thunder last night, but there was nice weather outside, so I didn't know what it could have been. And I looked outside, and I saw some, some construction workers who were working on the roof of the building, for the building next to mine. They were looking downtown. They're all looking downtown, and I thought, I wonder what they're looking at. So I looked over, and I could see the World Trade Tower, World Trade Center towers from my from my window. And I looked over, and I could see the tower, and there was a, a huge gash in the side of it. It's about 10 stories high, almost the full width of the building, and uh, there was black smoke just billowing out of it, and uh, flames, large flames. And I thought, my God, I, you know, I don't know what happened, but uh, huge explosion, and. Uh, that was pretty much it, and uh, made some personal telephone calls, kept getting ready for work, and I was in the shower, and I heard the second explosion, and uh, that's pretty much what I saw. No, thank you very much. Sure. Peter, we also have some news on the evacuations. We've spoken with two security guards in the second tower who did say the evacuation to the second tower had begun. And we've also spoken with people who were on the 82nd and the 86th floor. So, so many people were evacuated. Of course, we don't have any sorts of numbers. One final note, Peter, I was picking up on what Mayor Giuliani was saying about the, the work of the firemen and the policemen. I would also add a word for the transit authority. The subways were, were terrifying earlier this morning, but all of the uh, employees of the transit authority did a terrific job of evacuating the subways, even though they were filled with smoke, keeping people calm and keeping them actually in the station so that they wouldn't go out into the street as the as the soot was following what one other word peter right now the people who are working downtown are handing out these respirators because there is some concern that the buildings that there was a great deal of asbestos uh in the building so they're asking everyone downtown who is walking downtown if they're down there to put on these respirators and they're handing them out on the corners thank you very much george stephanopoulos who continue to work this story from as close as you can get to the disaster area but imagine a city that's sort of frozen in place uh, you saw a picture just a moment ago of the George Washington Bridge, which is closed except under very serious um, uh, security circumstances you can get across the That means that, that that's New Jersey on the other side cut off from, uh, from the island of Manhattan. All the tunnels are closed. The railroads are not operating, therefore, between New York and New Jersey. This, this island of Manhattan uh, is, is pretty much frozen in place at the moment while people wait and are reluctant to try to appraise the number of casualties that have been, uh, that, that, have been that have occurred in the World Trade Centers in their related area. But bear in mind that what about 50,000, what did I say, Nancy, 50,000 people work in the, in the trade towers, 80,000 people perhaps work in the adjoining areas. We've seen them in flight. Um, and we have seen not one but two towers absolutely collapse upon themselves. And, and elsewhere in the country, we're still uncertain. There's still an unknown number of aircraft uh, who've been ordered to land that haven't managed to get down to the ground. We're not absolutely certain that there are any aircraft on, on, on missions, if you will, uh, which are unaccounted for, despite the fact there was a report some time ago that the aircraft outside, which crashed outside Pittsburgh, may have been on its way to Camp David. I emphasize that that's reporting um, of which we're absolutely not very sure at all. But ABC's Barry Serafin is at the Capitol at the moment, and we've been told for some time that the Senate leadership there was going to be sent to a secure location. Do you have a current status report, Barry? 
Well, Peter, we're not sure exactly what we're seeing here, but a few minutes ago, about 10 minutes ago, a military helicopter landed here behind me on the west lawn of the White House. And then a large group of people were seen to walk out to it, get on board and fly right above us, over the mall in the direction of the Pentagon, perhaps. Uh, my guess, and it's only a guess at this point, is that these were members of the Senate leadership and the House leadership, and perhaps mm. members of the intelligence committees on their way to a briefing to try to figure out what in the world is going on today. Uh, is there, uh, were you able to walk up around the hill? No, Peter, uh, we, like everybody else, have been kind of pushed off of the hill. They've got a cordon for blocks now around the Capitol. In effect, they've sanitized that area. So we're about uh, four blocks from the foot of the hill here. And, and do you have any sense of, uh, of an, was there a sense of anticipation there? People sort of waiting for something to happen at the Capitol? Well, uh, there is. Every time uh, any kind of aircraft shows itself, and there haven't been many, there have been a few government helicopters moving around, all eyes turn to the sky, as you might imagine. Precisely, Barry. Thanks very much. Barry Serafin, who's up at the, up at the Capitol. Um, one of the things that one of the things that is absolutely certain at the moment, which is to say that the chain of command in the country is very much in place. So you can just imagine yourself in some other country at the moment, anticipating, trying to anticipate, maybe even exhilarating at what's happening in the United States uh, at the moment, and trying to having some belief that you've disrupted everything. President's at 40,000 feet, just about to take off from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. We don't know where he's going, but I have to assume he's going to go to Washington. Cannot have the president being seen to be running around the country. By the way, the baseball games have all been uh, postponed today. The entire Major League Baseball schedule has been postponed uh, for today as much as a mark of mourning and sadness for what happened in a variety of locations today. U.S. Uh, earlier on evacuated uh, embassies around the world. They're all quite familiar with that because on any number of occasions in the course of a year, you hear us say on the news that the State Department of the Pentagon has ordered a worldwide alert because something is going to happen or potentially going to happen to some kind of terrorist attack that's going to occur in some part of the world. The most recent uh, terrorist alert, ironically, was in Asia uh, over last weekend. Uh, in Japan and in South Korea, American embassies were put on alert because somebody somewhere in the military, uh, sorry, in the intelligence establishment believed there was some potential for an attack. And it's something government has to do. It's something government has to do. Government has no choice, it argues. A lot of times you'll hear people saying, well, they've put up a state of alert again and, and nothing happened. And so they just do it all the time. And it's very hard on Americans traveling overseas to be somewhere where there's a state of alert. But as John McCarthy are, uh, who covers the military establishment for us points out is something government is obliged to do lest something ever happened and and there had not been an alert jack john are you there john mckenzie john mcquethy john Mc john mcquethy's here yeah here. john i'm sorry i was you i was obviously talking about not uh, not john mckenzie um this is this this is uh, i guess what one notices more than anything else today this was a place where there was no terrorism alert nobody i gather that you've talked today seemed to know anything one of the things that they have been studying so scrupulously over the last several months is how Osama bin Laden and other terrorist groups operate, Peter. They felt that they had some ability to monitor critical communications from these groups. Um, I think it's going to be proved that the groups have learned some very important and deadly lessons uh, from past terrorist events and the way the U.S. has been able to monitor them. It seems quite clear in this instance uh, that they bypassed the normal methods of communicating and were able to organize this very... No. We come in every day, a lot of us who work in New York uh, uh, who commute see the skyline and it's been the way it's been for so long and you know tomorrow we're going to come in and, and see it and some of it will be gone and that I don't know that we're all prepared for that yet. What's your sense of the way the emergency crews are operating at the moment? Can you tell? I, I cannot actually. Um, we are we are uptown uh, fairly uh, far away from it um, so uh, we are we're just hearing reports and uh, you know we're hearing all the bridges and tunnels are closed and that they're using some of those paths to get people uh, to various hospitals so uh, it's no doubt chaos but um, you know, we're really not close enough.
Boeing 757 flying from Washington to Dulles, uh, or Washington Dulles Airport to Los Angeles. It was the second plane into the World Trade Center. It carried 58 passengers, four attendants, two pilots, a total of 64 people on board. Then the United Airlines Flight 175, a Boeing 767 from Boston to LA. Uh, the airline has confirmed it has crashed, but it is not saying where. It left Boston at 7.58 this morning, bound for Los Angeles. 56 passengers on board, seven flight attendants, two pilots, a total of 65 people. They're not saying where. We do know an aircraft crashed in Washington at the Pentagon building. We're told it was a devastating hit. We'd been led to believe it was a small aircraft. We do not know that for sure. It may have been this. United Airlines Flight 93, Boeing 757 from Newark to San Francisco. It crashed outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, it was carrying 38 passengers, five flight attendants, and two pilots for a total of 45 people. It crashed near Pittsburgh at about 10 o'clock. Those are the details on the aircraft involved. Um, the major devastation, though, here in New York City, where literally thousands of people are said to have been killed uh, in the... Uh, and, and as pilots have said why. this morning that I've talked to, it just seems completely unfathomable that a pilot would be in that seat, even under duress in a hijack situation, and fly their own aircraft into a building, which would tell you that, again, the level of sophistication, perhaps, uh, of some of these people who were, quote-unquote, hijackers to take over the aircraft, it's not the good old-fashioned hijackings we've heard about that sometimes end with right. good news. This could be someone fully trained to operate a 767, which indicates, again, a level of training that goes well beyond you know just all of these, getting this idea. On this all morning. of these, a variation of a suicide mission, which also Correct. indicates uh, a level of fervor for something, Correct. a cause for whatever it was that they were uh, trying to communicate to us, which has come through all too loudly today. Anything but conventional warfare, I think, is what we yeah. uh, have to agree uh, occurred today and has been occurring around the world and certainly penetrated the... Uh, the uh, comfort level of the American people. Nothing seems to have happened by accident thus far, that's for certain. Let's get you back down to the Renaissance Center, which was, uh, uh, if, you, if you're talking about the World Trade Center being sort of symbolic of uh, New York City, I think the Renaissance Center is uh, our... Well, the President could not have spoken more accurately in that final remark there. A great nation is being tested. And the President reassures the nation and anybody else in the world who will hear this, that the nation will pass the test. And there is no doubt about that, I think. In the United States of America, as horrible as this, these incidents are, and as tragic as Oklahoma City was, um, the great strength of the nation, you know, is always there. I, I recognize that's one man's opinion and doesn't, uh, doesn't account for the individual shock of individual families or, the, or intelligence or military establishments which have all suffered a grievous blow today in, in one way or the other. But it does say, I think, what people in most parts of the world believe, that as horrible as this is for the United States and its citizens, uh, the United States continues to be unquestionably the leadership of the world and the example in the world of freedom and democracy, uh, however much one may criticize it, ourselves included, on any given occasion or incident. It's interesting that in Oklahoma today, Governor Keating ordered all state office buildings closed, and the Oklahoma City Police created a one-block perimeter around the jail where Terry Nichols is housed. So again, you have an example of how people's minds work immediately. Was somebody going to try to spring Terry Nichols from jail, or, or was someone going to attack the jail in which Terry Nichols is housed, but in the wake of Oklahoma City, and based on what's happened this morning, nobody should be surprised. Um, in, and the Associated Press has done a really good service here by checking with every state in the country so far. Gonna, as you watch this on the east coast of the United States, think about that in California, all airports were closed. Places like Knott's Berry Farm were closed today. The Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles was closed. The Library Tower, all closed. And the State Emergency Convened, State Emergency Committee convened, naturally under Governor Davis, to see that there was heightened security to all of the state buildings. In, in Florida, you know what happened. Walt Disney World was evacuated. 
closed its parks and shopping and entertainment complex. You're talking about the effect that this incident has all across the country. Airports were closed everywhere across the country, as we know, in, including in Georgia and Illinois, where the Sears Tower was also shut down in Chicago. And all state government buildings in Chicago and in, in Springfield, the Capitol, were closed down. Indiana, all the federal offices were put on alert. In Kentucky, where the southern governors were about to have their um, full scope of their annual fall conference, it was canceled. And obviously the governors of Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Louisiana. All right, uh, Dave Statter and Heather Cavett at the uh, Pentagon, where that building is still on fire. Flames are still erupting. And the middle section, as you can see, has collapsed. And there is loss of life and dead still inside that building. Many of the injured have been taken to the Virginia Hospital Center. Jennifer Ryan is there. Jen. Jennifer, can you hear me? And yes, Mike, I can hear you. Uh, we are here at Arlington Hospital. This is the primary hospital that uh, is responding to all the folks that are coming from the Pentagon with injuries. We still have folks with the trauma unit out here on the curb waiting for more people to come in, and they do expect more. Right now, the number is at 26. All Pentagon workers, civilian and military, um, all 26 victims have been uh, brought to this area with injuries that really range from cuts and bruises to burns, shortness of breath. They uh, do have one person in surgery and they do have two people we're told that are being ready to get discharged today so their their injuries definitely vary we also have video for you the video absolutely amazing the first patient arriving at 10 35 this morning they came in all different modes of transportation by ambulance by personal vehicle some people loaded two and three deep with uh, victims pulled up in vans and their own personal sport utilities trying to uh, bring people here. Police cars brought people, uh, military personnel brought people. Again, 26 in all at this hospital and they are all Pentagon workers. We have a, a severe shortage medically in the city and around uh, the area. We are in desperate need of blood in the area. If you can donate blood, you're asked to go to one of the blood collection services or call the Red Cross. They also uh, need over at uh, the Pentagon IVs, tubes, oxygen tanks. We've seen deliveries here today. The Red Cross came in with blood. Capital transfers. Now, looking beyond that, Aaron, I, I think we have to go back to the fact that everyone has talked about the possibility of this kind of thing for a long time, and we faced lesser uh, but similar attempts. Uh, this exceeded, apparently, the expectations of the intelligence experts and uh, we will learn more about that in the weeks to come but i need to underscore one point to find the people responsible is going to take a unified international effort no one nation not even the united states can do it on its own and we must have the full cooperation of the russians of the states in the middle east because i think the assumption that that's the region where this was planned is pretty solid and and I repeat this again any nation that is seen to have harbored or abetted or sheltered any of these people must be treated as co-equally responsible they cannot hide behind the facade we just saw in the remarks of the Taliban foreign minister and Peter Bergen's uh, extraordinarily insightful explanation a few minutes ago on C CNN I think is the first real glimpse into that, that the viewers have had into how dangerous this is. If the Taliban shelters Osama bin Laden, as they do, and if Osama bin Laden is responsible for this, as I think almost everyone is going to suspect, then the Taliban must be held equally responsible for what has happened today. Jeff? And Ambassador Holbrook, what can, I'm, I'm, I would like you to be specific. What does that mean? Are you talking about a retaliatory strike Is against Jeff? Afghanistan? Yeah, that's Jeff. It's Jeff Greenfield. I'm sorry, Ambassador. Hi, Jeff. No. Is that what the, you mean? That if 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 put the put the links together. No, I, let me be Jeff. Let me be let me be very frank, and I, I don't want to I don't want to lapse into uh, bloody-minded uh, verbal excesses at a moment of high emotion. But let's be very blunt about this. If a country or regime, the Taliban, or some other regime to be determined by the intelligence community, has sheltered people who played a role in this. They cannot hide behind the uh, attributes of 
they didn't know it, they had nothing to do with it. They must cooperate in the pursuit of the people responsible. And since the Taliban, a leader, has been publicly proclaimed by Osama bin Laden as the, uh, as the present spiritual leader of the Muslim world, I'm referring to bin Laden's de declaration that Mullah Muhammad Omar is the rightful leader of the spiritual leader of the Muslim world, something he said on tape, quoted by John Burns in the New York Times two days ago. And uh, if, in fact, these people are in some degree of collusion, I personally believe, and I'm only speaking for myself here, I personally believe that the Taliban should be uh, regarded as co-equally responsible for this, and therefore, if and when we consider military action, it, sh it is fully justified, and... Uh, and the Taliban should face the same consequences. Uh, Ambassador, thank you. Just uh, quickly, if we can, one uh, uh, last question to Sandy Berger. When, when you were at the table, in, in honesty, did you ever anticipate the magnitude, an attack of this magnitude, which has taken place just to remind people, not just in this city, in New York, not just in the capital, Washington, but on a number of airliners flying across the country as well. Was the planning that broad, with the fear that great? Well, I think uh, uh, for, for some time, uh, uh, we have known uh, that we are uh, uh, vulnerable to a, uh, a, a serious attack. Uh, a multiple attack was thwarted, as you recall, during the Millennium New Year. Um, but I think this, you know, certainly exceeds uh, in scope um, anything that uh, intelligence community anticipated, um, and uh, uh, is a, as I said, a, an extraordinarily sophisticated operation. Uh, to carry out an op something like this from, from various sites in the United States relatively simultaneously without detection. Um, and uh, uh, whoever has, uh, has perpetrated this has, has declared war on the United States, uh, and uh, uh, we, we, we will have to respond uh, uh, accordingly. But I would, I would also caution here that we should, we should be careful about jumping to uh, certitude uh, about what happened here. We'll know this soon enough. Um, and we'll also know, uh, be able to find out why uh, we, this was not detected. I think that's, that's just a, an extraordinarily important point, that, that what is going on right now at this moment is more important than why it happened. And what is going on is you have thousands of people in, we presume in a number of different places whose lives are at risk, who have been hurt, who need to be rescued, who need to be treated, who need to be taken to hospitals in, in New York, uh, in northern New Jersey where the bulk of the injured are being treated here. There is a critical shortage of blood. Hospital officials are, are desperately seeking help there. Um, and as Mr. Berger said, time enough later to figure out who and how we deal with it. Uh, Ambassador Holbrook, Sandy Berger, thank you uh, both for joining us. Uh, just, William Rodriguez, I just was looking down. There are literally down below us on uh, by Madison Square Garden, which is where we're located, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people on the corner, and they are just l looking out. And from where they are, they can't see very much but the smoke. Uh, and I can't tell you if something has happened, but and it's lunch hour here, and there's just a lot of people, as there have been all morning, looking at a street that is almost empty. As New York, the southern part of New York, Penn Station by the Garden, essentially being evacuated to allow emergency crews to get to the scene. William Rodriguez is a maintenance worker at the Trade Center, I believe. In any case, he's on the phone with us now. Mr. Rodriguez, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Tell me where you were when... Well, which of the two buildings uh, were you in? I work on the building one, the and one that got hit uh, the first time. Tell me what happened. Uh, I was on the basement, which is a support floor for the maintenance company, and uh, we hear like a big rumble, not like an impact, like a rumble, uh, like something uh, like moving furniture on a, on, a, on a massive way, 
and um, all of a sudden we hear another rumble and a guy comes running running into our office and all his skin was off his body all his skin we we went crazy we started screaming we told him to get out we took everybody out of the office outside to the loading dock area and then i went back in and uh when i went back in i saw people i heard uh people that were stuck on an elevator on a free elevator because all the elevators went down and water was going in and they were probably getting drowned and we get a couple of pipes and opened the elevator and we got the people out i went back up and i saw one of the officers from the port authority police i've been working there for 20 years so i knew him very well uh, my routine on the world trade center is in charge of the staircase and since there was no elevator service i have the master key for all the for all the uh, uh staircase doors so I went up with a, a police officer and a group of uh, firemen. As we went up, there was a lot of people coming down, and while we got, it was very difficult to get up. Mr. Rod uh -huh. Mr. Rodriguez, how much time has taken has elapsed here uh, in, in this? As you recount the events, did it seem like hours, minutes, seconds? No, it wasn't hours. It, but what it did was, it seem it like? A, it's, well, there was a there was a big time like a gap it was a yeah. gap of time i won't be able to tell you if it was 15 okay. 20 minutes but it was uh it was a gap of time we heard while we were on the 33rd floor i'm, I'm sorry on the 27th floor because we stopped there with the fire department because the equipment was very heavy and they were out uh, they were breathing very hard they took a break because they couldn't continue going up so they wanted to take a break yeah and um, we have a person on a wheelchair that we were going to bring down on a gurney and a lady that was having problem with uh, with a heart attack, and, um, and some of the guy that was uh, breathing uh, hardly, and uh, we went a couple of floors up while they were putting the person in the gurney, got up to the 39th floor, and we heard on the radio that um, the 65th floor collapsed. I right, heard it collapsed. Mr. Mr. Rodriguez, let me stop you there at the 65th floor, um, and let me add. You're a lucky man, it seems like today. Thank you for joining us. Matt Cornelius, you were on the 64th floor, 65th floor? 65th floor. Yeah, that's where I work. Tell me what happened. Uh, well, I arrived at work a little bit early today. What do you do? And uh, I work for the Port Authority okay. in the Aviation Department. And uh, I was just putting my stuff away, and all of a sudden we heard a loud crash. And uh, the building started shaking, kind of moving like a wave. What did uh, you think was happening? I had no no idea. I mean, we, we figured either an airplane had hit it or a, a, our first instinct was airplane. And everyone started screaming and said, you know, move away from the windows and let's get out of here. And we saw debris fall past the window on the north side. How, how much, just to help our viewers kind of orient themselves, you're on the 65th floor of a building that is how many stories? I, I believe it's 110. So. 50 stories above you, this has taken place. I, I imagine so. Okay. We, we really had no idea um, at all what had happened uh, until we exited the building. I mean, I had no idea the, the magnitude. Just took the stairs. I believe I actually was in the stairs of that, as that same man because I remember the, the uh, yeah, so I saw the person in the wheelchair. Uh, we, we made it pretty fast down to 40th floor, and then from there the smoke got a little bit thick and uh, it, it was a lot slower. We maybe made uh, a floor about every two minutes. And how many people are in this group? with you? Uh, well, there was just one other person that I worked with that was with us. Uh, it was packed. I mean, it was a, a, not a virtual traffic jam in the staircase, uh, up and down, I guess. Um, it was very full. People screaming? No, actually, everyone maintained calm uh, really well. Uh, I was impressed with that. I think uh, for some people, it brought back memories of the bombing. People have been there before when that happened. But uh, I was amazed, really. Uh, we got in the stairway, we were moving down. Uh, when the fire department we were, were coming up, uh, they say, you know, move to left. Everyone moved to left. And everyone complied. And a couple people started crying a little bit, but you know, we said we're going to get out of here. We just got to uh, just got to focus and take it one step at a time. Was it noisy? Or was there screaming? no? It was, uh, was it quiet? Was no, it was eerie. It, it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't quiet. I mean, people were talking. I, in fact, someone was was laughing. I kept hearing that. And I thought that was strange, but. Uh, it, it was pretty normal. It wasn't. Uh, we didn't know what was going on. I mean, all we knew was something major something had, bad happened. had happened. Exactly, but we didn't really uh, understand the full severity of the situation. So people weren't pa panicking. Uh, once we got down to, the, they put us on the plaza level, 
uh, which was disturbing because the, there was a lot of debris in the plaza level and a, a lot of carnage basically. Uh, we then we then moved out the back towards uh, Broadway, and when I they said the police were saying don't look back, don't look back, and of course I made it about a half a block and I looked back and I saw the other tower on fire and I couldn't believe it. And uh, were you terrified? Were you terrified? Uh, yeah, for when we were stuck in that stairway, I mean, we stopped every now and then. It, it started to get nervous, but we never had any fear of the building collapse. I mean, we we had no idea what was going on. Uh, so um, once I got out, and it's still sinking in the real uh, full severity of it. I mean, it's just an awful, awful That's thing. That's true of everybody. Yes. So lucky man. I am very lucky. I uh, I thank God very much. Just want you mind. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Very much. Thank you. Uh, in Washington D.C. Thank you, Matt. Yep. They have declared a, a state of emergency. Do we have, do we have a guest there or, okay, uh, Wash, Washington has declared Washington D.C. a state of emergency. I believe I was just told that the Space Needle in Seattle has been closed down. Is that correct? Did I hear you guys? Um, there are a couple of points we might make there. Uh, back uh, at, at the, in the year 2000, just before New Year's Eve, uh, coming into Washington State, a man was stopped with explosives, and as it turned out, uh, that was a part of uh, a plan, a t planned terrorist attack, and it caused the city of Seattle to shut down what had been an enormously elaborate millennium celebration. They are very much on edge in Seattle. We were just there last week, and uh, it's not surprising to me that they would shut that building down. Elise Marcos is uh, an official with New York City Hospitals, and she joins us. He, I'm sorry, he joins us now. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, I hear you okay. Um, I apologize for the stuttered introduction. Tell me the situation in the hospitals. Well, in at Bellevue Hospital, which, uh, which is the largest public hospital in the city, and is relatively near the uh, the uh, incident, uh, we have, as of now, received approximately 125, uh, 30 patients. Uh, uh, two are, are dead, unfortunately. Uh, some have brain injuries, uh, very serious fractures, and uh, we are now uh, getting more patients from other hospitals that need uh, microsurgery or implantation of uh, limbs and, and plastic uh, surgery. So it, it is a rather overwhelming situation here. Mr. And, Marcos, Mr. Yes. Marcos, you were outside the buildings in that period between uh, the planes hitting and the, pl and the buildings collapsing. Can you tell me what you saw? Well, as uh, president of the public hospitals, I was asked immediately within seconds to join the crisis assistant uh, unit, which is located across the street from the World Trade Center. So I drove there, and uh, as I was parking, a, a huge uh, piece of rock hit the back of uh, uh, the car, uh, broke the windshield where I was sitting, so I'm very lucky to, to be uh, alive. Um, then when I went to the uh, center, the center was evacuated because they were afraid that a second plane may be coming. Um, I joined the fire commissioner uh, and then I needed to use the telephone because telephones, uh, so cellular phones were not working. I went into, I think, American Express building and as I was there, the, one of the buildings collapsed and we were uh, unable to leave that building and thanks to a very brave police officer who was able to find an exit, uh, we are here today. Mr. Marcos, we heard reports that people were, were jumping out of the building. Did you see that? Unfortunately, I, I saw about uh, five uh, people jumping from up uh, the building, and I can tell you there's no oh. other, I've never had such an overwhelming ex a terrible experience in, in my life, uh, though I've been in this job for a long time and I've seen a lot of things. Uh, it, it's, it's just uh, something that is very hard to describe. Uh, but at the same time, I have to say that the fire department, the police department, they were all there, they were so brave, uh, all those men and women, uh, that I, I, I feel that uh, thanks to them, uh, many people were saved. Yes, can I interrupt there for a second? Uh, when I was coming down, um, <clears throat> just as I left the building, there were still firemen inside the building on those floors that I mentioned before, on the 34, 38, 39, and 27 floor. And they, I'm, 
100% sure that they didn't make it. And the officer that told me to get out with the group that was taking the person on the gurney uh, was an officer from the Port Authority Police, Officer Lim. I know he didn't make it. Because as I came out of the uh, uh, building, I saw a lot of bodies on the floor. I saw a lady encrusted on the floor. That okay. probably one of the persons that uh, jumped from the building, if he jumped from the building. But it was like he melted on the floor. That's how bad it was. As I came out of the building, we hear the rumbling, and I was told, run. When I look up, everything is coming down. And I, I, I start running as far as I could, and we all jump under the, under one of the fire trucks right on time because everything just came right on top of us. We could have been crushed because the, the, the truck uh, was coming down on us. And all of a sudden, it stopped. And we were pulled out from under the truck. But uh, I know these officers didn't make it. Mr. Mr. Marcos, Mr. Martinez, thank you for um, your extraordinary descriptions of what was going on in and around the buildings. <coughs> Excuse me, around 9 o'clock this morning, a little before 9, and a little after 9 here in New York. We've heard a number of references today. Uh, certainly the first thing we thought of as we were coming in to the 1993, February 93 attack on the World Trade Center. And as uh, horrible as that was, and it was, six people died that day. Um, many hundreds were injured, but six people perished. Um, it is not reasonable to believe uh, that the numbers will be anything like that. They will be far, far worse. Um, and I think we're just beginning to get a sense of the magnitude. Uh, CNN's Judy Woodruff in Washington. Judy? Aaron, we're listening to your reporting and the, the, uh, the people you've been talking with, I have to say, in stunned silence. None of us uh, ever seen anything close to the magnitude of this horrific uh, events of this morning. Uh, just to quickly recap, four commercial airplanes in the United States, two United Airlines, two American Airlines, have crashed. We know two of them went into, and you can see the flights here, American Airlines Flight 11 leaving Boston on the way to Los Angeles. Uh, this is one of the planes, American Airlines 77 Dulles to Los Angeles. That plane, that second plane, believed to have crashed uh, into uh, the Pentagon, but again, that's not confirmed. The first American Airlines flight believed to have crashed into one of the World Trade Center towers. United Airlines Flight 93 leaving Newark on the way to San Francisco believed to have uh, crashed in Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. And finally another United Airlines flight believed to have crashed into the World Trade Center. In all horrific, uh, not just damage, but uh, surely loss of life. It's far too early to know uh, victims, the number of victims, the number of casualties. We do have some information we want to share with you in addition to what you're seeing in New York City. One of those planes, as we said, crashed into the Pentagon. We're going to be taking you there in a moment to our correspondent, uh, Bob Franken. But we want to let you know what we're learning, what our, what our correspondents are learning, that uh, in the last little while, five battleships, some of them destroyers, we know have left Norfolk and have uh, moved out of port in order to be deployed for security reasons along the east coast of the United States. In addition, two aircraft carriers that were based in Norfolk, in the Norfolk area, have been moved out to sea and on their way to New York, to the New York area. Now, we don't have much more information than that. We were originally told they were just leaving port for safety reasons, for security reasons. We're now told that uh, very specifically the mission of the aircraft carriers is to move into the New York area, uh, the mission of the battle ships uh, to be deployed along the East Coast. And of course, as we get more information, we'll share that with you. As I turn to Bob Franken at the Pentagon, I just want to tell you, President Bush, uh, we can tell you now, has been at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. He's now leaving that site on his way to an undisclosed location. Uh, authorities telling us uh, that they will not tell us where he is headed. Secretary of State Powell, the same uh, story there, uh, on his way back to the United States from a conference in Peru to an undisclosed location, and leaders of the United States Congress, uh, both parties and both houses of Congress, moved to an undisclosed location. 
now to our correspondent at the Pentagon, Bob Franken, who is, I believe, at a safe distance there from what's been going on. Bob, please bring us up to date. Well, we're on the east side of the Pentagon, as you can see, Judy, and you can see over my shoulder that smoke continues to billow, uh, smoke that is sometimes thick, sometimes a little dissipated, but we're talking about about four and a half hours after a plane, it uh, is described as probably being uh, a jumbo jet size plane, crashed into the Pentagon about 9.20 this morning. We now want to show you what it looks like on the west side. Uh, this is video that was shot by Vito Maggiola, who is an assignment editor and producer for CNN, who was able to get video. You can see that firefighters there are fighting in an area rings four, five, and six on the west side of the Pentagon. Uh, Vito says that it was an area, in his estimation, that was about 30 yards wide and about 10 yards deep into the building. Uh, the uh, firefighting was hampered, he says, because inside the building, sprinklers, standpipes, other forms of hydrants were damaged. Uh, there's an estimate that several hundred firefighters and emergency workers are there at the Pentagon. We're also told, of course, that there have been evacuation efforts throughout the day. We can see those. We do not have an estimate in the number of casualties. I can tell you that from our vantage point, we have seen a constant parade of casualty units, military casualty units, civilian ambulances, fire engines, and the like going to the Pentagon. There, of course, have been casualties, but as I said, we don't have any sort of estimate about that now. Now, we do also have somebody to talk with us who was an eyewitness to the actual crash. He was watching from Arlington, Virginia, which is a suburb over his name, is Tim Timmerman. Mr. Timmerman, are you with us right now? I sure am. You're a pilot. Tell us what you saw. Well, I was looking out the window. I live on the 16th floor overlooking the Pentagon in the, the corner apartment, so I have quite a panorama. And being next to National Airport, I hear jets all the time, but this jet engine I heard was way too loud. I looked out to the south, to the southwest, and it came right down 395, right over Columbia Pike. And as it went by the Sheraton Hotel, the pilot added power to the engines. I heard it spool up a little more. And then I lost it behind a building, and then it came out and I saw it hit right in front of, it didn't crash, it didn't appear to crash into the building. Most of the energy was dissipated in hitting the ground, but I saw the nose break up, I saw the wings fly forward, and then the conflagration took, you know, just engulfed everything in flames. It was horrible. What can you, what can you tell us about the plane itself? It was a Boeing, uh, 757 American Airlines, no question. Uh, you say that there was a Boeing, and you say it was a 757 or 767. Seven, it's seven, hard. Five, 757. 757, yeah, which American of course Airlines. is one of, American Airlines, one yes, of the um, new generation of jets. And of right. Course, it, uh, it, that, it was not. It was so close to me. I could. It was like looking out my window and looking at the helicopter. It was just right there. We were uh, told that it was. Uh, we were told that it was flying so low that it clipped off a couple of light poles on its way in. That might have happened behind the apartments that occluded my view. And uh, when it reappeared, it was right before impact. And like I said, I saw the airplane disintegrate and then just blow up into a huge ball of flames. So there was a there was a fireball that you saw. Absolutely, and the building shook, and it was, you know, quite a, quite a tremendous explosion. What did you see after that? Nothing but the flames. And I, I sat here and I took a few pictures out my window, and uh, I noticed the fire trucks and the, the response was just a wonderful. Fire trucks were there quickly. Um, I saw the, the area, the building didn't look very damaged initially, um, but I do see now looking out my window, there's, there's quite a chunk in it. But uh, I think the blessing here might have been that the airplane hit before it hit the building, hit the ground, and a lot of energy might have gone that way. That's what it appeared like. Well, there, there is, of course, uh, we've heard some discussion about the fact that it could have been worse had it actually gone a little bit higher and gone into what's called uh, the ring, the center the of the ring, Pentagon, exactly. which is a... Exactly. And, and this is a five-sided building. Right. As uh, you know, the, the rings are A, B, C, D, E, and it has just caught the E ring on the outside. And that's why I felt it didn't look as damaged as it could be. It looked like on the helipad, which is on that side. Right. Uh, did you see any, uh, any people being removed, any injured being removed, that type of thing? No, sir. I'm um, up at a, about a quarter of a mile, maybe a little bit closer. And um, at that point, I saw nothing like that. Tim Timmerman, thank you very much, and eyewitness duty to the crash. We still have no idea about the number of casualties. We know that there is a gaping hole on the west side of the Pentagon. As you can see, the smoke continues to billow. Judy?
All right, Bob Franken, and uh, of course our audience, uh, no surprise, hospitals in the Washington area dealing with casualties from the plane crash at the Pentagon. We were told a few hours ago there's a blood shortage in the Washington area. Hospitals wanting people to know if you are in a position to donate blood, it would very much be needed and appreciated. And I just want to quickly say here before we go to the site of the Pennsylvania crash that the D.C. National Guard was having difficulty getting through to people that it needs to mobilize and this specifically this is information uh, specific to the Washington DC area the DC guard wants to alert the 372nd military police battalion and its subordinate companies to report as soon as possible to the DC armory now we got this information just about half an hour ago and there have been so many other uh, stories and pieces of information coming in. We haven't been able to get this out, but we want it. We do want to get it out now. Perhaps it will do some good. Uh, joining us now, I mentioned to you a moment ago that uh, we had uh, we have a correspondent uh, on the scene of the airplane crash into uh, uh, the, the ground. We believe I'm going to go to David Mattingly, CNN correspondent there uh, in Pennsylvania. This is near Shanksville. Somerset County in western Pennsylvania, about 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh. David Mattingly, are you with us now? Yes, Judy, I'm here, and we are outside of the town of Shanksville. And to give you some idea of what kind of countryside this is, to my left is a huge field of, field of corn. To my right is a rolling green pastoral hill here at the edge of the Allegheny Mountains. One of the last places you would probably expect to be touched by the violence of an act of terrible terrorism like we have seen today. The people here in the area have reported that they saw a commercial airliner going overhead at about two to 3,000 feet with no landing gear down. They heard then a loud roar of an engine, at which point the jet climbed and then banked sharply to the left before going down straight on a 45-degree angle. Now, it hit the ground at that 45-degree angle. People here at the scene say there are no large pieces of debris even left from the plane no hope of uh, at this point it seems to be no hope of survivors um, there's just about every piece of emergency uh, personnel here from miles around uh, the mood is considerably calmer as you might imagine than what you might see in washington or new york but there is a great deal of concern uh, schools are being closed businesses are being closed up into pittsburgh and other parts of pennsylvania uh, uh, prayer vigils are being reported scheduled all across this part of Pennsylvania as far as away as Altoona has been reported. Also, um, at this point, uh, there has been an emergency staging area set up. We are a good ways away from the crash scene, and uh, we will see what transpires here. Judy? Uh, David Mattingly on the scene, as we're saying there, near Shanksville, a small town in Somerset County, about 80 miles south of Pittsburgh. This the side of one of the two United Airlines aircraft. This a Boeing 757 left Newark, New Jersey this morning on its way to San Francisco. This is the plane that we know crashed. And you just, uh, with David Mattingly's report, uh, looking at the site of where this plane came down. We don't know where, uh, we presume, terrorists behind this, what their destination was, what their target was. We can only presume, we can only guess, that they were short of the target, that they were headed someplace farther, uh, someplace else from where they landed. With me now here in the studio, Connecticut uh, Democratic Senator Christopher Dodd. Uh, Senator Dodd, a longtime member of not only the Senate, but of the Senate Foreign Relations mm -hmm. Committee. Senator Dodd, um, first of all, what can you say to the American people listening who want to know about the security of the leaders of our country, the president, and everyone else? Well, I think they've taken the proper steps in uh, here, and you haven't heard as much from some of the leaders as you might like at this point, but I think uh, those responsible uh, for their security are doing exactly what they should be doing. I'm told that they're in very good shape, uh, that they uh, are being isolated because we don't know the magnitude of this effort. It's, it's beyond our imagination already what has occurred, and if someone or organization clearly responsible for this, this sophisticated an effort, uh, the potential for them doing more damage is obviously obvious. And so making sure that our leaders are, uh, are secure uh, is the right step. And, and for those who may be wondering abroad who are watching this program, uh, Judy, uh, I'm a Democrat, <laughs> as you know. <clears throat> we stand completely and totally behind our president. Uh, we may have our differences from here, 
from time to time. Uh, but in a day like this, uh, which rivals, if not exceeds, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, almost 60 years ago, uh, three months from now, uh, we stand totally united behind our president and our government. Uh, they are taking the proper steps. We're pulling together as a people, uh, and we will overcome this. Initially, obviously, our prayers and thoughts goes for those who have lost their lives, have been injured in this incredibly, uh, incredible attack. And, and then Senator, we will, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Senator, I'm just going to interrupt you now. We're told President Bush uh, just about to be wheels up from uh, Good. Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. And now let's go back to Aaron Brown in New Good. York. Judy, thank you, Senator. Thank you both. Uh, I believe we have former Secretary Henry Kissinger on the phone. The Secretary is in Germany today, and he joins us on the phone from there. Mr. Kissinger, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Uh, just uh, quickly, sir, your reactions to what has, uh, is unfolding in the United States today. Well, it's uh, obviously a shocking event. It was... Uh, I was giving a speech when somebody came in and interrupted uh, the question period to make that announcement and nobody in the room believed it. They all thought it had to be a mistake. Well, it's obviously uh, it's an integrated attack and must be dealt with in an integrated way. Well, when you say an integrated attack and dealt with in an integrated way, tell me, tell me what that means, sir. Well, it is obviously it, any organization that can plan such a coordinated attack within a very brief period of time must have substantial resources and must have a very capable organization and must have a haven where it is planning these things. Uh, you can't do that in a back room. Uh, and, and when you talk about an integrated response... Well, the integrated response is, is obviously... First of all, I want to say, okay. like uh, every American right now, I'm behind the president. And this, uh, uh, the response right now has been exactly what is needed. And uh, <clears throat> the first necessity has to be to go through the tragedy to help the, uh, to help the families and to clean up the uh, uh, immediate situation then the next step will have to be a, a, a program to attempt to eradicate the source of this and to uh, bring pressure and serious pressure on governments that harbor uh, this kind of organization and especially governments where we suspect that these organizations are located. Sir, for a long time, there's been a, a kind of cat and mouse game, and I, I, don't, I don't make light of this in any sense when I say game, uh, between the governments that harbor terrorists and our government, other Western governments. It's all changed today, hasn't it? I mean, the stakes have changed enormously. The response likely will change enormously. It's all different, isn't it? Uh. That's correct. When, when these terrorists dare to attack the territory of the United States, it then becomes a question of the functioning of our society. And we have to protect ourselves, and I'm sure we will. And I think it is, it must now, it's not an isolated attack. It's not just an attack on an embassy, uh, which is bad enough. And it can't be dealt with with one, with one retaliatory blow. It cannot be dealt with with one retaliatory blow? No. There has to be a systemic attack. Uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, I, I, I understand. Uh, and I'm not sitting here uh, with, with a great plan. I'm saying this is what I would think our government will want to work towards. And... Would you expect that we, the United States government, will find enormous international support for whatever actions the United States government chooses to take, or will there be those important governments that resist here? Well, first thing is we have to protect ourselves. We would, of course, like to get as much support as we can. And we will be able to judge our friends by the degree of support that we get. Uh, but uh, 
There'll be some governments who say we have to understand the conditions that produce this. There will come a time to, pr to deal with its circumstances, but the immediate thing is these organizations have to be put on the run. If they have to uh, spend all their time trying to survive, they have less time for terrorism. And, Mr. Secretary, we heard, and I, I'm not sure you were able to, but a few moments ago, uh, uh, Chris Dodd, Senator Dodd of Connecticut, uh, compared this to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Can you give me any historical context for what has taken place today, or are we a bit too close to it all to understand it yet? Well, the attack on Pearl Harbor was, uh, I guess, the first attack, well, certainly the first attack from across the seas on the territory of the United States, but it was not yet the mainland. And I agree with Senator Dodd, this is comparable to an attack on uh, Pearl Harbor, and it must have the same response, and the people who did it must have the same end as the people who attacked Pearl Harbor. But it isn't just the people who did it, it's the people who make it possible. These are the governments that harbor those who carry out these attacks. That harbor or, or encourage them with their propaganda. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who joins us uh, from Germany, where he was attending a conference when he heard the news. He said it was silent, unbelievable. People simply could not believe what they were hearing. I think that's a term, a phrase you will hear a lot over uh, the days and weeks to come. What has happened here in New York and in Washington and in other parts of the country, unbelievable. A national tragedy. Judy? Aaron, uh, it's true, no one is able to grasp uh, the enormity of what, uh, what we're looking at and what we're dealing with here. Let's go now to the Pentagon where Rear Admiral Quigley is briefing reporters. I believe we have that picture broadcast, right now. Your broadcast to, to, to phone their families and loved ones immediately to let them know they're okay. And if they are among the injured uh, or the casualties from this, then we will, we will work our way through to identifying them and uh, and getting their names out to their loved ones, we will find a way. Where are the injured going? Where are the injured being taken? To? Uh, a variety of area hospitals. How many was the penetration of the plane itself, Admiral? How many rings at the building? I don't know. How wide would you say that gas is? 100 feet the one we're looking at? I haven't been over there to see it up close. I don't know. I think that's all for now, ladies and gentlemen. We'll we'll try to be back out and give you some more information as we can. Uh, Marine Corps only, if you wanted to do that. That's Rear Admiral. Yeah. Admiral, how many people? We've been talking, you've been listening to Rear Admiral uh, Quigley, one of the uh, folks who works with reporters in the public information office there at the Pentagon. We basically were just listening to the first few minutes of that, of that uh, briefing, uh, getting the word out to people who have friends, family members who work at the Pentagon, uh, telling them uh, if you have people who may be among the injured, we're going to try to find a way to get you that information to get, to let, uh, get the word out about which hospital they might be in. Of course, we are dealing with tragedies in untold numbers of families across the eastern, primarily the east coast of the United States, but no doubt these people who work at the Pentagon are from everywhere. People who were on these airplanes uh, are from uh, commercial jets from everywhere in the United States. Aaron, back to you. Um, it is the enormity that's a little bit hard to get our arms around right now still. Uh, some considerable number of hours since the first attack on the World Trade Center here in New York. Uh, and I want to show some pictures of the scene from the ground, but first let me just, a piece of information, United Airlines has now canceled all flights, grounded all flights until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. This is the scene that started to play out. Uh, this would be a little after 9 when the first of the Trade Centers collapsed after they were hit. People gathering, watching. You can see this, the denseness, the denseness of the smoke. People leaving in a very orderly, calm way have been the reports all morning and afternoon long. who 
was in the building talked about coming down the stairwell and that people were very quiet. There was no screaming, no crying. People shielding themselves against the smoke. that a number of New York City police and fire department personnel have been injured, perhaps some fatally, when the buildings collapsed. We know that hospitals here in New York are in desperate need of blood. know that the National Guard will be coming into the city to help in support of the 40,000 members of the New York City Police Department. We know that subway service through in Manhattan has been shut down. People are uh, evacuating streams of people through the streets. Fifty thousand people who go to work just in the Trade Center buildings, the two towers. How many of them were there at the time? We do not know. Thousands, tens of thousands more pass through, getting on and off trains, going to the retail shops and restaurants. Every one of those lives changed today, as perhaps in some way all of our lives have been changed today. began at 8.45 this morning, and behind us now, the smoke continues to pour out of the area where the Trade Center towers were. They are no more. They collapsed in the hour after the attack, but the smoke continues to pour through that area behind us about 30 blocks away in one of those scenes that none of us will ever forget. CNN correspondent Richard Roth has been on the streets here in Lower Manhattan. Richard? Yes, Aaron. Uh, it, not chaos here. It's almost eerily silent of the, the march of thousands of New Yorkers evacuating southern Manhattan, looking to go to New Jersey to get off this island. Dazed, stunned, people concerned about loved ones, cell phones not working. New Yorkers are used to coping with a lot of things here. There have been some bombings and hurricanes and calamities, but really nothing like this before. And of course, behind me are the clouds of where the World Trade Center stood, two towers built in 1970. A short time ago, a Port Authority police official, the Port Authority is the state unit that runs, in effect, the World Trade Center, uh, those buildings that formerly existed, and uh, one of the police officials there, uh, William Hall, said there is no search going on right now. He said, until the fires go out, until it is safe for his people and other rescue workers to go in, they are not moving in there. He said on an average day, the two World Trade Center towers get 10,000 people each with 5,000 visitors. A New York City police official told us a short time ago that another triage center is going to be set up here on the west side of Manhattan, 33rd Street area, in the Jacob Javits Convention Center. This to handle additional overflow from New York City hospitals, which New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani says have been doing their best in coping with it, but there have been calls for blood. People here walking by me, someone will point to someone and say, this person was in the World Trade Center, just got out. You can hear behind me, there is the roar of uh, military aircraft, the only aircraft you see in the sky. And usually, as New Yorkers will tell you, you can look up at any time and see a plane. Uh, they are up in the sky, concerned look from people who gaze upward, shield their eyes to see just what's going on, and an occasional police uh, helicopter. But here in New York City, there is no search going on. William Hall of the Port Authority said we're going to have to wait until we get things all accounted for before we can go in there. Aaron. Richard, thank you. Richard Roth in uh, Lower Manhattan. Again, just a quick recap for those of you who may just be getting home and hearing these events for the first time, 8.48 this morning, one of those moments that everyone will remember. The first plane, American Airlines Flight 11, 
Boston to Los Angeles, hijacked, crashed into the first Trade Center Tower. At 9.04, the second plane, the United Airlines flight, United 175, Boston to Los Angeles, hit the second tower. About a half hour later, 9.38 Eastern Time, American Airlines Flight 77, Washington Dulles Airport to Los Angeles, it crashed into the Pentagon, hitting just short of the Pentagon itself, and perhaps that was most fortunate. And at 10.20 a.m. Eastern Time, United Flight 93, Newark to San Francisco, crashed about 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh. Those are the times and the events they don't begin to describe what has happened. What has happened is not simply a series of moments, but something much larger. Phil Zapata is with the American Red Cross, and he is on the phone with us. Mr. Zapata, this is Aaron Brown. Can you hear me okay? Sure can, Aaron. Tell me what sort of strain is on the Red Cross's resources right now. Well, the American Red Cross responded immediately um, to um, all areas of this disaster. Right now, our focus is really on um, disaster relief, providing blood assistance, and any disaster mental health assistance that we can provide around the country um, to both the, the survivors and the families who have uh, been involved in this tragedy. Phil, tell me, tell me what that means exactly. Uh, I understand the need for blood. Uh, are you setting, setting up shelters for people? Sure. We have, we have shelters um, both in New York City and in um, Washington, D.C. that are set up to help people. Um, there we have disaster mental health counselors that are, that are able to, to meet with people and to uh, register people uh, as they come in and uh, are trying to, to get away from the situation. Uh, we are set up in New York at Penn Station, at Grand Central Station, and in Washington, D.C. at Fort Belvere. Um, it is still chaos right now. We are in the process of ramping up our operations. While we did respond immediately, there's so much work to be done, and we're in the process of doing that right now. We have about 50,000 units of, um, of blood that are available for the affected areas, and the American Red Cross is looking at mobilizing that right now and putting that into place. And uh, Phil, as you were speaking, we well, were able to put up on the screen numbers that people can call uh, if they can help. Um, if you're sitting in Omaha, Nebraska today, is it helpful in this situation to be going to the, to the blood bank and giving blood, or is it too far away to be meaningful? The message that the American Red Cross is putting out right now is to donate blood. Call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-E, or visit redcross.org for more information. But uh, giving blood is where the our emphasis is right now. No matter where you are in the country. Yes, well, no matter where you are in the country, or you can, you know, contact your local hospital if you're not in a Red Cross area, but 1-800-GIVE-LIFE is the best number to call. Okay, so even if you are far away from the events of today, uh, you can still be helpful, uh, as there is certainly in New York and in Washington, from what Judy said, a serious shortage of blood. Uh, the American Red Cross can be helpful. Your local hospital, your local blood bank uh, can be helpful. We suspect before the day is out, uh, fire stations around the country will be involved in these efforts as well. Uh, Phil, thank you. Is there anything else, by the way, before I let you go, that you want to say uh, that would be helpful to our viewers or helpful to the Red Cross? Well, the Red Cross right now and our, our president, Dr. Bernadine Healy, extend our heartfelt sor sorrows to all families and everyone that's been affected by this. Um, we just urge people to donate blood. Um, thank you very much, Phil, with the American Red Cross. Phil Zapetta with the American Red Cross. Uh, CNN's Miles O'Brien has been tracking the flight paths of these four planes that were involved. Uh, Miles, are you able to hear me in Atlanta? Yes, I am, Aaron. And tell me what you've been able to figure out to this point. Well, as you probably know, Aaron, there are various commercial websites that allow you to track commercial aircraft. Now, if you go to many of them right now, you're not going to get very far because they're being overwhelmed by interest in people. Uh, but even if you could get some of the data, we have just learned from the Federal Aviation Administration that every domestic airliner that was in the air is now on the ground. This is unprecedented in aviation history in this country. There's not a plane flying right now. At any given moment, typically there are 4,000 aircraft. Now, let's take a look at what happened on American Airlines Flight 11. It began in Boston and it took off on time, 81 people aboard, nine crew members, uh, two uh, nine flight attendants and two pilots. And let's sort of track what happened with this flight. As it went across 
uh, Massachusetts and went down into the uh, uh, Albany area, actually up in the Adirondacks. It took a sharp dog leg. What's interesting about this flight is everything seemed to be normal. Flight at a, it was, the altitude was about 29,000 feet, gaining speed at about uh, 450 knots. It took that sharp dog leg down across the Adirondacks straight for New York. Now what will be interesting about this as this story unfolds will be number one, listening to any air traffic control conversations to get a sense of what, if anything, uh, air traffic controllers were, were saying to this aircraft. Undoubtedly, this was spotted on the radar screens, of course. They had quite a bit of time to watch this plane as it went down toward New York. That's probably at least a 30-minute run there. And during the course of that time, those air traffic controllers and those radar installations, New York Center, as it is called, would have been uh, trying to contact American Airlines Flight 11 to indicate its intentions. Uh, it must have been a horrifying scene for them. They were probably trying to clear air traffic out of the area. Clearly, once those tapes become available, we'll have a little bit more knowledge. And if it is possible to locate any of the so-called black boxes, the flight data recorders, cockpit voice recorder, out of this particular aircraft, they'll obviously know more about what was going on on what must have been a very dramatic uh, flight indeed. Now, this is the first flight. This is the flight that uh, first impacted the first tower of the World Trade Center, and this is the first of four that we know about, of course, for air uh, hijackings, which led to uh, crashes and obviously a tremendous amount of damage. I'm getting this information from a company called FlightExplorer.com. They are compiling their archival radar information from this morning, and as it becomes available, we'll be able to show you the flight paths of the other three aircraft that are suspected in all of this, and we'll bring those to you as soon as we get that. Aaron? Uh, just a quick practical question. These tapes of the cockpit tower communications, do they exist on the ground? Yes. Are they recorded it in control towers, and then there's a different set of tapes that exist on the plane. Exactly. It's, it's important to bring out there are two types of tapes in these incidents. The, the tapes on the ground are the ones that record the radio transmissions between the ground and the aircraft, and clearly the flight controllers would have been calling this aircraft numerous times, and, and this would have been the case for the three others if they deviated from their courses, uh, indicate, trying to get some indication as to what was wrong, why the pilot was changing course so dramatically. Now, what will be interesting to hear is if there is some sort of response from these aircraft, uh, this will uh, give us some clue as to who might have been in control of the plane at the time or if there might have been some sort of struggle aboard or if, it, if there was just a, a lack of a struggle. There's a lot of mystery here, obviously. Now, ultimately, uh, as they go through the, uh, the wreckage in these cases, uh, it's possible that uh, investigators, and there's a good chance because they have emergency locating uh, devices on them, they'll find these so-called black boxes. And on those black boxes, there might be much more information which might uh, give authorities some clues as to who might be responsible. Several different kinds of information. There's technical information in these black boxes, what the airplane was doing in a sense, but there's also communications between the cabin crew uh, that exist on those tapes, uh, what pilot was saying to co-pilot. Might, we might be able to hear, if these tapes are ever located, what the people who took control of these planes, and that's clearly what happened, seems clear that that's what happened, what they were saying, whether these tapes will ever be found, obviously we don't yet know but that is part of what will happen in the next days. On this day, what is happening in both Washington and New York and in a field outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is a massive, massive rescue operation, a massive triage operation. Uh, thousands of people presumably have been hurt. Many people, we suspect, have died. Though many hours now since that first plane hit the Trade Center at uh, 8.48 Eastern Time, we have yet to hear from any official in the city uh, any estimate here in New York of the number of people who have been hurt. We just know that hospitals are inundated, that hospitals are running very low on blood, and they need help here. We know that uh, we know that the National Guard will be coming in here to New York to help in support of uh, the New York Police Department. Uh, we would add here that a number of members, and we don't know how many, but after the police and fire responded to these two planes hitting the Trade Center, uh, many police officers, many firefighters, many EMS personnel were in the area when the buildings collapsed. How many of them were hurt, we do not know. Uh, but we've been told now by two uh, officials or former officials with the city that, that any number of people, uh, police and fire officials, have been hurt as well. Uh, Judy in Washington. Judy Woodruff. Judy. 
And Aaron, uh, just picking up on your conversation with Miles O'Brien a moment ago, and, and perhaps you all referred to this, and I apologize if I'm repeating, the Associated Press reporting on a passenger that was on United Flight 93. Now, this is the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. About 20 minutes before that plane crashed, a passenger with a cell phone locked in a bathroom actually called an emergency dispatcher and shouted into the cell phone, we are being hijacked, we're being hijacked. They apparently stayed on the phone with this passenger uh, up until the moment when the passenger heard some sort of a loud noise and then they lost they lost contact. That's just one more piece of the stories, the many, many, many stories that we are pulling together uh, as we watch these developments in Pennsylvania, here in Washington, and of course in New York City. And you just heard Aaron talking about uh, incomplete information about casualties, what hospitals are dealing with. Now these numbers I'm going to read you right now are, are only incomplete. We, we are just beginning to get this kind of information. We're told at Washington area hospitals right now, 53 injured, at least three more casualties on the way, although we have to believe that with uh, the commercial jetliner that crashed at the Pentagon or just in front of the Pentagon, and that was the uh, Boeing 757, and these are the these are the pictures of the Pentagon just outside the Pentagon, 58 passengers on board, four crew members and two pilots, it is impossible to believe that they did not all perish, and we don't know about others who work at the Pentagon who were in the part of that building uh, that was most affected when that commercial plane uh, went down. We, we are, uh, we've been talking with uh, uh, a number of people involved in, in rescue, and uh, right now we want to go to the president's statement. This took place just about an hour and 15 minutes ago. The president was on his way back to Washington from Florida. His plane touched down at an Air Force base in Louisiana, Barksdale Air Force Base near Shreveport. We can now report that information because he's since left Barksdale. But here is what President George W. Bush had to say in this statement. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status and we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. President Bush uh, made that statement just about an hour and 20 minutes ago at Barksdale Air Force Base near Shreveport, Louisiana. That was an unplanned stop that the president made at that place uh, in order to talk with reporters, meet with others. Since then, Air Force One has taken off, President Bush being flown to an undisclosed location. We're told also that Secretary of State Colin Powell, who had been on his way back to the United States from Peru, being taken to an undisclosed location. Outside the Pentagon, CNN's 
military affairs correspondent Jamie McIntyre. And Jamie, you got very close to where that plane went down. That's right, Judy. A short uh, a, a while ago, I walked right up to next to the building where uh, uh, firefighters were still trying to put out the blaze. The, the fire, by the way, is still burning in some parts of the Pentagon. And I took a look at the huge gaping hole that's in this side of the Pentagon in an area of the Pentagon that has been recently renovated, uh, part of a uh, multi-billion dollar renovation program here at the Pentagon. I could see parts of the airplane that crashed into the building, very small pieces of the plane on the heliport outside the the the, uh, the building. The biggest piece I saw was about three feet uh, long. It was uh, silver and had been painted uh, green and red, but I could not see any identifying markings on the plane. I also saw a large piece of shattered glass. It appeared to be uh, a cockpit windshield or other window from the plane. Uh, when this uh, plane hit the Pentagon uh, this morning, according to the Pentagon spokesman uh, Craig Quigley, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld incredibly uh, is described as having run out of his office and down to ha actually help some of the victims onto stretchers until he was uh, ushered into the National Military Command Center, the secure uh, uh, nerve center or war room in, uh, deep inside the Pentagon where he remains at this time. Pentagon officials say he'll stay there for the time being. That is a place where all of U.S. intelligence comes in and he has complete uh, command uh, with his commanders around the world. At the same time, the Pentagon has dispatched several warships out of port in Norfolk, including the U.S., uh, the carriers uh, USS George Washington and U.S. Uh, uh, Kennedy. Uh, the, the ostensible reason for that, uh, to uh, uh, the movement of those ships and their escort ships, is to move them from more vulnerable positions. But the Navy says they'll also hit some of the aircraft carriers up toward New York with the idea that they may be able to render some kind of assistance there, given the magnitude uh, of the tragedy there. Uh, back here, uh, the fight goes on to put out the, the fire inside the Pentagon. The, the heat from that blaze was described as absolutely intense, and the number of casualties here has still not been released. Uh, dozens of people uh, were taken away in ambulances, and the Pentagon is still not releasing any figures on uh, on deaths. But clearly people who had offices in that uh, what is now a huge gaping hole in uh, in the side of the Pentagon, uh, clearly there were some people killed in this uh, in this tragedy. Judy? Jamie, Aaron was talking uh, earlier, one, or one of our correspondents was talking earlier, I think it, actually it was Bob Franken, with an eyewitness who said it appeared that that Boeing 757, the American jet, American Airlines jet, landed short of the Pentagon. Can you give us any better idea of how much of the plane actually impacted the building? You know, it, it, it might have appeared that way, but from my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. The only site uh, is the actual uh, site of the building that's crashed in, and as I said, the only pieces left uh, that you can see are, are small enough that you could pick up in your hand. Uh, there are no large uh, tail sections, wing sections, uh, a fuselage nothing like that anywhere around which would indicate that the entire plane crashed into the side of the Pentagon uh, and then caused the side to collapse. Now, even though if you look at the pictures of the Pentagon, you see uh, that the floors have all collapsed. That didn't happen immediately. Uh, it wasn't until a, almost about 45 minutes later uh, that the structure was weakened enough that all of the floors collapsed. And Jamie, this happened, uh, we're, now, we're now able to reconstruct about 9.38 this morning. At that time, Jamie, what are we talking about? Dozens, hundreds of people at work in the building? There are 24,000 people who work in this building, and most of them are at work at that hour of the morning. Uh, they were all evacuated from the building. Uh, in my office, which is um, uh, sort of halfway between where this took place and the other side of the building, which is where the defense secretary's office is, uh, eventually even the, the corridor I was in began to fill up with smoke. Uh, just Uh, heat exhaustion. They were just hitting the floor. So uh, one firefighter told him to take off his jacket, lay on the back, I doused him with water, and uh, all the EMS guys came over and gave us a hand. All right. um, also, did you notice a lot of civilians uh, jumping in to help out right away because there just weren't enough? Uh... Well, it, was, it was mad chaos down there. There were civilians all over the place. You know? Uh, it's just a sight that anyone, no one wants to see. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't explain it. Have you got friends who work in that area? Uh, well, I'm an elevator uh, mechanics helper, so there's a lot of uh, guys from Ace Elevator that are in that building, resident mechanics and helpers, so uh, we don't know what happened with them yet. What happened to you after all of this happened? Did you stay on scene to help out for a while and then move north? Stayed on scene to help out a while and uh, eventually moved up, just to try to get out of all the, uh, the soot. 
I couldn't breathe, fucking basically. You've been able to clean up since, because yeah, anybody I've been, who's... I've been up here at least two hours now, an hour and a half, two hours. At the time, weren't you concerned that there might be another explosion, or had you yeah, heard there was, that there, there was... There was a, uh, there was another explosion. I don't know what it was a car, but there were various cars down there on fire. Um, there was another explosion when everybody, we all started running. Someone said bomb, so we all started running back. You told me earlier, just before this interview, that yes. you'd seen maybe 40 or 50 bodies or yeah, people... Yeah, people flying out of the building. You know, there were people coming down. You know, horrible. That's all I could say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for your time. Um, as we were saying earlier, this is the scene that most people are creating for us who are there at the epicenter. It's very difficult to see for a lot of people because, like I said before, that cloud was so black when that second building came down. I was telling you the story that myself and a producer were caught in that as well. We were only about two blocks, it was about two blocks away from, uh, from where the second tower came down. And when that cloud came at us, Brian, it was the most frightening thing I think I've ever seen in my life. And at the time, we, we were trying to breathe through our clothing and we couldn't. And uh, we had to break down a... a we had to break down a door to a, an apartment building. We had to kick in the glass to try to get through to the second uh, glass door to get in, just to get air. And at the time, a police officer followed us in. He was covered in gray, so it head to toe as we were. And uh, a security guard from the building, from one of the buildings in the in the direct vicinity, also uh, was covered head to toe. And, and they were banging on the glass trying to get in as well. Uh, they followed us in, so there were four of us just sort of huddled together in this pocket of air, which we still had to breathe through our clothing to, to breathe. And it took. I would say probably about five minutes or so um, before that that sooty black air cleared enough for us to at least be able to see out the out the second doorway and then emerge. And when we emerged, it was it was like Mount St. Helens had gone off in the middle of New York, and there was no one to be seen. There were shredded papers. I picked up one piece of shredded paper that was burned on the edges, and it was the address of the 92nd floor of One World Trade Center. And there were papers like that scattered everywhere for. For 10 blocks there was there was scattered paper everywhere there was debris i could see uh, a woman's shoe um the dust was the dust was thick everywhere where i am here you can see the smoke and you can see the dust clouds but they haven't at least you know emanated their way over here they haven't covered people here but you know when you see people emerging and walking northward who are covered head to toe that they've been within you know five blocks of of uh of what happened and it's um they all have the same look in their eye as well it's an absolute shock and disbelief i can't really explain it ashley thank you uh, for that from lower manhattan new york has just been ripped apart today. well she was lucky that she was able to survive that that's an understatement she was very lucky that is I, i'm sitting here thinking about the implosion of the hudson's building downtown a few years back which was what a nine or ten story building uh, and we all know the size of the hudson's building and the tremendous amount of dust and smoke and debris that under a controlled situation that that left on downtown new york or downtown detroit could, uh, it, it defies the imagination to think what that must have been like to be in manhattan today when the world trade center twin towers both collapsed fifty thousand people uh, inside those buildings and the debris and, and, and just that smoke billowing and the debris billowing through the Manhattan canyons there. It's just truly a devastating picture. Um, and it, it, it certainly, at the very least, causes us all to pause uh, and give thanks to uh, whomever uh, we worship that uh, there but for the grace of God. I think that uh, the analogy to Mount St. Helens was very appropriate there with Ashley. Now, I was thinking about the adrenaline, the fear factor that would make somebody, you know, burst through not one but two glass doors to get into an apartment building just to get in so you could breathe. Um, she's really, she's really very lucky. I understand now that uh, local four reporter Rod Maloney is live in Detroit with more information. Rod? That's right, Ruth. We are downtown here uh, near the Renaissance Center, and we've been monitoring all of the local businesses, the major uh, businesses in particular. The uh, all right, Rod. Okay, actually, you know what? I need to Rod come back Maloney to you guys. Is, we're we going to interrupt you, Rod yeah. Maloney, and we're going to go right to New York now. We understand Mayor Rudolph Giuliani is having a news conference. Let's terrorism, join. acts of terrorism. And our focus now has to be on saving as many lives as possible. We have hundreds of police officers and firefighters who are engaging in rescue efforts in Lower Manhattan. I want to thank Governor Pataghi for the incredible cooperation and coordination and including uh, deploying the National Guard that will be available to relieve our police officers and firefighters and emergency workers in the next couple of hours uh, 
the governor and I just spoke to the President of the United States. The coordination with the federal government from the time of the first attack has been excellent, including closing off the airspace around Manhattan and doing everything that can possibly be done in the face of this barbaric act to make the city secure. And we will uh, strive now very hard to save as many people as possible and to send a message that the city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists, that our democracy, that our rule of law, that our strength and our willingness to defend ourselves will ultimately prevail. And I'd ask the people of New York City to do everything that they can to cooperate, not to be frightened, to go about their lives as normal. Everything is safe right now in the city. And the people who are doing the relief effort needs all, need all the help they can get. And then, uh, Governor, thank you very, thank you, very Mayor. much for your assistance and your help and your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for your leadership through this crisis. This is uh, a vicious attack upon New York. It's an attack upon America. It's an attack upon the whole concept of freedom and our way of life. Uh, and we cannot let these at attacks succeed. Uh, first step has to be to make sure we do everything in our power to protect the people and to save the lives of those who, whose lives are still at risk and to help those who have been injured. And I want to commend the mayor and I want to thank my colleagues from Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and the federal government have all offered and made ready uh, support to help us uh, deal with this ongoing crisis. Uh, the people of New York are uh, not only the, the freest and most diverse people in the world, we're also, I believe, the most capable of rising to meet the challenges of this type of attack and right now we want New Yorkers to uh, remain calm to go about their business to appreciate the fact that everything to provide for their safety is being done to appreciate that everything that can be done to provide for the health and the needs of the people who are still at risk is being done and that we will continue to work to make sure that we get through this uh, as strongly and quickly as possible I want to thank the uh, federal administration. Secretary Thompson has been on the phone with me a number of times, as well as the president, uh, for what they are offering and prepared to do. Uh, and we're just uh, confident that, uh, uh, well, this is a horrible attack, and one that uh, is despicable and uh, really unthinkable in its magnitude. We will get through this, uh, and we will continue to have a great and free country, state, and society. Do we know the number of casualties at this point, sir? I don't, I don't think we, we really want to speculate about that. The number of casualties will be more than any, Mayor Giuliani any of Giuliani and can bear. Governor Pataki, uh, the two Republican leaders of the state, joined together here in this day. Good afternoon of again, time. Emory King, along with Ruth Spencer. We have uh, been bringing you live coverage of a news conference with Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, as you just heard from New York, and New York Governor George Pataki. We are joined here by a special guest who just left New York this morning. Dr. Deepak Chopra, we're very uh, honored to have you here with us today. And I know we were talking just before we went on the air here. Tell me about your wife and your son, is it, who are flying on planes, you said? My wife uh, is on a plane, I don't know where it is at the moment, from England to California. My son boarded a plane this morning uh, from New York, as I did, uh, about the time that um, this happened, and my son was on his way to Los Angeles. I just heard from him, though, he uh, they landed uh, as an emergency in Cincinnati. Good, that's good. So you're just waiting to hear from your wife. Right. All right. And you are here in the Detroit metro area for book signing? I, that was presumably what I was here for. I know but, you've written uh, 29 books. Yeah, but I'm not in the mood to do any book signings. Of course, of course. Uh, but you are a spiritual teacher, as I mentioned, and an author as well. As you see what has happened today, what are your thoughts? Well, these are my thoughts, and uh, some of these may not uh, be pleasant to hear. But first of all, right now, it's the most important thing is to ensure the safety of those who are alive and those who are wounded. That's the first thing, to ensure our national safety. This is not the time to assign blame or retaliate or punish because if you continue for the policy of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a limb for a limb, then the whole world is going to be blind, crippled, and toothless. Nobody is going to benefit from that. What happened today is probably the result of 2,000 years of history. And 
Unfortunately, that whole history is the result of religious conflict in the world. There's not a place on our planet which does not at this moment have conflict in the name of God. So we really have to ask ourselves, of course America is suffering, but humanity is suffering. These are the wounds of our collective soul and our mother earth is suffering. And we have to do a lot of soul searching before we assign blame, retaliation and punishment. Because we have to ask ourselves, what would create that deep hatred that such heinous acts can be committed? What would create that deep hatred? Does anyone have hatred without a cause? Is a child born with hatred? Is violence our innate nature? There's no other animal that does this in the name particularly of God. There's no other animal that commits murder in the name of God. And there is nobody right now who can be absolved of blame. You are to blame, I am to blame, he's to blame, and the whole world has to look at its soul. Otherwise we risk our extinction as a species and devastation of this planet. As a, uh, a spiritual advisor, what would you say to people who uh, uh, question their faith at a time like this? I think right now, there's not time even for soul searching. Right now, the time is to pray collectively, and the time is to pray for everyone, not just for America. We don't need to be a tribe anymore. You know, these are tribal wars that have gone on for 2,000 years, and this is still a tribal war except that we have better technology and better weapons and we can do this globally, but it's still a tribal war. So this is not even a time for soul searching. That'll come later. Right now, take care of the people who are affected, allay each other's anxiety and pray for the healing of our wounded soul. And there have been so many studies recently for those who are not faithful uh, about the power of prayer regarding right. healing. People, right. intercessory prayer, they call it, people who are being prayed for no, at a great distance true, don't true. know one another. By the way, we have a website, Chopra.com. There are 50,000 prayers there right now, and the prayers coming in uh, per minute. So for all those who are listening to this, if they can go to our website, www.chopra.com, please pray for yourselves, for your loved ones, and pray for, pray for everyone because we're all connected to each other. There's no enemy out there except our collective consciousness. As of a, a, a couple of hours ago at least, I think, and I'm sure this information uh, has been updated or will, there were 22 international flights still in the air and we know that some of those transatlantic flights, if not indeed all of them, were being diverted to Canada. So I believe at the moment even Canadian airports are uh, are closed and it's a momentous task. There are, there are millions of planes out there. It's really a momentous task to inform every pilot sure. to go where they go. People, are, planes could run out of fuel. They may not be landing facilities. Some may be in midair. It's it's a horrendous thing. So I think right now, it is important to ensure everyone's safety. Later, soul searching, because I think we have to ask each of ourselves. What can we do so that this doesn't happen again? And I can say for me anyway, and I can say for those who are listening, if you have even one single thought of violence in your consciousness right now against anyone, you will contribute to the violence. And it will go on for generations. Some of these vindications or retaliations or acts of hostility go back generations. Somebody's mother or grandmother or father or child who was killed somewhere who's seeking revenge right now. Dr. Deepak Chopra, thank you for being with thank us. Thank you for being with us. And those thank of us who are comfortable with a request for prayer will be praying, and especially for your wife who's on oh, that well, plane. Pray I know for everyone. Very concerned Not for just my wife. Pray All right. for everyone. All right. Thank you for thank being you. with us. Thanks. We interrupted Rod Maloney's report uh, uh, when we were joined by our guest and also by that news conference in New York. Let's go back out now to the Renaissance Center downtown where Rod Maloney's standing by. Rod. Well, Devin, we're uh, keeping an ear to the ground in all of the major corporations, certainly in the metro Detroit area, ones with the global reach like the big three to see where they stand on these things. The most recent development we have heard is from Daimler Chrysler, who in fact called me while we were on the air to try and tell me that they have basically closed all of their facilities nationwide, including the headquarters and all of their plants. Everybody's been sent home. The second and if there are third shifts are not to report except for the maintenance people at their plants. 
They say they want to be respectful um, of the situation in New York City. They also said that they want to protect their employees, and that has been the theme throughout all of the big three. General Motors has sent four plants home, but they are not here in Metro Detroit. Um, they have sent the Rensen, the people, everybody in the Rensen, uh, except for essential personnel, have been sent home. In fact, uh, there are people, a crisis communications team, crisis management team, is here in the Rensen along with uh, the headquarters at Daimler Chrysler and at Ford, which also, the Ford World Headquarters, have been evacuated except for the essential personnel and their crisis management teams uh, having everybody uh, head home. Now, at General Motors, they have closed four plants. The Linden, New Jersey plant, which builds the S-10 Sonoma, they can see the smoke from across the river, and uh, the, those workers have been sent home for General Motors. Also, in Wilmington, Delaware, the Saturn plant, the governor there has declared an emergency, so all of those workers have been sent home. And then there are two plants that are very close to the Pentagon in Baltimore. One of those plants builds the Astrovan, and all of the workers there have been sent home. I also put out a couple of other calls, Kmart. Uh, has all of its operations going in uh, full capacity except for one store in Manhattan which is attached to Penn Station and apparently because it is a uh, transportation uh, destination that has been closed down one of the many nationwide that that Kmart store has been closed down but otherwise all of the Kmart facilities are up and running um, as we look around here downtown there is a police officer virtually at every corner here as we uh, sit right at the uh, end of the lodge uh, right next to Kobo Center here there's a police officer on every corner the traffic is trickled down to just a handful of vehicles everybody's been sent home everybody's sort of watching and waiting I have heard from all of the big three that they expect to be back and operating tomorrow in full capacity but today they figure it's best to just send a, as many people home as they can to be with their family to contemplate what has happened to perhaps pray as dr chopper did tell us and also uh, to sort of uh, take a breath and then tomorrow we come back and try and start all over again so ruth emery back to you well rod actually it's devin back here again for emery now who's been allowed to go back out and uh, make what he can of what is going to be a most unusual primary election day in Detroit. We'll continue to follow the developments there. The mayor deciding uh, that really on this day, uh, the most American act of all is to vote, and that that might be the best way that all of us be asked to spend our time today to get out and make our voices heard in this primary election. Along through Spencer, I'm Devin Skilly, and Chuck Gatick is back with us now as well. Chuck, what have you been working on? Here well, we're looking at the aviation angle. It's hard to believe that a weapon, quote unquote, would be a fully loaded aircraft sure. with uh, tens of thousands of gallons of fuel, but it appears that has been the case, and we can go ahead and recap where some of these aircraft were when they started their journey and where they were uh, turned around, we assume hijacked. Now, as you look toward Boston, there's a connection here somehow of, of aircraft, rather large, 757, 767s, departing the East Coast. This one left Boston. About 8.42, an American Airlines flight crashed into the World Trade Center. Another aircraft leaving Boston, United Flight 175, we're told. Uh, bound for L.A. Again, here's that uh, connection flying from East Coast to West Coast, fully loaded with fuel, again, turned around and uh, sent to New York. And then there was another flight that departed Newark. Uh, this was a United flight. It looks like it was in a turn, but then for some unexplained reason, uh, reason crashed southeast of Pittsburgh. Another flight originated in Washington, D.C., took off, turned around, came right back in. That's the one we assume uh, crashed into the Pentagon. That was also an American Airlines flight as well. We have an Internet shot to show you what the cockpit of a 757-767 looks like. This is a very complicated aircraft, uh, and even though there are some of the instruments there that pilots of all walks of life, guys like me that drive little puddle hoppers to people who fly 767s would recognize, that's a very complicated aircraft. And you know, one of the biggest problems commercial pilots have had uh, for many years, for decades, is their concern about the lockability of the door between them and the rest of the aircraft. And so here you have an airplane, uh, obviously with a crew on board. You can assume somehow it left the gate, it taxied somewhere in that process. After takeoff, something happened. Well, think about that Washington flight. If you've ever flown into uh, Dulles or, or National Airport, you know how the proximity of, uh, of the Pentagon. That had to be a very quick turnaround from Dulles back to the Pentagon, I mean, almost like that. Right, and understand as well, you have a cruisability on these aircraft of, let's round it off, 550 miles per hour. So anyone who knew what they were doing could get that plane into a turned around mm -hmm. mode and put a pedal to the metal. And before people on the ground could have a chance to call you, and perhaps they were calling saying, you know, are you there, flight such and such, they're not obviously going to respond. They would then be requesting for that aircraft to ident, which is to push a button to pop up a signal on the radar screen. If they got no response, 
uh, that aircraft could do just about anything it wanted to because no one knew that it had malicious intent. Right. As well, we would hope that somewhere along the way the black box will tell us some story, whether we hear audio tapes uh, of struggles in a cockpit, as we have heard unfortunately in the past, or even um, an aircraft flying in a straight line but doing something like this that could indicate that maybe a pilot that wasn't well skilled was at the helm. We don't know. Well, on that flight that, uh, that crashed in Pennsylvania, we do know that they did get a phone call from a passenger who locked himself in a bathroom. Uh, and called, uh, uh, using his cell phone, called emergency personnel on the ground in Pennsylvania and told them, we are being hijacked, we are being hijacked. Westmoreland County Emergency Dispatcher uh, Supervisor says that that dispatcher got that call from a man who claimed he was in the bathroom aboard the plane, and the man repeatedly told officials the call was not a hoax. Uh, mm -hmm. That plane, uh, by the way, was headed from Newark to San Francisco, had 38 passengers, two pilots, uh, and five flight attendants on board. That one got obviously further away from the eastern right. seaboard and these other sites right. that we're talking about. Hard for us to speculate whether or not things maybe didn't go the way that the hijackers had planned as early as it happened in these other flights. And maybe there was a struggle that ensued. And again, right. we've discussed, and there are numerous pilots that work here amongst ourselves, any pilot under duress that had any ability at all to steer an aircraft would not steer it intentionally into a building. Right. So even when you're surrounded by a river, you see a forested area, as was the case south of Pittsburgh. If you had a choice of where to put an aircraft and you knew it was going to go down in a certain direction anyway, you would hope that the pilot had peace of mind to do that. So maybe that tells us a story of the lack of ability of these other pilots. Maybe they weren't even in a cockpit any Somehow longer to somebody wrestle else that away. The controls. Right. I'll tell you what, air airport security is going to change mightily after this. It simply has to. We, you know, I, uh, in 1993, made a trip to Israel right. uh, to cover mm -hmm. the miracle mm -hmm. mission for this station. And, uh, you know, they have a very different mentality there in that country in all venues about anti-terrorism. And I, I, got, I have to believe that our airports, if we thought it took a long time before to get through security right. measures, it's only going to take longer now. And how many local television stations in large markets have done stories as 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 uh, as uh, last year even getting how easy it is to get a weapon through the metal detectors onto the plane I remember in Atlanta one TV station doing a story they're actually in the cockpit right. of the plane with the camera saying we've now come all the way into the cockpit of this plane right. Uh, you know, so uh, one wonders if we even had the kind of airport security before that made a difference when we see something like this. That's the thing. While we have figured out ways, though, for security personnel to get inside our purses and inside our pockets and inside our luggage, we've not found a way to get inside somebody's head mm -hmm. or somebody's heart. And that's the hardest thing to discern. Well, and there we don't even know that necessarily a weapon was right. involved in taking over a plane. And then we also assume that now in a free society, we're willing to put up with an extra hour delay, maybe. And then you also step to the next level of profiling. Who is the person who is the dastardly mind to pull something off, right. and how do we pick him out of a crowd? Right. It's very difficult, and it's a, it's a very dangerous path if, to go down. If not impossible. Right. Let's get you caught up here in case you are uh, just tuning in or have had to uh, turn away for a while and need to get updated on the situation as we see it on this September 11, 2001. The World Trade Center has been destroyed. A plane flew into the Trade Center, uh, one half of the Trade Center towers. Uh, just before 9 o'clock this morning, a short time later, a second plane uh, on live television crashed into the second tower. Both of those towers collapsed and thousands of people are feared dead. Both of those towers are basically cities unto themselves. They each have their own zip code, each holding uh, 10,000 people or more uh, on a daily basis as business. And this obviously happened uh, right around uh, the, the height of uh, as the business day was just getting going. A short time later, a plane crashed into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., the one as Chuck and I were just talking. Obviously, that plane got commandeered so quickly, Very quickly as they turned it out of Dulles Airport uh, and a, going down into one of the most secured buildings in the world, the Pentagon. Earth. And we uh, can confirm two United and two American Airlines planes crashed. However, American Airlines had backed off their report that one of their planes had gone into one of the World Trade Center towers. They had a uh, un they had union personnel from United right. Airlines saying, right. no, that was one of our planes that went into the uh, World uh, Trade Center tower. And to my knowledge, we've not yet heard from American Airlines about that. So that is uh, still something that we do not have confirmed which carrier those two planes were coming from that went into the uh, World Trade Center towers. The FAA shortly thereafter suspending all flights nationwide. I don't think there was any surprise there. Uh, and uh, airport closings, uh, you know, all over the place, although we do have these international flights that uh, have to come in. 
and that they're basically running out of fuel. They don't have any place to go. Gotta so go where are they going to land? land. Right. They must find a place to, to land. Canada, which, uh, which has also closed all of its airports. But we understand the FAA now says all domestic flights, because for a time, you'll recall, there were about 50 or so flights that right. are yet to land. All domestic flights, we understand now, have landed. And can we even remember a day when there was no air traffic? over the United States of America. Financial markets are closed today. Many of those, of course, headquartered right there around the World Trade Center towers in New York. The U.S. military is on high alert status, and that uh, reaches deep into the uh, National Guard bases as well, which includes Selfridge Air National Guard Base, which is now on a Delta alert status, which is the fourth a, B, C, D, uh, and we continue to watch, uh, waiting for word as to whether or not any of them will be deployed into some of these areas you would expect. Certainly in New York City, they are going to need uh, some National Guard help to keep those areas secured and to begin assisting in the unbelievably mammoth cleanup exercise that's about to be undertaken there. Major League Baseball has postponed all of its games, and that's just one of many of those kinds of closings. Uh, all kinds of events uh, all over the country, local and uh, across the state, being canceled this evening. And when we last heard about President Bush and his whereabouts, he was at Louisiana Air Force Base there. A Greyhound, of course, very important here in Detroit. We have a Greyhound sure. station right down, uh, a Greyhound station right down the street from our station here, uh, partially suspending services uh, today throughout the nation. That, of course, a huge mode of transportation for many people, especially when the planes are not right. flying. Uh, this is being uh, reacted uh, to on the international scene uh, with a great uh, sadness for the most part. However, I want to pass along a report uh, from the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, which is reporting that thousands of Palestinians have celebrated Tuesday's terror attacks in the United States, chanting, God is great, and distributing candy to passersby, even as their leader, Yasser Arafat, has said that he's been horrified by all this. Of course, the U.S. government has become increasingly unpopular in the West Bank uh, as tensions there have risen over the last year. I should also point out, however, that Yasser Arafat's uh, spokes... Tell me where you are and what you saw. Well, today I'm, I'm in New York. I was here for, for two days on a, on a trade mission, and this morning during breakfast, our breakfast meeting, uh, someone came into the room and told us uh, two planes had crashed into the, the World Trade Center. And um, we, uh, we, we immediately, the reaction in the room was, that, well, this can't be a coincidence. And uh, shortly after, the, the people from the consulate uh, came to us and told us what had happened, and we obviously canceled everything today. Um, I was uh, I was about 50 blocks away, so I didn't see anything or hear anything. But I can tell you, when we go outside, there was a clear exodus of people from the, the, the south of, of the um, of the city uh, moving north. But people were walking uh, in a fairly uh, calm and, and orderly fashion. But you could see the sorrow, and you can certainly see the concern on their faces. And I want to say that uh, our, our thoughts and prayers go to to the families and, and to the victims of this horrible tragedy. And uh, in New Brunswick, uh, I've been in contact with our office uh, at home, obviously, and some planes were diverted to uh, New Brunswick, and our officials are working with federal officials to, uh, to assist the, uh, the people that, are, that have landed in New Brunswick that thought they were coming to the U.S. today. Now, there are nine million people on Manhattan, which is an island at any given business day, which this was a normal business day. Uh, when you say people were sort of leaving, how, how easy is it now to sort of cope in New York City? How quickly were you able to get phone calls out to, to call your family? In, in, after the, the incident, it was very difficult to get through. The lines uh, early on were, were jammed. Uh, obviously, we, uh, everyone in our delegation tried to, to call uh, home and, and let our family know. It, it took me a while to, to be able to reach uh, uh, my wife and my children, but eventually uh, I did. And, and at least now they know that we're okay, and everyone in this delegation is, is, is okay. Uh, I've been in contact with the Canadian consulate, and uh, their main objective for the day is to, uh, to uh, work with local officials to identify um, where Canadians are in, in New York and to uh, inform any families of, of, of any victims. It's, uh, this, is a, this is a hard day for, for everyone involved in, in helping the victims, saving lives, and, and informing the families. Now, have you been in touch with the consulate lately to know whether or not any Canadians Canadians were victims of the attack in New York City? Yeah, well, I, I talked to them about uh, 30 or 40 minutes ago, and they did not have any, uh, any details at that time. Their main focus right now is to, to identify where the Canadians are and to inform the families uh, and, to, and to help. And they're working with the local authorities to, to get that done. Obviously, uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, not an easy task, but what I've seen so far of the Canadian consulate, they were doing a very good job. 
All right, uh, Premier Lord, we want to thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, we're glad you're safe, and uh, I'm sure we'll be heading home shortly. Bernard Lord, uh, the Premier of New Brunswick. All right, uh, one place we have not checked uh, lately is the province of Quebec. Quebec uh, shares a border with, uh, with Vermont and parts of New York State and uh, is another place that I would assume uh, would be on high alert. Stuart Greer is our correspondent at Global Quebec. Stuart, what can you tell us? Well, Kevin, uh, at least the borders, last we heard that the borders were shut down. They weren't letting traffic cross the border. Uh, uh, some airport airplane traffic was directed toward Dorval Airport and Mirabel Airport. Mirabel has lots of uh, lots of space, of course, because it hasn't used as heavily as Dorval. For those who know Montreal, uh, airport officials here are saying that they can handle the air traffic. What they're worried about more is the actual passenger traffic. How they're going to actually uh, house and uh, and feed and find uh, locations to put these passengers. Uh, Montreal, of course, is a bit of an international aviation hub. There's the International uh, Civil Aviation Organization, which is here, and ironically, it was holding a big international conference. 3,000 uh, airport directors were here at the uh, the convention center in Montreal. Half of them were from the United States, so you can imagine that uh, pretty much everybody was riveted to TV screens there. Um, uh, they actually held a, an impromptu new news conference for most of those American airport officials to uh, tell them about what's going on and try to work out logistics to get in touch with uh, their uh, colleagues south of the border. A lot were trying to get across the border, of course, with the border closed. That's posed some problems. Uh, so so they were scrambling. In fact, uh, spoke to a couple of airport officials from Florida today who issued their press releases about uh, airport security for Florida and the Orlando area for Montreal. So in some way, Montreal has become a bit of a, a civil aviation hub for North America because of this conference that's going on, Kevin. All right. Thanks very much. I appreciate that update. Stuart Greer from uh, Global Quebec bringing us up to speed on what's happening in the province of Quebec. Let's go to New York now. Uh, CNN's Brian Glazer is a correspondent for uh, CNN. And, uh, you know, Brian, I used to live in New York not too long ago. I'm watching uh, with horror and, and disbelief today. Uh, how is the city coping right now? Where is it at? Kevin, I can tell you, I live at 3rd Avenue and 25th Street and was awakened this morning to watch CNN to see the first pictures coming in. When I walked out on the street below to try to get to the bureau, it, there, was, there was dismay on the faces of so many people. There were people crying in the streets. The only time I can remember this is as a child during the Kennedy assassination. That is the kind of day it is here in New York City. There is panic, there is fear, there is concern, and yet in some small pockets, this situation has galvanized New Yorkers who have been known to get together during the toughest of times. And this is certainly the toughest of times. It's been more than six hours since two jetliners, apparently under the control of armed terrorists, crashed into the World Trade Center. Now, in some streets, you'll find that it's desolate. In other streets, there are emergency vehicles moving back and forth. At approximately noontime, police began opening up Grand Central Terminal, trying to get people out of the city on northbound trains. And all of a sudden, while we were there, police got on bullhorns and began telling people to get out of the train station, get off 42nd Street, get away from the Chrysler building. And there was just a mad rush. It was a rampage of people, and they were crying. I saw a child who had stumbled in the street at the time and a mother picking them up. People just don't know where to go to for help at this time. Many people are walking around saying it's a movie, but in fact, it's reality. I think there's denial is the best way to explain it at this point. All right, uh, give us a sense, because there's a couple of information holes, and maybe your colleagues at CNN can fill them in for us. Were they able to evacuate any great numbers of people from the Twin Towers before they collapsed? I can't give you any kind of official numbers. The mayor just held a news conference a short while ago. The one statistic that came out of that is that they believe that possibly tens of thousands of people have been injured, thousands others dead. 1,500 people are shacked out on Liberty Island, which is on the other side where the Statue of Liberty is. I say shacked out, but really sheltered because they are, quote unquote, the walking wounded. Uh, I heard from one eyewitness account of firefighters kind of wedging their way into the World Trade Center to save people. I can't really tell you about specific figures at the time because they're not definitive and there's no clarity at this moment. Now, are authorities at this point able to work in the lower part of Manhattan below 14th Ave, or is this still pretty much a zone of debris? Are people not going in there because they're worried about something that might happen next? Well, I think that right now there are estimates of between 30 and 40,000 emergency workers in Lower Manhattan around the World Trade Center trying to help. I believe that at this point, many of the citizens have been moved away. Uh, there, unlike many things, there are no rubberneckers, no gawkers going to go look at the devastation because every tall building you're under, people believe, has the potential of being a target. And are people leaving Manhattan at this point? Or do we have, because I know they were telling everybody to stay in their buildings, to stay put, the bridges, the tunnels were closed. What's going on? Well, at 
there's conflicting information whether or not all the bridges and tunnels are closed. Primarily most of the accesses to the outer boroughs of Queens and Brooklyn, I understand, are closed. I'm not too sure about New Jersey at this point. However, I am now being told that uh, both the George Washington Bridge, the Lincoln Tunnel, and yes, also the Holland Tunnel are now shut off. So getting out of the city, the last attempt that we saw people trying to get out of the city was through Grand Central Terminal, which feeds the northern Westchester County area along the Hudson River, along the Bronx River Parkway, where there are millions of people who come into the city every day. I think a lot of people are kind of stuck here right now. I can look down at Penn Station. I don't see a crowd, which is the Long Island Railroad access. I also see police moving buses through the city trying to get people in and out. Uh, again, information is very sketchy. What we can tell you is that the police are working in conjunction with the National Guard, I understand, is moving in. And above head, unbelievably, are fighter jets and Marine Corps helicopters. It's a scene we've never seen in New York, at least in my lifetime. I know, and that's saying something. Brian Glazer, thank you for uh, taking the time to be with us today. And uh, it is, it's like an entire city is in shock. Okay, we are going to uh, switch now uh, to a press conference, which I understand is uh, about to get underway. Normal operations, passengers will be gated. Taken and this off is at the, Pearson uh, Airport in plane, Toronto. Put through necessary procedures at their international passengers. They will put through, be put through immigration and customs. And at that point, Airlines will be making uh, plans for accommodations for these people, I'm sure, helping them, helping them to find a place. I'm not sure. Again, that's an airline issue. Um, I'm sure they're doing their best to try to find accommodations for these people. Could you just clarify Peter, what the how many planes for? have been diverted or, or will be diverted in all two years? 20 to 25. Out of 500? Our understanding is there are in excess of 500 diverted planes this morning from American airspace, and of that total, only 20 to 25 at this point have been diverted to Pearson. Is that all what about No, it's not, it's not a matter of us handling it. We're not making the decision of how many we get. Uh, that's, that's done by the air traffic controllers, uh, and it's a coordinated effort. It, it depends on how much fuel a plane had, where it was at the time, and uh, what the closest airport for diversion is. So it's not a, a it, it's just that's what we've been told we're getting. When you have a, the, an estimate of the number of passengers that are stranded here, presumably there are thousands of passengers in the airport right now and possibly thousands more to come. How many? I wouldn't say that it, we're not in an issue where we have an unusual amount of thousands of passengers stranded in the airport. You've got to remember that on a given day, we handle about 84 aircraft. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Kevin Newman. I seem to uh, seem to have lost audio from the um, Pearson International Airport there. Uh, that was an official from the airport uh, briefing reporters on what the situation was. Uh, across this country, as we have said earlier, there has been uh, a number of flights. There have been a number of flights, American flights or flights headed to America that were diverted um, to, uh, to Canada because they did not want any air traffic uh, over that country at this point. Um, Linda Boyle is our uh, correspondent uh, that covers health usually. She was in Boston or on her way to Boston to uh, do a story for us there for Global National. Uh, but she arrived at Logan Airport, which is a, the major airport uh, in Boston. It's also the originating airport for the flight that uh, we have seen through the day uh, slammed into the um, World Trade Center. So, Linda, uh, I can't imagine what this scene is like at Logan right now. Can you try to describe it for me? Well, Kevin, actually, it's very quiet because uh, they're urging all the, everyone to leave the airport. They've cl totally closed the airport down, and um, now they're just having press conferences and briefing people. But they did confirm, actually, some interesting information uh, that both of these flights, both of the uh, flights that crashed into the uh, World Trade Center originated in Boston. And I have some numbers on uh, the number of people who were on those flights, if you'd like me to give Yes, them please. You. Yes, the information's been sketchy up to now. Okay, so we have American Airlines Flight 11, and that left at 7.59, and it was on its way to L.A. before it got rerouted. And there were 81 passengers on that flight, 11 crew members. And then the second flight that left Boston, uh, also apparently destined for Los Angeles, and that was United Airlines, and that was Flight 150, 175. 56 passengers on board, 9 crew members. 
Both of these flights were 767s, and both of them ended up being rerouted to the World Trade Center, according to airport authority representatives here. So it's very shocking for, for everyone. Now, Linda, you said that the airport was closed. I would assume that uh, because both of these flights that, that rammed into the, into the uh, World Trade Center originated in Boston, that they must be just combing the place for clues. Yes, yeah. And... Um, the airport authority is insisting that a high security standard was followed here. They won't comment, though, on uh, suggestions that there could have been a security breach. Obviously, there was a problem, uh, but they're not uh, willing to speculate at this point. Um, they just say they're shocked like everyone else is, and uh, they're trying to deal with this as best they can. Uh, they don't expect to open the airport here until at least midnight, and uh, that's the latest on that. All right, and the families, I think, in your last report to us, you said that they were being taken by bus to another location. The families, I'm thinking of, you know, all the people that put their loved ones on, on, on a plane in Boston. They are being sequestered in the uh, Hilton Hotel, and media cannot get in. However, I did speak to one reporter who walked in without a camera. She said that there were several, um, several priests there, several clergy members. She did see one uh, older gentleman, uh, apparently very distraught, uh, saying how much uh, he loved someone, uh, perhaps his wife, and that was the scene as described to me by a reporter who happened to get inside without a camera, but they're not uh, cooperating, cooperating with the media at the uh, family center. Right, needless to say. All right, Linda Boyle, thank you for this update. Uh, Linda Boyle is our national health correspondent. She is at uh, Boston Airport, where, as she just reported, two of the uh, the planes that slammed into the uh, World Trade Center originated from. Uh, Wilf Dinick uh, has been reporting this morning from and this afternoon from uh, one of the busiest border crossings that Canada has with the United States. He joins us again live uh, from Fort Erie. Wilf, what do you have? Well, Kevin, we're, we're, not still, we're still not getting cooperation from the U.S. side, but the mood here has changed dramatically in the last couple of hours. What we're seeing is a very tense situation, and that's sort of the best way to describe it. I'm in a little parquet, and uh, I'm just sitting here, and you can see over my shoulder, those are the trucks going from the Canada side to the U.S. side. Now, in this parkette, there's no pedestrian traffic. It seems to be allowed, although that's not an official policy. We have seen a, uh, the odd pedestrian walk across, and uh, Border Patrol comes screaming up with its sirens on, that pedestrian having to give up their uh, identification, and, and then they're taken away. We're trying to get some word on you know, where that person went or why pedestrians aren't allowed in this area, but they're being, being very secure. We also had uh, several uh, Border Patrol in full flak jackets come over and tell us that if we wanted to stay here, that was fine, but to make sh sure we wear our identification. So it's a really secure area. Now, the trucks behind me are, the, are on the Canadian side, and they're going to the U.S. side. And I think we have some video of the inspection going on. What's happening is that they're holding it about two dozen trucks on the Canadian side, and then what happens is they let all that commercial traffic go at one time into the U.S. side, and that's where they're going over, as uh, one Border Patrol said, with a fine tooth and comb looking for anything. Uh, they are going through the trunks, and they are inspecting all the cargo, interviewing all the drivers of all those trucks. Now, I spoke to Jim Johnson, and he's the regional director on the Canada side here at Border Patrol, and what they're saying is that there's no official policy, but everyone is working together on both sides of the border, and what they're calling it is, a, is heightened security. So they're, they're being very careful about what goes across this border. And one more thing, Kevin, the, commer the uh, pedestrian traffic, at least the cars that are going across, they've almost stopped. I mean, there's really only three or four cars uh, lined up to get on either side of the border. So it's a good indication that uh, people are staying away from this border, and, and that's probably a good idea. Well, and Wilf, as you, uh, as you mentioned, uh, quite a change in mood, because when we went to you earlier in the day, it seemed like, uh, you know, uh, people were checking cars, but it seems like we've gone to a heightened level of security. That, that's really true, and as I said, I, when I spoke to Jim Johnson, the regional director for this border crossing, he had just gotten off a conference call with all sides of the border and all uh, patrol officials, RCMP, OPP, and said that they were all working together to make sure that the traffic was going across, but that they were going to check absolutely everything. So, and you also, we're also seeing the odd helicopter go across. So, what was sort of... Uh, Last days ago, a little lazy earlier now has become uh, very tense. All right, Wilf Dinick, thanks very much. Wilf reporting from Fort Erie. Just as a reminder, the reason, of course, that the Americans and the Canadian authorities are sealing the borders is that if there has been anybody involved in this terrorist incident in New York, it would take about eight hours to drive from New York City to the border point where Wilf was standing right there. Uh, it's a lot faster drive from New York City up toward Montreal. It's only about a five-hour drive. So we are now in a position that people who, if they wanted to try to escape the United States, would be in a position of heading toward the Canadian border. 
which is why we are uh, seeing, obviously, heightened alert along the border stations there. We are now joined by Jonathan Freed in Montreal. He's not at the border, but he is at another place, and uh, Jonathan, uh, I would assume that the security is as tight there as, as you would expect. Absolutely, Kevin. I can tell you that I'm standing in downtown Montreal, right in front of the American consulate. And not 10 minutes ago, security officials from the consulate were holding mirrors underneath the cars that are parked just five feet from me, sweeping underneath the cars, checking to see whether there would be anything suspicious there. This consulate has been closed for the most part to business throughout the day, although the staff, as we understand it, has largely been inside. And about 20 minutes ago, it did reopen. There was a line of people standing here, usually at 3 o'clock every day. They hand out visas and stamps passports and conduct that type of routine business and despite the increase in security Kevin people have been allowed as of the last 20 minutes or so to enter the cons uh, consulate one at a time to apply for passports and visas and that kind of thing Kevin okay Jonathan one one further question I don't know whether you've had a chance to talk with American authorities inside the consulate but I would imagine that they are working the phones on behalf of American expatriates here in Canada who are trying to find out what's happened we do have a sense that that's what's going on because people were actually showing up at the door during the period before 3 o'clock uh, Eastern Time here in Montreal before they reopened the consulate for visas and passports and so on. People were trying to get word, Americans that were here trying to get word back to the U.S., trying to let people know that they were all right. So a whole cross-section of things is being handled by the consulate here in Montreal. All right, thanks very much. Jonathan Freed from uh, Global Quebec, uh, live from outside the U.S. Uh, consulate uh, in uh, Montreal. Uh, we have a statistic now, and this is one a number that will change as the day goes on, but upwards of 250 flights have now been diverted to Canadian uh, airports across the country. Those were flights that were in the air when this terrorist attack occurred. Uh, they were flights that the American FAA, the Federal Administra uh, Aviation Administration, did not want in the air, so they are landing currently at airports across this country, primarily, as we heard from Alan Rowe from uh, Global Atlantic, uh, on, in, on the eastern seaboard at airports in Halifax, Newfoundland, and Labrador. All right, we're going to did uh, as a consequence of those hearings was to, in effect, unilaterally disarm in terms of our in intelligence capabilities. Now we have the best, you know, we have the best uh, technological intelligence yes. gathering operations and capabilities in the world, but we need this human intelligence to penetrate groups like the group that must have carried out this, uh, these operations. I have only a vague recollection of this, but I think the point you're making is that there are some forces, political and otherwise in the United States, who believe that getting down and dirty with potential terrorists around the world is not something we should be doing, that we should do it all technically, therefore not put people at risk? That's correct. That was the thinking, and that's pretty much the, uh, pretty much the policy we've followed mm -hmm. since then, and I think we need to get back into the down and dirty business so we can penetrate these groups and hopefully prevent these types of things from happening in the future. Mr. Bick, I don't want to get ahead of things, and I'm sure you do not either, but if there is... Uh, and as somebody said earlier, there are no good options out there at the moment. But do you believe that the United States is, if it finds out that a state is involved, going to have to go to war in an active way against that state? Well, first of all, I don't believe we're going to find out that a state is involved. Mm. I cannot really, frankly, conceive of a state doing this. There could be, I suppose, some indirect assistance from a state or groups within a state. And I don't think that's going to be the case. But if it were the case... I think we need to do uh, whatever, whatever we reasonably and responsibly can to protect the American people, whatever that involves. Now, this is always the toughest question for somebody who has been in office but is not currently. How much easier is it to say what you do now that you're not in government? In other words, were you still, were you the man, were you the Secretary of State in the Bush administration at, at the moment? Now, would you not feel rather constrained by modern circumstances as to what you could do? Well, I don't know. I mean, there, you know, we have, we, we, frankly, uh, Peter, we have some uh, laws on our books that we ought to take a look at. One of them is simply a presidential executive order that says the United States doesn't go out and assassinate people. I think there was a very good reason behind that, but I dare say that you would have about 99 percent, uh, if not 100 percent, public support across the United States today if we found out that one terrorist group was responsible for this for these incidents uh you would have 100 percent support almost for for uh taking care of that of the person who leads that group 
one of the difficulties, of course, uh, Mr. Baker, is that w in, a, in a situation like this, we end up fighting like the terrorists to some extent, right? Well, that, that, that is unfortunately the case. That's mm -hmm. true. But, but it may be that that's the only way we can really take care of the problem. You know, the president said today, he made a statement I think was absolutely the right statement. He said, he said uh, America is under attack, uh, under terrorist attack, and he said we are going to hunt down and punish those we find responsible for this and uh, that to my way of thinking means doing whatever is required mr baker thanks very much for the time thank you james sure. baker the former secretary of state also widely known in the country as the man who uh, did as much as he did to uh, win florida for george bush at the last uh, presidential election but a longtime member of the american political and foreign policy establishment and who knows how complicated this is and who makes a very open you'll hear this a lot in the next few days not enough human intelligence and we'll review who that legislator was tony cordesman uh, our military analyst um are you listening to mr baker is he making sense he is peter but i think we need to have an important caution here human intelligence isn't as simple as it sounds the actual agents can take years to develop Historically, they've often been unreliable, and the more hostile the ideology is, the more uncertain the collection. Human intelligence is also analysis. Our analytic side is weak. The CIA has had hiring freezes. There is so little money for CIA and for DIA that most of the country analysts have never been to the countries they're actually analyzing, much less talked to many of the elements within them. And as Secretary Baker pointed out, if you're going to go into operations, that's different from human intelligence, and our operations capability has been allowed to decline for nearly a decade. Thank you, Tony. The game has changed a good deal today, yeah. so let us get back. Yes, John. Before Sorry. Jerry Hauer leaves us right. and he's promised to come back, okay. um, all of the discussions we've had raised the question to me, and I know Jerry's been more fully briefed on these national security agencies than in uh, matters than any of us have. How many of these attacks have we known about and been able to prevent? How many that we've heard about? How many that we haven't heard about? And have any of them been on this scale? Uh, uh, that's difficult to answer, John, because a lot of that, um, a lot of that material is classified. A lot of that is kept classified, but. Uh, there clearly are a number of threats that uh, occur in this country uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, uh, some of them are, are hoaxes, some of them are credible, uh, some of them are quite, quite credible. Um, and uh, the, the spectrum varies. And um, they've, um, they've had, uh, and some we've been very fortunate with, as we were right before the millennium with uh, uh, the uh, the intrusion from Canada. Yeah, the, yeah. But, that, but that was one that was the work of an alert agent. How many have we actually prevented through intelligence, which is, is kind of what Mr. Wolsey and Mr. Baker have been talking yeah, about? I'm, I'm not sure anybody has a good number on that. I, uh, that's something that I think that uh, would difficult, be difficult uh, to put your finger on at this point. I, you know, and I'd be interesting to get that from the FBI. I'm not sure mm -hmm. that I've ever heard a number on how many we've actually um, uh, thwarted. Um, have you ever picked up the phone in your emergency management center and had someone on the other end who said we're going to blow up something? Um, we actually did receive a number of threats. What was uh, it like? Um, what did, what did... We had um, uh, some letters come in and we turned them over to the FBI. Um, by and large, we uh, felt that uh, the majority of them were hoaxes, mm. uh, but uh, we relied on the FBI for their... Um... We want to quickly switch you over now from ABC to CNN, where they have some exclusive pictures they've been showing, and let's see if we can get a look at them now. Just about a block and a half away here in Washington, a block and a half away from the White House, CNN senior White House correspondent John King. John, you were not traveling, of course, with President Bush, who went to Florida yesterday, but you have been talking to a number of people around the president who are trying to stay on top of what's happened. Trying to stay on top, top of what has happened, Judy, despite the fact that from the ground up anyway, the White House complex, which you see behind me, the building itself and the old executive office building, which is home to a number of senior administration officials, a virtual ghost town, evacuated this morning. The president, as we have reported, is now at a military installation in the Midwest. The president, first from Florida, stopped at a military installation in Louisiana. He was briefed. 
Then there was talk that he would come back to Washington, and administration officials saying they believe that is politically very important to send a signal to get the president Which back I to the thought. White House as soon as possible. But the president instead stopped at a second military installation in Nebraska. We are told he is participating in a National Security Council meeting by telephone. Vice President Dick Cheney has been in the White House, underground in the White House Operations Center, the Situation Room, which is a fortified command and control structure throughout the day with other national security officials receiving information from around the country and directing U.S. operations from there. We do know on Air Force One en route from Louisiana to the Midwest, the President spoke to the Mayor of New York and the Governor of New York. He's been in constant contact with officials back here, including members of the Congressional leadership who also have been asked by their security to go to a secure bunker area built for just such a situation, a national security emergency in the United States, the leaders of Congress taken as well to a secure location. Again, the White House grounds were evacuated when all this was taking place this morning. From this perch up here, which you are familiar with from anchoring inside politics, you can still see smoke wafting up from the Pentagon and National Airport across the Potomac River, usually one of the nation's busiest, of course, now completely shut down as part of the security precautions being taken here. We are told there is a priority on trying to get the president back to the White House, but priority number one is the president's security. And I've spoken to several senior administration officials as well as some security sources who say at this moment they know of no specific additional threats, but of course they were caught so completely off guard this morning, extra precautions being taken because of the scope of these devastating terrorist attacks. Judy. All right, John King uh, at a uh, location on top of an office building just a few blocks from the White House, as you can see, reporting uh, on the scene there where every federal building in the city of Washington has been evacuated. Joining us now on the telephone, former Georgia United States Senator Sam Nunn. Senator Nunn, uh, are you in Atlanta, New York? Judy, I'm in Wilmington, Delaware. All right. Senator, long time... Uh, uh, leader of uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee, someone who has followed uh, military affairs in this country for, for so long. Um, what are you thinking right now? First, it was certainly a day of hate in terms of what uh, was perpetrated by whoever did this, and, and second, a day of sorrow for the people who are the victims and their families. And It uh, certainly was a cruel and heartless uh, and monstrous type attack. I think it's very important that we are steadfast in this country. We always rise to the occasion and work together when we're in a crisis. And I think this qualifies for uh, mustering the American will to remain calm and collected and determined and firm, but uh, most of all, solidarity here at home with the president. Uh, following his lead with the governors, with mayors. We are switching back between ABC and CNN to give you the best of coverage from the both of the networks. Ann Compton is reporting on the president's whereabouts. He is at an undisclosed and, uh, location in Nebraska. He Let's hear where the president is now. a place as he could, uh, where he is trying to marshal the forces. He's also talking to some of the civilian leaders on the ground, including Mayor Giuliani and Governor Pataki. Um, but we were told there was no direct threat to him and no advance warning. And that in itself, Peter, is distressing to the uh, very small number of staff of the president here at Offutt. So, so the procedures are in place and, and they do what they do, right? Well, you know, in, in 27 years of covering presidents and crises, we have never played the kind of hunted game that uh, was played today where we would take off in the plane and not know where we were going to land. And then once we landed in Louisiana, where we were literally told not to use cell phones so our location couldn't be pinpointed, to take off again uh, and head to uh, the center. It, it does feel like a cat and mouse game. Ari Fleischer, when I asked him if the president feels in jeopardy or hunted, he said the president understands that this is kind of the precaution that is necessary at a time like this and that he's anxious to get back to Washington. And, and for example, when you phoned us just a moment ago, thank goodness you did, did you have to ask permission to do it? Uh, no, because it, it is hard to hide a great big airplane like Air Force One. And when we were coming in, I could tell we were over a flat area, a fairly <laughs> urban area. And uh, I guess it was Nebraska, knowing that uh, we hadn't been that far out of Louisiana. And indeed, as we came down over the field, I saw a satellite, a TV satellite truck out on the highway. <laughs> And sure enough, on our screens inside the plane, we watched ourselves land. The local media was already here figuring this is where the President of the United States and the Commander-in-Chief would land. 
because it's part of the old Strategic Air Defense Command. Exactly right. It has the facilities, the secure facilities here, where the president can still be, as what Ari tells me, is a seamlessly in touch with the command structure in Washington. And which we remind ourselves, and I'm going to involve George Stephanopoulos in this conversation, but just think about how the world has changed and yet in some respects hasn't. The president's gone to Nebraska to a facility which was designed during the Cold War, um, where the president might retreat or go in the case of a thermonuclear exchange or an atomic thermonuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union. It, it, That's really amazing, something to think about. It, it, it's an amazing uh, comment on where we are in the 21st century. You know, we have been checked our bags over and over again today. We take that kind of security routinely on Air Force One, but it's been double that today. And just the thought of Americans who are stranded in airports all across the country trying to to get home uh, today or tomorrow the kind of security they will then then uh, face that uh, certainly the white house sees uh, the ramifications and the impact of this extending through american life uh, as far as you can see annie thank you very much i hope you'll stay in, in fact i know you'll stay in touch um, you. there are just... five of us who have been allowed to stay with the president but we are allowed in the underground bunker with him i say that again there are only five of us reporters who have been allowed to stay with him. Everyone else was left in Louisiana. Uh, there are four staff members, five, five of us from the press, and a very small Secret Service uh, contingent. It was an em almost an empty Air Force One that brought us here. We don't know how long we'll be here or when the president will find it safe to go back to Washington. But well, you're not in the bunker. No, they would not let us in the bunker. We are above ground uh, looking at the metal... Between, between him and us. Okay, Annie, thanks very much. Ann Compton, just to bring you up to date very quickly on the rest of the, of, of the, of the first family, uh, Ari Fleischer, the president and press secretary, did say that Barbara, uh, the two 19-year-old ghosts, Barbara at Yale and, and, and Jen at the University of Texas were moved to secure locations. Mrs. Bush was with a group of friends, uh, and they were in, in an undisclosed uh, location, but she's had a chance to talk to the president, and everything is pretty cool there. But everything we hear and everything we report to you hour after hour after hour um, is a reminder of how seriously people have taken this. And I want to go to George Stephanopoulos, uh, not so much in his position as a reporter today, but calling on his experience in the White House. George, I, to be honest, I plead naivete maybe here a bit, but I'm surprised at the lengths to which whomever has gone to keep the president on the move from Florida to Louisiana to Nebraska rather than going back to Washington. What's the thinking behind well, that and what did it have occurred in the previous administration? Well, my, my guess is, first of all, we've never seen anything like this before, so it's hard mm -hmm. to answer your second question. I think this is a testimony to the seriousness uh, of the situation to make sure, number one, this means that the Secret Service, I think, is in charge. Right. Their number one and really only job is to protect the body of the president, and they're going to all links to do that right now. Peter, there are also some, some small indications and I, that, that the, the broader evacuation of the senior staff of the White House that is always planned for in emergencies, as you hinted at, from a relic from the cold war days has also gone into effect i spoke with the the spouse hang on, george, of the senior hang white on, house george i apologize i'm only interrupting you because you're so okay you don't have those sirens behind you go ahead the sirens behind me sorry I, I spoke earlier just a little while ago to the spouse of a senior white house official who received a call simply from the secret service saying uh your spouse is safe uh, is in a secure location right now. I remember from my early days, Peter, in the White House, several senior White House staff are given cards and have evacuation plans for places to go in cases of national emergency. And as I said, it does seem to be, there does seem to be some indication that that may have been put into effect. I would just add one more note. You, Ann was talking about the possibility of the president doing now a teleconference with his, his senior national security right. officials. There are facilities in the White House, not the normal situation room, which everyone has seen in the past, has seen pictures of, but there is a second situation room behind the, the primary situation room, which has video conferencing capabilities. The, the director of the Pentagon, the, the defense chief, can speak from the National Military Command Center at the Pentagon. The uh, sec Secretary of State can speak from the State Department, the president from wherever he is. And they'll have this capability to video conference throughout this crisis. In my time at the White House, it was used in, af in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, in the aftermath of the TWA Flight 800 bombing. And, and that would be the way they would stay in contact through the afternoon. Uh, uh, just a couple of, uh, of, of short questions. Um, given where the president has gone from Florida to Louisiana to Nebraska 
And given that we hear from the political staff that he'd like, they'd like him to come back to Washington, does the president have any say at the moment, basically, if the Secret Service says go left or go right or go here or go there? Well, the president has the ability to overrule them if he wants, but I think in this situation, Peter, he, he would follow their directions, obviously pushing them uh, to try to get back as soon as as soon as he could, if that was really what his political advisors wanted. But but he would he would take their direction on this one. Sometimes you can fight the Secret Service on you know how long you're going to spend in a rope line. I don't think you'd do it on this. Okie dokie. And the other question is, in terms of Dick Cheney, the vice president, is in the White House now. Just from a purely operational point of view, if you were trying to run things at the moment, would you like to be in the White House or in a bunker in Nebraska? Or would it make any difference? Um, well, it, it doesn't. I, I think right now, Peter, it doesn't make any difference. Air Force One and this bunker in Nebraska has complete communications all across the board. And as I said, my guess is that Vice President Cheney is in that second situation room. A camera is trained on him. He can see the president. The president can see him. They can see Secretary Rumsfeld, Secretary State Powell. It's as if they're meeting in one room. Now tell me, let's, re let's return to the, the immediate business at hand. Uh, I, I, every time I check in with you or we check in with you i hear sirens virtually right underneath you what's going on right underneath you well right underneath i'm at canal street and the avenue of americas which is about 20 blocks away from the world trade center there every once in a while right outside my window right now there are about four police vans and a police car um there there but the police seem to just be stationing there almost resting right now the area right around us is quite quiet about an hour ago two hours ago there were hordes of people walking uptown that's pretty much stopped now peter i gotta tell you it's very strange you look down on the sidewalk and you just have people strolling uh, in their summer clothes up in this neighborhood right here but again from what we've heard of that situation down by the world trade center it's horrific it's kind of eerily silent the the firemen are, are relieving each other every 15 minutes or so they come out they get showered down with fire hoses to get all the soot off and then they go right back in and get to work and, and just remind me one more time george the you know our the, the layman's notion of a bunker is one thing out in nebraska and i assume the white house has another notion of bunker. What does it mean down the rabbit hole in, into the bunker? Well, in the bunker would just be certainly underground, a secure situation room. Um, but, but the important point, Peter, is that wherever that bunker is, um, and it's reinforced by guards and concrete and all that, the president is in full communication with his entire national security team, and, and he can direct them at a moment's notice. And I think the big question that they're going to have to address now as they gather the facts, as they try and figure out who's responsible for this, uh, even though they want to get the president back to Washington as soon as possible, and I'm sure they'll do that, they won't want him to go before the country again until he has more to say, and probably until he can say what actions he's going to take um, in response to this. Okay, thanks, George Stephanopoulos, uh, who, as he pointed out, was somewhat isolated from the violence there, because as close as they'll let you broadcast at this point, uh, but you can still see the smoke uh, coming up. Um, it's felt all over the country. A number of newspapers around the country are now putting out special editions of the day. I remember when the Challenger exploded. We were on television for many, many, many hours. Uh, and which does, to some extent, isolate. We want to quickly switch back now to CNN to show you the celebrations uh, amongst the Palestinians on the West Bank. And now they have broken away to once again resume a, a look at what's happening at the World Trade Center. We're trying to stay ahead of both networks here to give you the, the most uh, interesting and the, the, mo the most recent coverage that we possibly can. Let's listen to what's happening at CNN. Celebrations, as we've seen in Palestinian streets, is a context of an area in which violence has been ongoing for nearly... 12 months. The context, too, that some Palestinians have uh, criticized the United States sharply for what is seen as its uh, support of Israel in this ongoing conflict. And certainly the Palestinian leadership has been very quick to disassociate itself from those images on the ground, making quite close uh, clear that it condemns uh, in the strongest of terms the events in the United States. All radical Palestinian groups, too, have disassociated themselves and denied any responsibility for the United States attacks. Aaron? Mike, thank you. CNN's Mike Hanna, our Jerusalem bureau chief, uh, where it's about quarter to 11 uh, in Israel, about quarter to four here in New York. Um, hospitals here uh, continue to be inundated with the injured, uh, the most serious of the injured being treated first in a classic triage operation. Maria Hinojosa is at St. Vincent Hospital. She joins us on the phone. Maria, what are you seeing and what are you hearing? 
Well, Aaron, uh, since about uh, 10 o'clock this morning, there's been a steady uh, stream of ambulances coming into St. Vincent's, which is the central area, uh, central hospital for the traumatized, where they're dealing with the trauma unit here. Now, what we've seen, the most recent numbers now, there's 256 patients. 25 of them are in critical condition. Three of them have passed away, and about 30 firefighters and police have also been treated. Just to give you an idea of the numbers, this hospital handled the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. There they saw a total of only 160 patients. They are now having well surpassed that by 100, 100 patients, more or less, 256 patients now. Mayor Giuliani arrived here about five minutes ago. Um, he went straight inside. We're expecting him to come out and address the media here. And essentially there's a sea of green. Uh, office chairs have been uh, draped with white sheets to be used uh, instead of stretchers. Uh, buses have been ferrying hundreds of volunteers who have come to donate blood. They've been taken to uh, other locations. And uh, just about two minutes ago, we saw another busload um, carrying doctors and nurses who have come off. Lots of doctors and nurses coming to St. Vincent's wanting to volunteer. People here saying that they're um, asking them to come later tonight where they're expected to uh, be receiving patients well, well into the night for the next 24 hours at least. Aaron? Maria, thank you. Um, a snapshot of what is going on in uh, any number of hospitals here in the city of New York and in the New York region, um, in, the, in the counties surrounding New York. This is all being uh, played out in very much the same way. Another snapshot, if you will. CNN producer Alec Mirren is in a car in New Jersey trying to make uh, his way to us here in, in the city. Uh, Alec, can you hear me? I, I can, Aaron. Tell me what. Tell me what is out there right now. How far are you from Manhattan? Well, I'm in. Uh, I've been traveling from suburban, uh, suburban Maryland today, trying to come up, like you said, to assist in the coverage. And it's it's eerie how uh, these events are impacting travel all along the Northeast Corridor. Uh, as you know, a very busy um, commuter area. Went to the uh, train station in Baltimore this morning. The trains have just been canceled. People were uh, forming carpools to get where they needed to go. Um, as I jumped in my car and headed north on uh, Interstate 95 and then on to uh, the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, lots of signs, um, serious problems avoid New York. On the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, I don't know if this is unprecedented, but it's certainly uh, unusual. Everyone was funneled off of the turnpike uh, at exit 11. Which All right, let's go back to ABC. Bill Blakemore now reporting from the lower side of Manhattan. Partial defeat this morning, and they know that many of their colleagues are missing with the civilians in the wreckage. I've talked to several of them who were in one of the towers when the other one was collapsing, who barely got out. They're not quite sure how and can't even begin to talk about it. Uh, uh, tables have been set up in the street here by some of the officers who are helping them figure out who's going to go in when they can. There's a triage center that's been set up in the Manhattan Community College uh, where bodies and people and survivors are going to be brought as they begin to figure out how badly they're injured. And we can tell because they still can't go in, they're still milling around in the hot sun here, that it's going to take a long time before they can even begin to assess how many people there are who need their help in search and rescue, which is uh, going to go on for some time. The streets just behind us uh, are quite different. Uh, there's almost an eerie war scene type of feeling because much of this uh, part of the West Village has emptied out. On this very clear hot day, there are occasionally jet fighters circling overhead, so there's even just a touch of the feeling of uh, covering a war. But for the most part, uh, everybody is still looking at this enormous wreckage and just beginning to absorb what it is, and these firemen are eager and ready to get in there as they begin to gather themselves and dust themselves off from, uh, from their first uh, foray in this morning. Bill, th this is an excellent report. I just have this one question, and it may just simply be my own inability to grasp it visually. Are they actually getting into either of the former towers of the Trade Center or are they still working on the outside perimeter? Uh, I cannot tell you the exact answer to that. Uh, many of them are still waiting on the outside of the perimeter to figure out how to get into the general area. When the North Tower collapsed, uh, parts of the top of it fell over all the way over here to the river. And so they're still trying to sort out through the smoke just exactly where they can get into. They are not letting the media get anywhere near the actual base um, of the two towers themselves. Uh, but. 
there's just a general sense of these uh, accumulating hundreds of firemen, that they're, they're ready to go in, they're waiting to find where an opening will be. Okay, thanks very much, Bill Blakemore. ABC's Don Daler did manage to get, I think, pretty close to the building uh, at one point early today. Don, are you there? Yes, Peter, I'm here. I'm, I'm just back to uh, about four blocks away, but uh, I was uh, I escorted a federal agent through the uh, up to the side of the World Trade Center itself and can tell you it, it is the, probably the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. There is total devastation, but beyond that, there um, there's no non-gruesome way to describe this, but there, were, there are bodies and body parts um, on top of some buildings next to where the World Trade Center stood in the streets. There is uh, still a number of fires going on in buildings surrounding it, including the Marriott. There is a, uh, the Marriott buildings appears to be, uh, be on fire. There's a building directly behind the federal office building. I can't identify which building it is, but it's a taller building. The police and the firemen are... Uh, are getting away from that area. They're afraid that that building will collapse as well. There have been a couple building collapses or portions of them collapsing from the flames. So there are some buildings that they are just letting burn uh, to collapse because it's too dangerous for them to fight it right now. Don, thanks very much, Don. And now here is the, uh, we're going to go to a briefing now on behalf of the, the political wing of the president's, I'm sorry. Just have a very brief statement, and I want Chief Jester to talk about the search and rescue efforts underway. No surprise, we have very, very few details. We'll tell you what we can at this stage, but we have very few details. Um, this is a terrible day. It is a tragic day for America. Our thoughts and prayers are with the injured and their families and the casualties. We're taking every appropriate step and precaution to prevent further attacks. We're making every effort to take care of the injured still in the building. And we're taking every appropriate measure to determine who is responsible. The Secretary of Defense... And at President Bush's direction, we are implementing it. We began to implement it immediately after the first attack in New York this morning. We contacted American forces and embassies throughout the world and placed them on high alert. The United States Secret Service immediately secured the President, the Vice President, and the Speaker of the House, and they are all safe. They have also secured members of the national security team, the president's cabinet, and senior staff. As you know, President Bush was in Sarasota, Florida when the first attack occurred this morning. Air Force One has now landed at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, and the president is in a secure location. He is in continuous communication with the vice president and key members of his cabinet and national security team. Vice President Cheney and our national security advisor Condoleezza Rice are in a secure facility at the White House. I have just come from there. The Secretary of Transportation and other members of our White House senior staff are gathered at a command center there and we are coordinating with other branches of our federal government. The Secretary of Defense remains at the Pentagon and the Secretary of State is en route back to Washington from his trip to South America. President Bush is conducting a meeting of the National Security Council as we speak. They are meeting President Bush from his location and other members from different locations in Washington and other locations. As many of you have been reporting, the Federal Aviation Administration ordered all airports closed and all planes which were in the air were directed to land at the nearest airport. International flights were diverted to alternate locations outside of the United States. Transportation Secretary Mineta has directed the Federal Aviation Administration to suspend operations until at least noon tomorrow. So no airline flights will operate until at least then and until the FAA announces that operations will be resumed. Secretary Mineta has also issued orders controlling the movement of all vessels in United States navigable waters. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has activated eight urban search and rescue task forces in New York, and four of these highly trained teams are at work here in Washington at the Pentagon. Every federal agency has implemented continuity of operations plans to make sure the government continues to function 
effectively. While the markets closed today because of the situation in Manhattan, the United States financial system has continued to operate. Banks have been open all day. The Federal Reserve has operated regularly and continuously. The Department of Health and Human Services has mobilized medical personnel and supplies to provide help to local authorities who are working so diligently to respond and try to help the victims of these terrible attacks. President Bush has committed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to identify and bring to swift justice those responsible for these despicable attacks. The Department of Justice is setting up a hotline for families who fear that their relatives may have been victims of one of these attacks, and we will be announcing that telephone number shortly. Our fellow citizens and our freedom came under attack today, and no one should doubt America's resolve. President Bush and all our country's leaders thank the many Americans who are helping with rescue and relief efforts. We ask our fellow Americans for your prayers, for the victims, for their families, for the rescue workers, and for our country. Thank you all very much, and we will continue to update you as information is available and confirmed. Karen Hughes, Karen Hughes, the uh, uh, president. I, I must say, John Miller, that there's not an enormous amount of news in there if we've been following this th this event all day. No, even the White House seems to be having difficulty gleaning the facts which officials in New York City just don't seem to know. Yeah. In terms of level of casualties, yeah. number of people killed. And, it, and it's enormously, enormous. Look, we're going to go to the our White House correspondent, Claire Shipman, one of our White House correspondents, Claire Shipman, at the moment, uh, to see what's going on. But it's an, I, I'm very deeply sympathetic with the with the, the difficulty it is to get down to street level, either at the Pentagon uh, or certainly in New York City, and understand the chaos and the tragedy that has appeared at ground level. Those of us sitting in newsrooms, um, bringing in, interpreting, analyzing information at a variety of levels, uh, are, are not doing a good enough job because probably an impossible job to do to try to, to have ourselves and you understand just um, what happened when that building fell in on each other. Listening to Bill Blakemore a short while ago and Don Daly are very helpful in terms of trying to understand it. But there is a, there is a delay in, in everything. There's a delay in government at the federal, state, and the national level. Airlines, of course, all across the country closed down. And it's, and it's true with news coverage as well, as best we can sense from here, that it's hard to get back from the immediate scene of this um, enough of a sort of texture to help us understand how what enormous this is. Maybe you don't need it, maybe you already appreciate that, but that's our sense uh, from here. But there's Karen Hughes uh, making... Uh, the president has appeared, remember, uh, twice. Claire Shipman ready? Claire? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Oh, you, you better, you, much better you than me bring us up to date on what's happening in the presidential establishment both there and elsewhere. Well, let me tell you what we know so far. You obviously just heard a statement from Karen Hughes that seemed designed to try to express to the country that the government is still up and running. Uh, the, the political advisors, as you've, you've mentioned a couple of times, would very much like to see the president get back to Washington when it's safe so that he can address the country. But in the meantime, they certainly want to give the impression that everything is under control, that the vice president is at the White House, Condoleezza Rice is at the White House, the Federal Reserve is still operating, banks are open, HHS is mobilized. And, and I think that was the point she is trying to get across. We've been told that the president may be back as early as this evening. The AP was also reporting he's considering some sort of address to the nation this evening, but again, it may be that he will want to have something very specific to be able to tell the public before that happens. Colin Powell, we're told, is on his way back from Peru. It's not clear where he will head. At this moment, what has happened in terms of the Secret Service is that their plan has gone into effect for this sort of emergency. The first time, we're told, that a plan like this has been implemented in, in recent history, of course. But what it means is they have all of their protectees accounted for. They're satisfied with that now. Now we're told they're in level two where they're assessing the threat. And they will then decide 
things, for example, as to whether Colin Powell can go back and safely work at the State Department and whether the president can come back to Washington. In the meantime, as you probably know, there's been a state of emergency declared in the city of Washington and in the state of Virginia, allowing both of those places to be able to mobilize um, military and police forces a as needed, Peter. Thanks very much. Uh Claire Shipman from Washington. It is a, it's very difficult to keep your hands on the political establishment today, in part because we rely on government uh, so often in cases like this to tell us what is going on in their various departments, and it has been very difficult today to uh, get, the, for example, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Administration uh, got involved I in this today, but it's hard because of the communications problems all across the country to have a real appreciation of what they are participating. The most direct uh, communication we've had has been with uh, with New York City on the ground that is other than in terms of uh, the president's movements from Florida to Louisiana and now on to Nebraska where he is going to stay for the indefinite future though political is political staff keep saying he'd really like to come back to Washington there is something interesting in the laundry list of, of things that Karen Hughes counselor to the president said in the briefing we just looked at which is um, one is that uh, airspace will remain uh, shut down under government control until noon tomorrow, and that the movements of ships uh, around the coast will be regulated by the government. That suggests, um, I mean, we're talking about not a few hours, we're talking about uh, halfway into the next day. That suggests that there's a real feeling in the intelligence community and, and in Washington that this may not be over, that they don't want to let go of, of the assets like air traffic, that they think, um, could unleash even more attacks. I, I wonder, John, if there is a real feeling in the intelligence community that may not be over, or, God, we didn't know any of this was going on. Maybe there's something else there that we don't have the vaguest idea Precisely. about. Precisely. I mean, it seems to be an abundance of caution um, and some degree of fear. Okay. Now, we're joined by ABC's Betsy Stark, who covers business and economics for us. I, uh, you add to this extraordinary notion of how much the national life has been interrupted today by an act of, or several, act, two acts of terrorism. Anyway. Um, start first with who's, what businesses were in the World Trade Center. We've talked to people before about the number of people in the Trade Center. Yeah. And what else has happened? Peter, it's astounding um, how much the Twin Towers are part of the, of the life of the financial district. Ten percent of all the office space in Lower Manhattan is accounted for in those Twin Towers. 155 businesses, 50,000 workers, as you've said before, uh, including some of the, the, the major uh, financial firms. Morgan Stanley Stanley, the investment bank, uh, has uh, 50 floors in, uh, in Tower One. 12, 50? 50 floors, I believe is right. 12.5% of the space in that tower uh, occupied by Morgan Stanley. Several, the, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, uh, which mm. manage bridges and tunnels, the airports, the harbor, uh, a major tenant, 9% of the space there. Several major insurance firms, Empire Blue Cross, Marsh and McLennan, and uh, among the banks, uh, Deutsche Bank, Bank of America, a uh, couple of big trading firms, Credit Suisse First Boston, and uh, Oppenheimer Funds, which uh, is a firm that uh, manages several mutual funds. So uh, lots, of, uh, lots of the big names on Wall Street were in those uh, Twin Towers. And in term, the markets were closed today. The markets were closed. Stock uh, markets. Stock markets uh, throughout the country. Uh, trading was halted in some of the foreign markets. The, the uh, foreign markets uh, reacted very negatively, obviously, to this news, down sharply. And no decision has been made yet as to whether they will be trading on the New York Stock Exchange tomorrow. They need to talk about, they need to make decisions in conjunction with federal, state, and local authorities about uh, the safety of trading, about whether the people who work at those exchanges are going to be able to get to work. Uh, and I talked to people who were at the New York Stock Exchange this morning, and, uh, you know, they felt the tremors there, and one described it as like an earthquake. And, and, and would you say that in your communications with people in the financial community today, they're afraid and afraid of what might happen next? This is obviously a great blow to confidence at a time when confidence is already very fragile. Uh, this was a direct attack on uh, on 
the symbols of, uh, the, you know, the center of finance in, in New York City, showing just how vulnerable it is. So I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's concern about uh, how the markets will react, whether anxiety will build. And there will definitely, there's a sense that we want to see a, a strong uh, showing of U.S. leadership in order to uh, give those markets some calm so when they do resume trading, um, it, it, may seem, it may seem like an oddball question, but what would be the impact on trading, as in numbers, up, down on the, on the Dow Jones Stock Exchange, of an incident like this? If the United States is seen to be weak or vulnerable or whatever. Well, as we've said many times before, I mean, markets hate uncertainty, and if the, if the markets are considering uh, the possibility of war, for example, I mean, that would be the sort of thing where you'd see a very uh, sharp negative reaction. So. Uh, there's, you know, there's an argument to me that, that uh, anxiety could build and trading would be very, uh, very negative when it opens. But it depends on what happens in the next couple of days. Betsy, thanks very much indeed. Betsy Stark giving us a sense, again, of the depth and the breadth of the ramifications, the impact of, of these attacks this morning on the Trade Towers and on the Pentagon. I think the addition of the attack on the Pentagon at the very heart of the American military establishment um, ups the ante in, in many, many ways. And w as we've said many times, we have no idea how many people have died or been injured. And we will do our best to get uh, some handle on that. But we all recognize that it will take time. And I think the mayor of New York uh, put, it, put, it, put it better than anybody else at the moment. I'm just looking for what he said in my notes when asked if he knew how many people, uh, what the casualties uh, were like. Um, and he said... more than anyone can bear more than anyone can bear and i think that's the clear casualty uh, the dead and the wounded people that we are going to uh, we're going to uh, we're going to have today but as betsy has just uh, made clear in terms of business and in human beings including i had no idea that morgan stanley had 50 stories of the world trade center um, these statistics you see that we put up on television from time to time are the just the sort of bare cold background uh, to life <coughs> and death stories which have taken place today. But the impact of this has gone so far beyond New York City. And, and just as you, as you look at, that's a live shot of New York City now, a live picture of, of what's happening down inside that dreadful little rectangle of violence which is hidden behind the glamour and success stories of the buildings to the right and to the left. Federal Avi Aviation Administration, as you know, we shot all airports nationwide the greyhound bus service canceled all of its or the greyhound bus company canceled all of its services in the northeast um amtrak the, the railroad uh temporarily suspended train service all along the northeast corridor between boston and washington and the u.s section of the st lawrence seaway which is between northern new york state for the most part <coughs> and ontario between the U.S. and the Canadian borders there has been closed. Uh, the tunnels between Detroit and Windsor on the Canadian side of the Detroit River closed to car traffic. Um, and security just went bang up several levels at all U.S.-Canadian border crossings in large measure because there has been a penetration across the U.S.-Canadian border before. Um, one of the ones they caught when an alert agent, as we've said several times today, picked up a guy on his way where he thought to bomb the Seattle Space Needle. Turned out he was really interested in setting off a bomb inside Los Angeles International Airport. The space shuttle operations were halted today. 12,000 employees of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida were actually sent home. And at the Naval Weapons Station in Goose Creek, South Carolina, workers were evacuated and sent there. Again, evacuations and people being sent home from the very heart uh, of the military establishment. Betsy Stark has just told us that all U.S. financial markets were closed. The United Nations building was evacuated here in New York City. Uh, General Motors General Motors in Detroit gave all 6,000 employees who work in the Renaissance Center, one of those centers built to try to rejuvenate downtown Detroit, were all told to go home today. And the Ford Motor Company closed its world headquarters in Dearborn in Michigan. The IRS in various places closed. The popular skyscrapers uh, were closed and or evacuated in, in, all, in, in, in cities uh, all across the country. I think you've probably already heard us say, if you've been with us for much today, that the New York primary election 
uh, was canceled here in New York and Governor Pataki said they'll simply reschedule it when they get another handle on normal life uh, in, in, in the days ahead and tourist attractions of a list of tourist attractions not spray farm in California the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles and the Library Tower in Los Angeles, the Liberty Bell Independence Hall, the Space Needle, Walt Disney World, they all closed down today. What, what better way, even though it's just a list of things, or it is a list of things, an understanding that both at home and overseas, embassies at overseas were evacuated, embassies were closed. Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, forbid civilian aircraft from flying around London. So these two attacks on the Trade Tower and the one in the Pentagon and the, and the possibility of, uh, of an attack on Camp David, we now believe, in the aircraft that crashed not far from Johnstown in Pennsylvania, all just had this extraordinary impact all over the world because people feared something else was going to happen and may still fear that something else is going to happen. Listen, just listen to some of what has happened today. I saw something hit the second tower, and when I saw that, it just went, everything rumbled, and I saw all this fire just shoot out in the sky, and stuff started just falling like, like it was raining, and I, I was by myself, and I just ran. I started seeing people um, just... We want to interrupt the ABC coverage to go live directly to Governor John Engler of Michigan to talk about Michigan security precautions. Here's the governor. ...responsible for this horrific crime. As proud Americans, we must not let the unspeakable terror of this day make us fearful or change our way of life. We have an indomitable spirit that will not be crushed by the cowardly acts of terrorists. America represents freedom for millions of oppressed people in the world. Today's tragedy will not diminish those ideals, and our response will show the world our resilience and resolve. In trying times, Americans come together with amazing courage and compassion, and it reminds us all that we are proud to be citizens of the greatest nation on earth. We'll take your, we got to take some questions uh, earlier today. Uh, Colonel Robinson, uh, Colonel Mike Robinson of the Michigan State Police, uh, held a briefing and we talked about uh, the status of things in Michigan. Uh, part of what I hope that we can do in talking with you today is to offer some reassurance and to uh, at least inform our citizens that uh, in Michigan uh, we've responded as we are trained and have drilled and prepared to do, but uh, clearly something of this magnitude that happened today in both New York and Washington is a, as I said, a horrific crime that uh, we've not seen the likes of and the, the loss of life and the damage and the injury to the American psyche is pretty profound today. Well, I think that uh, we have over the past year, interestingly enough, been involved through our Office of Emergency Planning in a number of exercises. Uh, we don't comment a lot on this, we don't advertise it, but uh, there has been an increased effort uh, nationally, and uh, Michigan's been very much part of that, and I'd like Colonel Robinson to comment perhaps from this perspective. He's just finished a term as uh, Chairman of the International uh, Chiefs of Police, and uh, this is, as I think we've said, and it was said during last year's election is the most probably urgent threat that the country actually faces. It's, it's, it's that random terrorist act that could come anytime, anywhere, and today we've seen it come with full fury. Uh, but um, there have been changes in procedures already. Um, we uh, we want to respond with the, the seriousness that I think this situation calls for. We also uh, want to respond in a way that I think reassures citizens that uh, that we we continue uh, tomorrow when we get up to you know have jobs to do and we're right now anything that we can do obviously to help either with New York New York City Washington D.C. officials we, we're happy to do and um, I would say for people who are interested in helping we've had some calls from people so what can we do um, the best advice is to 
call the Red Cross to work with the traditional agencies that are called upon in the time of a disaster and let them direct you. We aren't scheduling or don't have that ability um, to, to assist people who want to go there. And in particular, there's a very uh, specific set of skills that are looked for right now and uh, uh, medical personnel and uh, we're going to have some challenges. But uh, if individuals in the state say, I want to help, what can I do? Then I'd say, talk to the Red Cross officials. Don't don't call the emergency management office. That isn't where the information would be in terms of the citizen becoming involved. And let me have Colonel Robinson just comment on this, uh, just the broader threat of, of, of terrorism and what, um, uh, this is not something that just Michigan's been thinking about. The, truly, the national government's been thinking about it. But uh, I guess, uh, uh, and maybe even this scenario has been foreseen, but uh, pretty hard to deal with this today. And. Uh, reminds me of a, a Tom Clancy book that I read some years back. Uh, it, it's a pretty scary scenario. Thank you, Governor. Michigan is a little bit uh, unique because the emergency management function uh, for the state uh, resides uh, within the Department of State Police. That's the same way in some some states uh, across the country, but not not all. So I think that that, uh, from that standpoint, is good for the state of Michigan because it's easier for us to marshal the resources of law enforcement and public safety, I believe, in situations such as this. The governor indicated that uh, we have been uh, training for th this unfortunate sort of a situation for uh, at least recent years. We've added that to our emergency management training uh, continuum, if you will. We've trained for years uh, for what to do in case of a flood or uh, uh, other weather disaster, tornado, and, and so forth. But we've added such terrorist activities such as this or biological or chemical or, or uh, nuclear attack on the United States or in the, in the state of Michigan. There's absolutely nothing to suggest, as I indicated at the earlier briefing, that there is any location in the state of Michigan that is in imminent danger or a a designated uh, target of uh, terrorists at uh, this time, so we are urging calm. But the whole issue, of the broad, uh, or the broader issue of terrorism and that potential, has become uh, more clear to all of us who are engaged in public safety over the past uh, several years, with the incidents that it happened uh, at the World Trade Center previously, and with uh, the Murrah Building in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, I was at the EOC uh, this morning after talking with the governor when we put that mechanism into motion. I was very pleased with the reaction of all departments and state government who were there and how quickly uh, they assembled their team and uh, were uh, in place and prepared should something uh, happen here in the state. Any questions? No, I've not tried to place those calls today, I, it, you know, they're just undoubtedly overwhelmed, and so, no, I've not. None have been requested at this point. We've sort of done a little bit of an inventory just internally to see what might be available. We've talked to General Stump, for example. We do have guardsmen who are trained medical officers that, you know, possibly could be helpful, and, and I think, uh, you know, that that offer will probably be extended. Uh, General Sum's thought was that uh, normally what people do in these situations, they go to the adjacent states first, and, uh, but, but we have participated in actions in other states, uh, not for this purpose, but, uh, but clearly that's something we, we might be able to do that would be of assistance. Uh, uh, there's just a, you know, the, the challenge in New York has got to be overwhelming, and I've been impressed with the way in which, I mean, from afar, and, and it's very hard to say, but certainly the courage of the public officials, the, 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 the police officers and the firefighters, they were in these damaged buildings, and uh, I'm sure what are going to prove when we learn of them later, just heroic rescues that did take place, um, that, that, that hardly compensates uh, you know, for the tragic loss of life, which I suspect will be over rather overwhelming. I think so. Uh, I talked to the mayor about that, and um, and I, I think there was, you know, I think that's that was appropriate. I mean, uh, again, we 
we we've talked i talked to the lieutenant governor i talked to the attorney general i've talked to uh you know our key people in state government i mean there's we're not facing any uh imminent threat here we have nothing that we are aware of that has been identified as a target but uh clearly when you see something like this unfold uh precaution is, is the best uh, uh Interestingly enough, Attorney General Ashcroft would have been in Lansing almost well, about an hour from now. Um, of course, that you know that was canceled, and um, I, I had plans to tomorrow to leave, but uh, I've canceled those. So I think for now, uh, you know, people are going to just make sure that everything is checked and double checked, and uh, that we're operating according to the protocols that we've established. I think so. I mean, you know, we're not, uh, we're Americans. We're not going to be intimidated. Uh, we're also going to be cautious, though. And, and I would say, uh, just as the federal government, I, at least I've seen one announcement. I, I don't know that this is an official announcement. I think it's a speculation about the FAA uh, certainly keeping airports closed at least until noon tomorrow. Um, I mean, they're being prudent. And, and what does that mean i think it just means what it implies i mean you you check and you double check and you try to make sure i mean one thing that we're going to have to be looking at and you can bet some people uh who've got responsibility have got to be tonight in uh some exhaustive meetings how did it happen that on a single day airline security is breached in such a way that four planes were hijacked at least four uh, that we know of so that's a, that's a serious issue and what what broke down uh in in you know, in the airport security that allowed that to happen. I mean, there'll be those kinds of questions. I mean, but, uh, you know, well, well, everybody, it's all hands on deck in terms of the, the rescue operations and the recovery operations that are, that are going on. Uh, others are going to be planning and thinking these kinds of things through. What top numbers of the administration are traveling? Obviously, <laughs> He's in Africa, where he's been on a, as part of a relief mission. Um, most are nearby. Doug Rothwell is on uh, his way back from Philadelphia. Uh, obviously, there are no planes today, so he's traveling by car. Uh, we have uh, we have a few people that are on the road, but not. Uh, I would say, generally speaking, people are here. Uh, actually, it was a function with the Republican Governors Association. Governor, do you feel um, the Michigan residents in any way are being priced out at the pump after gas went up 30 cents today? I'm glad you asked that question. Actually, that's a good question. There's no reason for gas to have gone up 30 cents at the pump. Uh, and, and I would hope that people would uh, calm down and, and act responsibly on that uh, front because uh, there's a uh, there may be some confusion, and I, again, I haven't, I haven't been watching television all day, and I haven't watched all of the different channels. In the in the World Trade Center is located the actual uh, trading center for uh, futures and products like gasoline, or they're they're doing some of the or the actual supply exchange operations, and so that that well could. I mean, maybe it was that report that caused. Uh, uh, I guess a panic would be the best way to say it. I mean, you don't raise prices that fast in that short a period of time without somebody sort of being panicked and spooked about it. But uh, in reality, uh, you know, the petroleum supply uh, has been increasing. Uh, prices have been coming down, and that should continue. There's no disruption in the supply chain. There may be some disruptions in sort of the, the mechanisms of, of how we trade and ship product but, but I think that I think there'll be backup systems put in place I would presume on that. We had some reports of some long uh, lines at gas stations especially in the Detroit uh, area and we did check on that through the emergency operations center to determine whether or not there was any expectation of a of a stoppage or a slowdown in, in gas supply and there's not so there's absolutely no reason for this to occur other than uh, individuals a panic or sense of urgency that a situation like this brings. Specifically, what type of short-term uh, security measures additional are you taking here in Michigan, and how long do you expect those to be in place? Well, I, I think you 
know, without getting very specific, I mean, the, we have a, an operations center that Colonel mentioned he was there this morning. When we, when something arises, and, you know, in the past it's been generally of natural disaster type uh, or of imminent threat, or I guess when Y2K was, uh, when we reached that uh, climactic night, New Year's Eve, we had everybody in. But uh, people like Susan Schaefer, who's my press spokesperson, and uh, uh, our legal staff uh, will join with the, uh, the state police and other designated individuals from other departments at a at a predetermined site at our where we run our emergency operations from, and uh, then they have uh, they function as a team at that point, and uh, and they began to go through different kinds of checklists and operational assignments and. Uh, determining the status of things. I, I'll, I don't know how much more we want to need to go more than that. But. As a border state, are there other things we have to develop? address that. That's a well, we have done so, some things uh, along the border. Uh, we uh, we did some things at the Mackinac Bridge. You know, we looked at those, those locations, which may be a, a, a potential target, I suppose, but uh, wanted to assure safety of those. So, We've uh, worked with the with the Bridge Authority at Mackinac Bridge. We've also worked uh, at the Blue Water Bridge to assist authorities uh, there, uh, as well as Metro Airport specifically because of uh, uh, shutting down air travel. So uh, through the Emergency Operations Center function, we coordinate all of that activity and direct state resources, whether it's state police resources, Department of Transportation, or military affairs, to those functions into those areas where there is uh, a need. So that's how we monitor and deal with that. Uh, we just uh, 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 placed a couple of troopers there, just a, a greater uh, presence and, and visibility. We did some of that here in the Lansing uh, area as well and, and beefed up some of that uh, security to assure uh, state employees that uh, they were not at risk. Is that pretty much Well, there, we are in constant contact with federal authorities as well, so we're assessing uh, on a constant basis uh, threats or uh, reports that we receive. Uh, so we're trying to stay uh, a step uh, ahead, uh, if you will, and also be prepared if something should happen. Uh, no, we don't have a list that uh, that we're able to share. The only the, the, we we assist uh, we're, we're assisting others in that capacity who've made a determination or have asked for uh, assistance. Well, in the police community, I think that uh, the consensus is that it's extremely difficult, but yet we do a tremendous, uh, a tremendous job. Uh, there have been uh, a number of incidents where uh, terrorists have been uh, apprehended entering uh, the country and uh, uh, serious potential disasters have been averted. So. I wouldn't want to suggest that the, the country as a whole is, is helpless in this regard. I think we've done a, done a great deal in that regard. It's something that I, th I think requires a great deal more, more focus, and I know it's something uh, that I've heard uh, you know, the President and the Attorney General specifically speak to. How long can we expect uh, increased security in state buildings and the capitalism? As long as we perceive there's a threat. Governor John Engler and Colonel Mike Robinson from the Michigan State Police discussing the security measures in the state of Michigan, that uh, some state buildings have been tightened up significantly, that security was increased on the Mackinac Bridge. They also reported there's been some panic buying of gas. They say there's no need for that. What you're watching there on the right side of your screen is new barricades being put up in front of the McNamara Federal Building in downtown Detroit. Uh, there were some barricades put up after the uh, attack on the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City in 1995. But these are new barricades being put up to divert traffic on Michigan Avenue away from uh, the McNamara Building. 
Uh, those orange barricades going up this afternoon and federal workers, as you can see, going home. Some of the 300,000-plus federal workers that were sent home early from their jobs today, both in Washington, D.C., and here in Detroit. Uh, also, uh, Governor Engler uh, offering the Michigan National Guard, at least plans to offer the Guard to uh, the state of New York to help in search and rescue efforts uh, down at the World Trade Center, what once was the World Trade Center. He did not expect that they would be called necessarily because the uh, surrounding states would perhaps offer uh, support first. Also, Secretary of State Candace Miller, if you have not heard, uh, a defiant Secretary of State Candace Miller saying that uh, democracy will continue in spite of this attack on American shores today. She says American freedom went through revolution against tyr tyranny, defended and continued through the Civil War and World Wars, will not be stopped by acts of terrorists. Well, let's return now to John McQuethy, who's reporting on ABC. Roofs and along various pipes, uh, so they're having a real difficulty getting in there even to search for bodies at this early time. That is what they are focused on at this point. I will tell you, Peter, that Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, and most of the chiefs uh, have been in the National Military Command Center all day uh, since this terrorist strike. Uh, and you have to leave it up to your own imagination, the kinds of things that they are contemplating uh, in their hours uh, after the strike. Okay, John, thank you very much indeed. John McCrethy, who's been at the Pentagon all day and was in the other side of the Pentagon <coughs> when this aircraft was crashed into the Pentagon today. We now know with all of the passengers on board, at least in this one phone call, herded to the back of the plane, uh, who went from being passengers to hostages in, in, in a matter of, of seconds and minutes. Um, and John, who was working on we the other side... I want to quickly take you to CNN, where they have obtained some amateur video of the aftermath of the attack of the World Trade Center. They told me just to wait here. because the more buildings have come down, then we're not going to help anybody. All right. I think we should... Yeah. Where's the incident come out? That's just... Oxygen. We yeah, okay. Let's just wait right here. <laughs> Let's just station up right here, okay? All right, Doc. Why don't we set up? Can you hang on these from this pole here? Okay. Okay. George, you go up there, buddy. Yeah. We just heard another explosion. They're handing out gloves and masks. The consensus is, it's too unsafe to go in there. Just going to wait here until they bring some people out. I hooked up with some firemen with some first aid stuff. You know what? Anything? Why don't we just set this up as a little mobile hospital unit right here, okay? Any suggestions? Should we set up here for medical work? Uh, Think this is safe enough here? Those pictures shot by Dr. Mark Heath. We don't know much about Dr. Heath, but we 
I think, can fairly say that he had extraordinary presence of mind uh, as he continued not only shooting those pictures but also offering assistance where he could. At one point, he uh, hid behind a car, tried to get into the car to protect himself from both the debris and the smoke that was building around him. Uh, the car was locked. He tried to break in, couldn't, and then hid his face in a medical bag, his medical bag. Uh, all the while, he kept shooting. A, a, a couple of things that you might have wondered about, uh, a couple of sounds. There was a chirping sound that you heard at various points in the tape. That is the sound of the uh, locator devices that fire men and women wear so that if they are lost in a fire, uh, their colleagues, their brother fire, brother and sister firefighters can get to them. And there was also a kind, what sounded to us at least, like a kind of whistling sound. That's the sound of respirators uh, that the firemen, the emergency service personnel and the rest uh, were using and offering to people who needed it. Um, our colleagues at CNN FN have, are reporting now that the stock exchanges, the uh, NASDAQ, the American Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, all of course closed today, will remain closed through Wednesday. So the stock markets, the financial markets in the country, and yet again, uh, we cannot recall anything like that ever occurring. Uh, perhaps it has, and we don't remember it, but we don't remember it. Uh, the stock markets, all of them, stay closed through Wednesday. Air travel shut down in the United States uh, until at least noon tomorrow, and certainly no guarantee it'll open after that. That affects, on an average, about a million and a half people every single day, 40 to 50,000 flights, all of them grounded. There were about 50, 50 not 50,000, there were about 50 planes in the air after uh, the FAA essentially locked down airports in the country. All of those planes uh, made it safely to destinations. Uh, we don't know they made it to the destinations they were headed for. Let's go back to Peter Jennings and ABC in New safely. York. Emmys? Uh, which were going to be held in Los Angeles, the Latin Grammys, which rescheduled uh, uh, their award ceremonies uh, for tomorrow night, I think the Latin Grammys, uh, have now canceled or postponed their particular celebrations. We told you earlier or about some of the other examples, but uh, aside from looking at that list on the screen itself, think of this, aside from the work stoppages, this is the first time this is the first time since D-Day in 1944 that organized baseball has wiped out a whole day of regular season play. First time since D-Day in, in 1944, the landing of the Allied forces on the beaches at Normandy, which led ultimately to the liberation of Europe um, from the Germans. It's the first time since 1944 that organized baseball has done that. And there were couple, all of the television shows in New York City, which <coughs> the David Letterman show the, and, and others on CBS, which all get um, television audiences, popular audiences coming from around the country. They've all canceled their, if their tapings. They'll be out there in reruns uh, tonight. This is true of the late night show on, on NBC. Um, malls across the country, malls across, you, you, some of you who live out around about the country, you all know this better than we do, but malls around the country uh, simply locked their doors and people couldn't go and shop in the malls today. It was this feeling that anywhere there were people gathered, uh, that there was a measure of vulnerability which we had seen uh, in New York City. <clears throat> now the mayor of New York City, Rudolph Giuliani, says at the moment, that at least 2,100 people have been injured and 600 of them taken to hospitals and that there are 1,500 walking wounded who have been taken to uh, Liberty State Park, which is on the other side of the New York Harbor there, uh, where the Hudson River meets the harbor. It may be live, but I'm not quite sure what you're looking at. Is this from the New Jersey side? This is from Liberty State Park, uh, looking I assume across the New York Harbor. Uh, we want to take you back to CNN point. and eyewitness accounts, people who lived through this nightmare. I looked up, and what I saw was I saw red, and I saw actually started to, saw debris to start to fall down. I was so close to the building that I couldn't run away from the building, so I actually had to run towards it. And if you know, the World Financial Center has got a, a rib design, so you actually have a two-by-two two space where you can actually sneak into the building and hide. Myself and one other man were there. We had our book bags over our heads. Debris was falling down about the size of this. All portions of the building were falling down. That went on for about 30 or 40 
seconds, and that for me was the worst part of the, this whole experience for me because I feared for my life, my own life at that time. But after that stopped, I walked out myself. I didn't see anybody in the plaza, so nobody was hurt was in the plaza at that point. I walked to my building in the World Financial Center. I'd seen that my colleagues would evacuate the building were downstairs. Now, on the west side of the World Financial Center, which is right on the Hudson River, there's an outdoor plaza, okay? You can look over the World Financial Center and see the, the, World, Finan the World Trade Center. We were looking back at the building in flames. This is about, this is probably five after nine, 10 after nine, and we see a second commercial jet flying extremely low actually collide into the south tower of the building. Um, at that point, we decided just to get out of there. And people were just going crazy at that point, evacuating. Um, we started to walk north and ultimately got up to here. During our walk, we saw the, um, the, the south tower collapse to the ground, decimated, and then later, it was very amazing to see the north tower standing there by itself after years and years and years of seeing them together. And then all of a sudden, the north tower just collapsed upon itself and just fell to the ground. It was a cloud of dust that covered all of um, downtown Manhattan, Battery Park and everything. It's phenomenal. I've never seen anything like it. The eyewitness description of the horrible scene in New York City this morning. And in the midst of all of that, in the midst of that terrible tragedy, there was further... Chaos. There are other buildings at risk here around the World Trade Center. Let's go back to ABC for more on that. Folks did. Did you think at the moment that it was a terrorist attack? Did you think it was I an had, accident? Did you have the biggest I, idea? I had hmm. some idea there was a bombing. <laughs> Having been in the uh, 93 uh, incident, that kind of explosion just doesn't happen normally. I didn't know what it was, um, but uh, when I heard there was a plane that hit, I thought that made some sense. And, and I thought that it was very unlikely that, a, that any kind of plane would hit the Trade Center uh, accidentally, mm. you know, on a clear day. So, uh, was there, uh, how, uh, how immediate, how deep was the concern in your colleagues and, and out on the common halls? It, was there panic at all? No, that's the, the one thing what, what, what I found is, is that no panic. Uh, people are concerned. People are a little apprehensive uh, and they want to know what to do. Um, but uh, both on the floor and then uh, down the stairwell, there was no panic. And in fact, people were helping other people uh, to an mm. incredible degree. Were the stairwells lighted? Yes, this time they were. Last time they weren't. Th this time the stairwells were lighted. There was some smoke, but that was, uh, it wasn't nearly as bad. Was there emergency lighting? Uh, yeah, there was. Um, there was no other, you know, there was no fire or police personnel. Uh, at that point, you're on your own. Now, you came and down from the 57th floor. Were yes. other people coming down from the floors above yeah, you and below you? they were coming down uh, <laughs> from the floors above. There were some injured people that came down, apparently, from, you know, floors where this had happened. And so uh, we saw them as well. And how long did it take you to get out of the building? You know, I, I estimate it took me 45 minutes uh, or more to get out of the building. And, and in the time that you were coming down, there was another aircraft hit the southern. Yeah, tower. I was on the 44th floor trying to get down, and, and we heard another you know, explosion. We didn't know what it was. We again saw flaming debris, and uh, uh, I now know that that's, you know, that was the second aircraft that hit. You, I think you maybe know where I'm going. You were on the you were on the 90th floor. It took you 45 minutes. 57. 57 floor. floor. There were people coming down from floors above you. Right. Is it your sense that in at least your tower, before the tower collapsed, everybody or a large number of percentage of people managed to be evacuated? I, th I think a lot of people got out. First of all, it was uh, 8:45 in the morning, so that's relatively early by New York standards. Right. Uh, and then secondly, the the first uh, plane that hit. Uh, there seemed to, there was time to get out. I think even having said that, there were a lot of people still in that building, including the fire and police personnel that were trying to come up. So, but, but my sense is that uh, I know on our floor, a lot of people got out. And as you came down, were you joined by people on other floors? Is it a common yeah. evacuation yeah. passage it's, down it, through the Well, building? the problem was there was only one stairwell open. Uh, the, other, the other stairwells were blocked by smoke. And so you had one narrow stairwell, which is what led to the delay in the evacuation. And that's, you know, that's why it took so long to get out. We've told people in the rest of the country, uh, fairly regularly, the 50,000 people who work in the two trade centers. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. say 8.45 in the morning is a little late for New York City. Is, do you, well, do you it's have a little any, early. Uh, sorry, a little early. Yeah. Uh, do, you have, do you have a feeling that a lot of people hadn't gone into the building at this point? Uh, I know in our offices, uh, you know, we're a law firm. We start at 9.30, and, and a lot of people were not there yet. Uh, some of the businesses which operate on an earlier schedule, I'm sure everybody was there. Right. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the, the building wasn't as full as it could have been. If, if it had been uh, two hours later, yeah. uh, it would have been much worse. And did, did you notice uh, today as you went to work or as you came out that it was more sparsely populated 
Uh, it, it was about the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, uh, it was about a normal day. I must confess I'm funny. amazed at how calm you are, having been through not only the 1993 bombing, but this, and walked down by yourself, and you seem perfectly calm. Well, I'm happy to be here. Right. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and, 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 and how did people behave as you were evacuating? People, I mean, that, that was, it, it, I saw it again eight years ago, and I saw it today. People were incredibly calm, and they were helping other people. I fear that some of the people that were helping other people didn't make it out of that building uh, because, you know, they stayed behind, and uh, fire personnel. Uh, so, but, but people, there was no panic that I saw, and in that environment, you have a narrow stairwell, a lot of people, you don't know what's going on. It's, it's a recipe for disaster, and the people are, are very, very calm. Could you tell at all from your perspective on the 57th floor that when the aircraft hits, which we think is about the 90th mm -hmm. floor, at right. least in the very top part of the right. building, how many floors were actually damaged at the time, or did people talk at all about the degree of damage that had been done just by the plane hitting before the building collapsed? It was a little hard to tell. You, you had some people coming down from the higher floors. Um, but you people know. were able to get from the higher floors down through yeah. the damaged part of the yeah. building? Well, uh, that I don't know. Yeah, okay. My sense is that they came down from floors under 90 and were able to get down above 90. I don't know. Okay. Um, I know that in Tower 2, I talked to someone from Tower 2, and they were able to get down from uh, around the 88th floor. Uh, they were evacuating. When our tower was hit, they were evacuating, and then their tower was hit. Uh, and even so, they were able to get down because they were on the right side of the building. Right. So, and, and were you there when first Tower 2 and then Tower 1 collapsed? Uh, well, I, was, I just had exited the building, and I was out on Church Street. And uh, tower, uh, the way I saw it, tower two came in. The south tower came the down south. first, and uh, I, I did. I did see that, yeah. And and then I assume you ran. I ran like hell. Yeah, we've seen we've seen the video of people yeah. just running like yeah. hell in in every direction to get as far yeah. away as possible. And I think the tragedy is that the, the the police and fire personnel that were trying to help people out of that building were other. right at ground zero when that happened. So you have to give them a lot of credit. And somebody said. We've said several times today when the, when the folks are running one way, the police and the yeah. fire department are running and are running the other way, trying, absolutely true. trying to help. Anything uh, anything else aside from your survival, which strikes you with this several hours after we went through this horrible experience? Well, I mean, you know, it, I think everybody in this country believes we've got to find the people that did it, and we've got to deal with them. And you know, there is. Uh, I felt this way in 1993, and I think there is no stronger emotion. Uh, and, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, this cannot happen in this country. Many thanks, Tom. Really appreciate you helping us to understand this. Tom Humphreys, who works in a law firm in the Trade Tower. He was in the, in the North Tower on the 57th floor, and he walked out, and you've heard his story. And ABC's Charlie Gibson uh, has been trying to get a handle on some of the other stories which are similar. Charlie? Well, Peter, we've been trying to keep track of the injury situation as it exists. Uh, obviously, the numbers of those who have died today, it's going to be some time before we have any estimates. And properly, people in New York and in Washington around the Pentagon are not commenting. They shouldn't because we don't have any concept. But as you reported a few moments ago, Mayor Giuliani uh, did talk about the numbers of injured saying at least, and these are very rough numbers, at least 2,100 people injured, 600 taken to hospitals, 1,500 walking wounded, he said, many of whom have been evacuated to New Jersey's Liberty State Park right across uh, the river, the Hudson River, from where the World Trade Centers were. And we have some further reports. Uh, ABC's Cynthia McFadden, who has been down in that area all day long, says that a triage center has been set up on the Chelsea Piers in New York City. Now, the Chelsea Piers is not a hospital area at all. It's an area of, that used to be uh, shipping piers along the Hudson River on Lower Manhattan and uh, is now used for recreational purposes. There are tennis courts and golf driving ranges and uh, other things there, uh, meeting rooms, that kind of thing. It's a commercial operation, but uh, a triage center has been set up there and 50 makeshift operating rooms are being prepped and hundreds of ambulances are there waiting to take injured away from that facility but they are doing treatment of people right uh, on the site or nearby uh, at Chelsea Piers. Reports from some of the hospitals uh, that are taking the injured. St. Vincent's Hospital here in New York uh, the numbers again very rough but an estimate of over 200 that have been taken in there three dead 18 in critical condition and the most chilling quote 
that you can hear a Dr. Stephen Stern there at St. Vincent's Hospital quoted as saying hundreds of people, hundreds of people coming in have been burned from head to toe. Bellevue Hospital reporting more than 100 patients brought in, two dead. Uh, Beth Israel reporting earlier that 70 patients had been brought in. There are some um, estimates from hospitals in Virginia near the Pentagon uh, of dozens of people having been brought in there. And the, I guess the heartening note in all this, uh, hospitals around New York who, that are not in the immediate vicinity of the World Trade Centers, um, people saying hundreds of donors are reportedly lined up to give blood outside Beth Israel Medical Center and some others uh, here in New York City. Um, and, and what I guess is a precursor of what is going to be the kinds of terrible news that we're going to get over the next few days, a spokesman at the medical examiner's office in New York City, the coroner's office, says that for now all of the bodies uh, that are being brought in dead bodies will go to the medical examiner's office on First Avenue here in New York. They say they have room for several hundred bodies and they are making room for more space since they anticipate more bodies will be brought in. Uh, one other note to mention, uh, at 4.30 this afternoon Eastern Time, the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, says that it has activated all ten of FEMA's regional headquarters around the country. Uh, including those on the East Coast and then all the way west uh, as far as San Francisco and the state of Washington. They have activated all of those uh, regional headquarters, activated the federal response plan, which uh, FEMA says brings together 28 federal agencies and the American Red Cross, and 12 urban search and rescue teams are being dispatched. Eight of them are being sent here to New York and four to Washington, all deployed. Uh, to search for victims of what has happened today. And the Health and Human Services Department uh, has activated a national medical emergency system. It's really an unprecedented move, uh, but it could dispatch nearly 7,000 volunteer doctors, nurses, pharmacists, other medical staff to areas that have been affected by today's attacks. So that brings you up somewhat to date on uh, what's being done in terms of those who have been injured and provisions now being made for those who've been killed today. Peter? Thank you, Charlie, very much. Uh, uh, just to uh, uh, try to keep the sort of sense or the proportion of casualties into some kind of, uh, in some kind of perspective, uh, the gentleman with whom we've just been talking who worked in a law firm in the Northern Tower uh, said that after the first aircraft uh, hit in, in, in that tower, uh, which is 8.48 Eastern Time, this is one of those where were you when moments, I'm just utterly convinced will be that way in, in, term, in historical terms, where were you when the first aircraft and then the second aircraft uh, crashed or were crashed into the Twin Trade Towers in New York City on this day, uh, the 11th of the month, and there's a timeline, if it's eight hours now since, uh, since this happened, and where Mayor Giuliani speaks just a few minutes ago, um, they know of 2,100 people injured, and you see the pictures that the young man brought us from, from the absolute bottom, ground zero location, uh, where, the, where the tower not only crashed on itself, but then crashed down into the ground. There wasn't a sound there, except the sound of flames licking up from underground, and there was no sign of any person. And, and, and we know, because we've said it many times, that, that the fire department and the police department were going inwards, not outwards, when all of this happened. It's just absolutely impossible to get a grasp on. I'm very interested in, in, in the gentleman we spoke to a little while ago from the law firm, Tom. Forgotten, I've probably forgotten his last name. Say it out loud. Thank you, Tom Humphreys. Tom Humphreys, who said that it was his impression, at least in his building, in, in the North Tower, that a lot of people got out of that or had not arrived at work because it was, as he said, by New York standards, just a little earlier than people were accustomed. But, but when this young man, Mr. Sabi, uh, brought his, his video that he'd taken, he's on his, just got on his motorbike up and then walked in uh, to, to this scene on the ground, it is to realize that everybody's being kept, as Bill Latemore subsequently confirmed for us, being kept at a distance from this at the side. And that's what's left on the left of the facade of the North Tower. ABC's Bob Jamison is downtown now. And Bob, we're looking at the pictures that have been brought to us by this young producer of a magazine. Can you just talk in general terms as you like? Well, generally speaking, Peter, uh, as the smoke uh, blows back and forth and uh, for a moment or two doesn't obscure 
both of the two World Trade Center buildings, you see so little. It's a, it's a tremendously eerie feeling to be in Lower Manhattan, looking down toward the tip of the island and seeing very few people, no traffic, uh, the smoke continuing to billow from these buildings and nothing where there were once these two landmarks that drew everyone's attention, whether you drove or flew or came to New York by boat. Uh, but, Peter, there is a new concern, according to authorities, at this moment here in Lower Manhattan, and that is the growing fear that another building in the World Trade Center complex, which was not struck by an airplane, is in danger of collapsing. That is number seven World Trade Center, somewhat shorter, somewhat uh, with somewhat fewer stories than uh, numbers one and two. There is a fire burning vigorously in the lower floors of that building, threatening the foundation. And the building was already damaged some six hours ago now uh, when the North Tower collapsed and part of that process of the building collapsing struck and damaged number seven world trade center so it's already was already at some risk before this fire grew as vigorously as it has uh, the authorities have now moved people several blocks away from that building and we're just watching and waiting to see what happens bob is number seven world trade center and i see you've now managed to come down to to, to the ground which suggests things loosen up a little bit um, is that where the mayor's emergency headquarters are? Peter, I don't, I, I honestly don't know, but I will tell you that number seven is just behind number two. Uh, I'm in Tribeca now, and uh, you're seeing mostly smoke from the remnants of number one and number two, but there somewhere in that smoke is number seven. I don't know how big uh, number seven, the World Trade Center is, is it, I, but uh, my recollection is it's a fairly low building, isn't it? Or is y yes, I, I would guess, and I'm sorry to have to make a guess, that it is only about half as tall as number two. Okay. That, uh, that okay. seems to me what, uh, we'll what it appeared to be. We'll find out soon enough. I appreciate it, Bob. Thanks very much, Bob Jamison, who, as this day unveils, manages to get closer and closer. In a minute, we're going to talk to uh, to a freelance photographer who got really close today, but he's making a phone call at the moment. Take your time, Evan, and we'll come back to you. I can see where you've been just by the state of your equipment at this moment. Uh, but uh, as it has been about eight hours now, let us try to, to bring you up today with the horrendous sights and sounds of this attack on the United States and its citizens today. Here's ABC's John Donvan. We want to tell you what we know as we know it. Well, we just got a report in that there's been some sort of explosion at the first the thing World any Trade television Center camera saw this morning was this just before what nine o'clock, roughly 15 minutes earlier, an American Airlines jet hijacked from Boston had crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. There were 92 people on board. It does not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my God. Oh my God. That looks like a second plane. As just I did not see a plane go in. That, that Minutes later, the second plane, plane, the second tower. The, side. the fireball the ate up the aircraft. The it was a United Airlines flight, a 767 from Boston right to Los Angeles. Screen. There had been 65 so people on board. Like some sort of a concerted... I was happened to look on the first tower, and I actually saw people waving where the first plane crashed through, and then <laughs> it was unbelievable seeing this second jet come crashing into the second tower. What is going on? <laughs> New York City was staggered. As soon as he got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky to get out. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. And still it wasn't over. This was the southern tower falling in on itself. It was now roughly an hour since the first attack. Meanwhile, it was beginning here in Washington. Another hijacked plane hits the Pentagon. U.S. officials are saying there was no warning, no indicators of any kind of a likely terrorist attack. Uh, number two, they say Pentagon officials uh, within the intelligence and the counterterrorism offices are now looking at this very intensely. ABC reporters across the city are beginning to hear the word terrorism. Uh, it seems obvious unofficially to people here that it was a terrorist attack, uh, but they obviously can't reach any firm conclusions at this point. So the Pentagon is engaged, and I'm sure law enforcement is, uh, but they, they say they had no warnings. Report piles on report. 
Okay, there's been an explosion of some kind uh, that shook the ground of the Capitol. Uh, we all heard it. Everybody ran for cover. We don't know where it was. We don't see the smoke yet. Everybody's saying get back. We're running. We're running. We're running. We're running. They're screaming at us to get back. On television, it looked like it was happening all over. 10.28 a.m., New York City, and in the shadow of the one remaining tower, a snatch of conversation between a reporter and a rescuer. Why are they pulling us out of here? Because the North Tower is leaning. The North Tower? The North Tower is leaning. Right, come on, quick. Oh my God, there it goes! I looked up as soon as we got across the street. I looked up. I saw the building start, the tower start to oh, buckle. Yeah, I just tur turned and ran, ducked down, put a jacket over my head. Three or four of us huddled together, and uh, it was just black everywhere. Washington, the White House, is evacuated. The Office of Personnel Management says all federal office buildings in the Washington area have been evacuated and closed. The employees sent home immediately. The evacuation order creates instant gridlock in downtown Washington. The president was not in the city. He was in Florida visiting a school. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Officials at this end are not confirming that the president's the plane is going to, to Andrews. We don't know if it's going to Andrews or some other location. All I've said is that he will convene a National Security Council meeting, and we don't know where that will take place either. Obviously, they want to keep a lot of people guessing as, as to the president's whereabouts. And the plane, a jet. Now it was lunchtime, and yet more terrible news is coming in. Another United Airliner with 45 people on board has crashed south of Pittsburgh, presumably another victim of terrorism. We talked to a couple of people who actually witnessed the plane going down and said it was quite devastating, went right down into the woods. They saw all sorts of debris flying out into the woods and into the trees, and it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a devastating scene from what we're told. At this point, it is hard to believe we're still in the same day that began with this picture. National Guard units are out. Washington is shut down. Airports in the U.S. and Canada are closed. And the death toll, still uncountable, is also unimaginable. John Donvan, ABC News, Washington. Excellent report from John Donvan pulling together uh, this day, which has so much immediacy, so much history, such magnitude to it, and touches every American. And as I turn around on occasion to look at the, the computer screen behind me, I find emails coming in from people in other countries, um, uh, Canada and Europe I included, uh, from friends and from families and colleagues, all expressing this, this deep empathy and sympathy for people here today uh, who had friends and acquaintances, but just seeming at, at whatever distance to appreciate uh, what is happening, even though they were not close to it. Um, we're now joined by a young man who was very close to it again. This is Evan Fairbanks. He's a freelance photographer. Uh, interestingly enough, you and I were just talking about journalists' emotions uh, uh, at a time like this, and the last thing journalists can afford to do is to fall prey to their emotions at a time like this because it's too hard in the middle of a story. But you were very close this morning and photographing on assignment for a church when things began to happen. So we're going to show your videotape, if we may, though. You're, are you principally a still photographer? Uh, both? Still and video. Okay. Can we just look at what your first video is and explain it to us? Um, I walked out of Trinity Church after we had a, a, a blackout in our studio, and one of the studio managers grabbed one of our cameras when we knew what was happening, and I went out and was shooting Aftermath. Good God. And I suddenly saw a plane flying into my viewfinder and said, gee, it's kind of close. For that to be here now and then realize what happened yeah. and uh we'll run this again because i think this is the this is can we run that again roger goodman that's roger goodman our director because this is we've seen footage before of people on the run and i understand that that's your shadow as you went by a store yeah, actually right? it was it's the first time i've seen that it's and it was there absolute panic immediately could instantly it was just pandemonium um nobody knew what to do 
uh, there was no clear thinking. People were just reacting to kind of save themselves and, and the people around them. And this is such when you're in the same location when the building comes down. I, I had been taken downstairs by Port Authority police who knew that I had this videotape. And we were moving actually to go back to the Trinity Church to make them a dub of the tape in a format that they could use on a VHS tape. And uh, suddenly I heard one of the guys say, hey, Evan, watch out. Hang on just a second. If you look in the upper, look, in, this now is frozen. And this is, I, this is an angle of this attack that we have not seen before. At the top of the building on your left, out of the left, become the building. And watch how the aircraft penetrates the building. Go ahead. Completely in one side and out the other. It just or disappeared. It disappeared nose. like like a bad special effect. It disappeared right into the building. I've seen it six, seven times now. It's still uncomprehensible what is actually happening there. You're right. As a journalist, you you, you know you you have to take yourself away from it, and I'm I'm still not there yet. And the more and more I see it, and as time Here goes it by. The modern technology enables us to see horror just as we are able to see sport in a variety of different speeds or at a variety of different speeds. And I think you now have a, a better appreciation than we have had up until now, for which we thank you, Evan, because we see this, we see exactly how determined somebody was to do this horrible damage, taking a plane so powerfully and so fast in one side of the building. Other. Tell, tell me more what it's, what it's been like for you today as a working the street uh, you know it's just it's numbing it's uh it's like being in the fourth dimension it's uh, like we're not even on the it's not even new york city where it's happening um nothing is normal people are just walking in a daze up and down the streets uh, nobody knows where to go i just feel kind of a uh, this nervous anxious buzz and uh still unfathomable Trinity Church, one of the oldest, I think the oldest uh, Episcopal Church, certainly in, in this part of the world, certainly the oldest in, in the city, on the edge of Wall Street there. Was it being used? Did people come to it to, uh, for any subsequent occasion? Um, uh, it, it was being, we were only shooting a, a kind of a teleconference up in the fourth floor mm. TV studio there. And we were all sitting in the studio about an hour before our airtime, and there was a, the lights went out for a mm. second, they flickered. And we kind of joked with the studio guys that they had just in a, a new, put in a new studio and said, hey, you guys better watch out for that. That's not normal. Mm. And then within 10 seconds, people came running in and said that the Trade Center had been hit. Or, and uh, I, they tried to call a production meeting and ask people to stay in the building. And uh, people were just kind of fleeing. And I, I grabbed my still camera and was going to run out not really heeding what anybody was saying there, knowing what was happening outside and feeling the need to, to be there. And um, one of the guys came out of the studio with a camera and was putting a tape in it, and I just grabbed it and ran. And uh, we saw the shadow of you running across the street. What was you afraid of, principally, as you were running? That, that I was afraid that I was going to be rained upon by whatever was coming off the building. So I knew that I had a, a few seconds to get uh, basically an establishing shot, and then I had to look out for myself. And I ran, I was on the southeast corner of the plaza, I'm not sure exactly what building is there, and I just went around the corner a little south on, on church, and just got underneath the car and pointed the camera up into the sky, and, and stayed there for a while, and then came out after a few minutes when the debris stopped raining so heavily, and I went around the corner and was pulled under an overhang by a couple of Port Authority police to whom I immediately mentioned what I had shot. And they just grabbed me and whisked me down into the Port Authority police headquarters. And we were leaving there to go back to Trinity Church to make a dub mm -hmm. of the tape when suddenly the, the tower to the top collapsed. And I just looked up and saw from basically two blocks away this reverse mushroom cloud coming down at me. I know, me. I said earlier, it looks like a banana suddenly being peeled. It's, just, it's extraordinary. Well, I, I've seen shots of the collapse from far away, and I just can't believe that I was actually there yeah. and, and walked away. I mean, I, I had to dive underneath. I ran backwards with the camera mm -hmm. just pointed behind me, away from the scene, and saw that you know, have heard about uh, clouds enveloping people and oxygen being depleted, and I just dove under the biggest emergency response vehicle that I could see, 
stayed there for about 30 seconds, um, saw nothing but pitch black. I started having difficulty breathing. I thought my oxygen was starting to dwindle, and there was a moment when I said, well, this might be it. And my only chance is to get out and start walking north. Well, we're very grateful to you. Very grateful you're, you're okay. And, Thank you. and that you. And that you took these photographs and that you shared them with the public. Um, they're very dramatic. I needn't tell you that, but I'm very grateful to you. Oh, you're welcome. Nice to see you. Evan Fairbank. He's a freelance photographer who was working in Trinity Church today on the edge of Wall Street today when, when he and his colleagues on a, on a production shoot in a church saw these two extraordinary scenes from, to put it uh, directly from a different angle because we have seen it so many times, but uh, this is the most dramatic angle we have seen this plane flying at the top of that building. It's quite extraordinary. Um, I want to go to Washington very briefly because we said the president was on his way, we believe, to Washington from Nebraska and ABC's Claire Shipman is there and I gather, I gather, Claire, the president wants to talk to the nation again. Indeed he does. He is on his way back to Washington uh, at this point. We're told he does plan to address the nation tonight, but we don't have a time for that. We're told that he feels very strongly about this. People who've been with him say he's been angry and upset about once to, what happened, and he very much wants to express it. We're also told, Peter, that the congressional leadership is on its way back to Washington or will be very shortly from its safe haven, and that those leaders, a combination of the congressional leaders, will also be addressing the nation tonight. There's apparently a real premium here from the leadership in Washington on presenting a face of business as usual. There have been a lot of security concerns presented to everybody about coming back to the nation's capital, but everybody has said we want to show that the government is up and running, and that's what's most important to us, so try to minimize the risks. So it looks like a lot of people will be back. A couple of little notes about the president's return. We're told it's likely he will land, as he usually does, at Andrews Air Force Base. They think the airspace here is probably the safest uh, in the nation at, right now. They're not sure they want him to chop her to the White House, though. They don't feel so comfortable about that. He may come by motorcade. When he arrives at the White House, we're told Vice President Dick Cheney will then no longer stay at the White House. He will be taken somewhere else as a precaution, but Mrs. Bush will likely then come back to the White House. Peter. Thanks. been living with the facts for over eight hours now and they are still unreal. America with a new Pearl Harbor, a new day of infamy after terrorist level, a devastating attack on America. Our world has been shaken in just one morning. The country is realizing the unthinkable violence we have seen abroad has become our new reality here at home. This is all that is left of the World Trade Center where 50,000 people once worked. What was once the gleaming symbol of New York's skyline has been reduced to this ghastly skeleton of rubble. The horror started just before 9 this morning when a hijacked plane slammed into the North Tower of the Trade Center. Then at 9.03, unbelievably, it happened again in full view of a horrified nation with TV cameras poised for coverage. Now, this second attack made it clear this was no accident. It was calculated. It was deliberate. About 40 minutes later, the Pentagon, the nerve center of this nation's military might, its national security, also came under attack. A third hijacked plane, this one from Washington's Dulles Airport, hit the building with a full tank of jet fuel. Then, just before 10.30 a.m., while the nation was still reeling, the World Trade Center collapsed. It disappeared from New York's landscape. Thousands are feared dead. New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani says the number of dead will be, quoting now, more than any of us there can bear. No and that may not have been the end of the nightmare. An American Airlines passenger jet mysteriously crashed outside of Pittsburgh. Reports speculate this hijacked plane may have been heading toward the White House, the U.S. Capitol, or perhaps Camp David. 266 people died on these four hijacked planes. Now, right now, Metro Airport is like a ghost town because it was shut down at 9.30 this morning once the FAA gave the order to stop all air traffic. Some passengers made it home. More will spend the nights in hotels here. Others found different ways to get to their destinations. Channel 7 Action News reporter Heather Catalo is live now to tell us about a security briefing at Metro. Heather? That's right, Guy. The briefing is going on right now. Right now, we're talking to the deputy director of Air Force, Dan Kerber. Let's listen in on the jetways uh, on this international flight, flight I believe, to Nairobi. Uh, 
Is that normal? And two, is that anything? Did you have any hint that something was up and, and security had already been bolstered? Uh, I can't address what you heard. I don't know anything about any additional plainclothes officers on a jetway. And we had no hint that this was coming. Did you hear anything from Boston? Did you hear anything about a security breach from Boston? No, we have not had a chance to talk to any of the airports at this point in time. The FAA has uh, taken both the airport and all the airlines to its highest level of security and there are various measures that are now being implemented. Uh, most of them are behind the scenes. Some of them that you may see are reduced curbside check-in, ticketed passengers only when we do reopen down the concourses. And obviously you will see now increased uh, law enforcement patrols. Are, are there any passengers left in the concourses? There are a few, uh, although it's extremely light at the moment. Um, and again, uh, Northwest, along with some of the other carriers, are busing some people here. So we will have to see how many of those remain when they arrive. And of all your um, uh, concession operations, how many would you say are open, half open, half closed? Or? I would say it's less than half, but we're trying to keep strategic locations open throughout the airport so that there are both food and, and, and some other commodities available to passengers that remain. Once again, flights are still canceled out of Detroit. Last check, Northwest is not going to be starting any flights until noon tomorrow. The FAA is saying nothing until at least 6 a.m. tomorrow. We will bring you the latest as soon as we're done with this press conference. Back to you, Guy. All right, Heather, thank you. Of course, the one thing that nobody's been able to explain is how four jetliners with all the security air airports could be hijacked in just one day. Now, earlier today, General Motors had to evacuate the Renaissance Center in downtown Detroit, and that's where we continue our coverage with Action News reporter Kimberly Craig. She's also just talked with Detroit Police Chief Charles Wilson, who was in Washington today and was only a mile from the Pentagon on when it was attacked and I know he is a, uh, a serving uh, reserve officer and that must have been a shaking experience for him Kim awfully shaky guy he said everybody in the room that he was in was in total shock now like you said he is a major general in the army and today they were supposed to have a meeting at the Pentagon they typically have him there today it was off site though about a mile to the east of the Pentagon when the hijacked plane flew overhead I've not been this close to a natural uh, attack or situation of this nature, and it's just, it's just hard to believe. I mean, it's, uh, it's a mile and a half, but uh, you can go to the roof of a building that this plane flew right over. It kind of brings the reality of how close it, it was, uh, a matter of uh, 100 feet or so off the ground, and or thereabouts. Uh, the, the, it was reported to us that it came right over at treetop level and then just bare down into the building. And Chief Wilson was not supposed to return back to Detroit until Thursday, but we're told he is trying to find a way back to Detroit right now. Now, traffic at the border here between Detroit and Windsor had been completely shut down, but we are told that at 5 p.m. things had returned to normal. Well, what could be considered normal at this point? Surely they will still be on heightened alert. Now, rents and employees are expected to return to work tomorrow. Although GM spokesperson said if that should change, he will let us know and we will let you know. An awfully tragic situation, Guy, and even uh, Chief Wilson says that his heart goes out to so many people, so many people that were directly affected by this and indirectly affected by this. It's just uh, incomprehensible and unbelievable right now. Back to you. Incomprehensible is the word, Kim. Thank you. So many people touched by this today. And today's attack is certainly on the minds of Arab Americans here in Detroit and their leadership as well. Also, just minutes ago, Congressman John Conyers spoke with them about today's tragic events. We turned out a reporter, Cheryl Choden. She's live in downtown with details on this meeting between Conyers and the Arab American leaders. Cheryl? That's right, Guy. I'm at Congressman Conyers' office here on Lafayette in the old federal building. And upstairs in his office right now, he is holding a news conference. He has called together some key Arab American leaders. Basically, they've come together to urge all Americans to keep the calm, not to judge their neighbors. They say that we learned our lesson in Oklahoma when everybody said it was Arabs right away who had done that terrorist attack. Right now they're saying that they are Americans as well and they are as horrified and as outraged as everyone else and they want to find the culprits and make sure that they are punished. So again, they're saying, please, please don't judge your neighbors. I wanted to point out that we are on Lafayette where this news conference is being held. I'm in the middle of the street and that's because in front of the federal building the street has been blocked off. You can see that down there. Blocked off also in front of Detroit Police Headquarters, the Sheriff's Department, the jail, many streets downtown. 
downtown are blocked off. Parts of it is like a ghost town. Everybody is shaking their head in disbelief, shaking their heads in disbelief. Everyone is so saddened by what happened and trying to do even the smallest thing to ease some of the fears. And that is why the congressman is holding this news conference. And actually what it is is kind of a forum. People are stopping in, and that's why he's holding it today. One final note, many of the flags downtown here are flying at half staff. Reporting live, Guy, I'm Cheryl Choden. Back to you. As well they should, Cheryl. Thank you. Military installations across the country are on a higher state of alert, as you would imagine, because of this attack here in the Detroit area. That includes Selfridge Air National Guard Base. Channel 7 Action News reporter Val Clark is live in Harrison Township with more on what's happening there. Cheryl, uh, excuse me, Val. And Guy, of course, this National Air Guard base is on a heightened alert status. Obviously, our cameras are not going to be able to get any further in, but you can see right behind me just how tight security is. Each and every car is being thoroughly searched. There are guards who are armed with rifles. Now, this is a bit of an unusual situation because I'm being told that during peacetime, this base is under the direction of the governor. However, during a time of crisis, the base takes its orders directly from the commander-in-chief, President Bush. Because they are still awaiting word, there's a certain amount of uncertainty and anxiety. In fact, some reservists who couldn't get through on the phones are showing up here in person just in case they're needed. And family members of soldiers who are on active duty here, because we have active duty of all four branches of the armed services actually living here, some of those family members have shown up just to talk to their loved ones. Reporting live from Harrison Township at Selfridge, I'm Val Clark, Channel 7. Action News. And I'm sure their minds are with those at the Pentagon as uh, well, Val, and our thoughts are with them. We want to show you what will be uh, on your doorstep uh, come tomorrow morning, and actually it's out this evening, America Under Attack. This is a special edition from the Oakland Press, September 11th, 9-1-1, if you will, and it has the sequential pictures of the second plane going into the South Tower, the fireball, and then the collapse of that tower just 55 minutes later. And we will be staying on top of the developments here in the Detroit area, and we will keep you updated throughout the evening. We promise you that. Right now, though, we want to go back to Peter Jennings and the latest from New York and ABC News. Seven, uh, number seven World Trade Center is 47 stories tall. And I assume, maybe you know, but listen, first of all. Again. You hear the sounds. I apologize. I thought it was something you coming. John, I assume that the, the seven, the World Trade Center, has been evacuated. Yes, it's been evacuated, and uh, and they're just trying to assess uh, what they can do to it to ensure its structural stability before they send people in to uh, to go through the rubble and look for survivors. And do they believe this was made structurally unsound by the concussion of the twin towers falling? Yes, and and literally by the fact that. Uh, so much of one of the Twin Towers fell on top of the building. Um, in fact, uh, as Jerry Howard told us earlier, people couldn't get in or get out of the, uh, the entrances because it was buried in the rubble of the Twin Towers, uh, most of the ground floor of it. They've been, they've been able to get people out, but um, they don't know that the building is, is safe. Do your uh, police and, and fire department uh, contacts believe that under the rubble here of the, of, of the North Tower, which collapsed, which we have seen, which we're looking at at this moment. Do they believe that there's survivors under there? Uh, they are certainly holding out the possibility um, and the hope, especially since so many of them are police and fire personnel. Um, there's, a real, there's a real difficulty for them right now because their instinct is to run in and save their people. And um, perhaps cooler heads in, in the emergency management have said, we can't afford to lose any more people. If, if another building goes. So they're, they're terribly torn between their instincts to rescue the civilians and their own colleagues. And the numbers of, a, of, account, of unaccounted for among the police and fire as they do their uh, spot roll calls to, make, to relocate everybody who responded are growing. Stay with me for just a second, because I want to talk very briefly, uh, who's on the telephone, Gary Breeze, who's the head of the International Association of Firefighters who will have been in contact with the, the fire departments here in New York City. Do you hear me, Mr. Breeze? I can hear you. Thank you. I, I know exactly what your sentiments are today, and I think John Miller has made it very clear. Everybody runs and, you're, and, and your people go in. But in your contacts today, we've been working with the notion that a couple of hundred firefighters may be missing. Do you know anything about this? Uh, we still have uh, several hundred firefighters unaccounted for. Uh, uh, fire Department of New York, when they when they send an initial assignment to the World Trade Center. 
it involves about 125 firefighters on the initial assignment. And without a doubt, uh, when they realize the severity of the situation, they dispatch greater alarms and probably had between uh, 300, about 300 firefighters on the scene uh, before the first collapse occurred. Uh, the, the issue here is now the criticality of the next 24 to 36 hours. Uh, we're moving from the initial impact of this incident to the rescue and recovery phases. And one of the, one of the challenges, as uh, Jerry Hauer was saying, is that uh, the, the desire for rescue. We've, we find statistically that about 90% of the people that are rescued from building collapses are rescued in the first 24 hours. So this next time period will be very critical for the rescue of injured people. Now, Mr. Priest, as you have talked to your colleagues in New York, though, I, uh, where are you, by the way? Uh, I happen to be in Denver today. Right. As you've talked to your colleagues uh, in, in New York, d do you get any sense from them about whether what you describe as rescue and recovery is going to be more recovery than rescue? I think it's going to be both. The World Trade Center uh, is, is a horrific disaster. Uh, the primary rescue efforts will be taking place in the buildings that surround the World Trade Center. Um, you know, we have we have uh, some eight uh, urban search and rescue teams on the way there now, uh, but they they will take at least 24 hours to become operational. Is this one of those situations where fire departments, and not, not dissimilar from a forest fire, where where fire departments are coming in from long distances, or is there enough men and materiel in the immediate area to help? I think from the initial response, fire departments from the New York area, uh, New, around the, surrounding New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut, and maybe even Pennsylvania, have already begun moving toward uh, New York City. Uh, the urban search and rescue teams are coming from as far away as California. What do you mean by an urban search and rescue team? Is this the same kind of team that would go to an earthquake? Yes, these are the structural collapse rescue teams. And, and for New York City, there's three teams coming from California, one team coming from Massachusetts. Mr. Breeze, let me interrupt you because we've had another building collapse. ABC's Bob Jamison. Bob. Bob Jamison? Okay. There has been another building collapse in lower New York. It may, and we won't even speculate as to what it is, but another building has collapsed. Um, uh, just reconfirming that when the two trade towers collapse, you see people moving. These people are, are not as close as they look. They're, they're at some distance away because the police have kept them at this distance. And another building, and maybe, John, you can recognize this, in this immediate area, I'm not going to speculate that it's number seven, but because a number of buildings in the immediate this, adjacent uh, area are vulnerable. This is uh, looking towards the World Trade Center and... Uh, that dark building in the upper left-hand corner is the uh, telephone company on West Street. So this is a few blocks north, uh, looking south. This is from 6th Avenue and Canal Street, uh, looking south. And, and do we know how close either you, I'm going to bring George Stephanopoulos in a moment, do we know how close this collapse might have been to the trade towers? You know the streets well. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, what you see the smoke coming up from this, uh, this structure. I'm trying to discern from the pictures if that is the bottom of the World Trade Center or, or another building. Um, okay, uh, the, new, the, the Associated Press is just reporting. George Stephanopoulos, are you in a position, we think this is Trade Center, Trade Center Building Number 7, which has collapsed. Yes, it, I, I'm not positive, Peter, but, we're, but we are pretty sure that it is. One of our uh, crew here saw it go straight down, and you're now trained on the plume of smoke coming straight out of that building. It happened just moments ago. It happened within five minutes, and that looks to be certainly within that immediate vicinity of the Trade Center. It just went straight down. Then it, in all likelihood, this is probably number seven, the building, uh, which... It's the one... For several hours now, Peter, the police have been concerned that there was going to be another collapse. They were concerned that, that uh, World Trade Center number seven was the most likely to collapse, and it was. It certainly is in uh, that square where the World Trade Center was. And there you get a good look from that graphic of the relationship between number seven and the north and the south tenders and there's the world financial center down at the foot of the north 
Perry Tennis, you, you may have been with us a little earlier on today when, when Betsy Stark, our business reporter, just pointed out the huge number of businesses that are in there. Morgan Stanley, I think it was, she said, had 50 stories in the one building. And there are also government buildings. Uh, New York State has, has offices uh, in, in the Twin Trade Towers itself. Uh, the Port Authority. Uh, entities, uh, the uh, U.S. Customs Service, the United States Secret Service, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, which ironically is tasked with investigating explosives and post-blast scenes, um, are all headquartered um, in the buildings just beneath the World Trade Center's Twin Towers within the same complex. There are the lower buildings in the courtyard there, so uh, obviously they've all been affected. And if we want to take you now to CNN. They were talking about the collapse of Building 7, and they have exclusive pictures of that happening. Of that happening, this is Aaron Brown. Two minutes ago, uh, we had to see Seven World Trade Center go down, which holds the Emer Office of Emergency Management for the city of New York on the 23rd floor there. It, uh, when we heard from FD the fire department of NYPD, uh, is that the whole south part of the building was engulfed in flames at one point, and it was a matter of time. Uh, to uh, collapse. They're just waiting for it to collapse, which we've been waiting for about a half hour. When it went down, it was quick, it was quiet, and we saw a lot of smoke come up. And now the smoke is pretty much gone off to the side, close, going towards the east side of Manhattan. Uh, so unlike the collapse of uh, the first of the towers uh, way back uh, this morning, around 10 or so this morning, and then the second tower, which collapsed shortly thereafter, at least, at least where building number seven is concerned, a building that, among other things, housed uh, the this emergency response team of the city of New York, at least they had some warning, they had signs that... Uh, this might happen and they were able to get as many people away from the area and the people in the area of course are firefighters ems personnel and and literally thousands of police officers who have cordoned off uh, the area Correct. About five we have, ago. For those of you who have been with us uh, throughout the day, we have shown you a number of times a piece of video, pictures of a plane coming into the building. We have uh, now another piece of video that uh, will show the same thing, different angle. And if we can roll that and take a look now, this again was shortly after the first. Wow. Oh, my gosh. I wonder... This, this comes to us from PAX TV. I wonder, uh, guys, if we can recue that in a moment and show that again. You see the, the fire coming out of the first building there, the plane on the lower left side of your screen. And it looks to me, and I'll confess I don't have the greatest monitor here, that you could almost see the nose of that plane coming through the other side of the building. Uh, that may have been an illusion as we looked at it here, but that's how it looked to us as the flames. These are fully loaded uh, planes, fully loaded with jet fuel. They were headed from uh, the East Coast to the West Coast, so they had an enormous amount of jet fuel. Jeffrey Beatty, a security consultant, said to us a little bit ago, this was low-tech, high-concept. The plane was the bomb, and you just saw the bomb go off. That was around 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, uh, I, that, would, that was around 9 o'clock this morning, about 9.08 this morning. Ben Wiedemann, who uh, normally reports for us, I'm sorry, we'll get to that. Let's go back to Washington and, and CNN's Judy Woodruff. Judy? Aaron, uh, again, pictures that have everyone here riveted. Um, we're told, I don't know whether we have this picture right now available to show our viewers, but I'm... And let's return to ABC News. We're completely covered in, in dust and debris. Is Gary Breeze from the Firefighters Association still with us? Yes, I am. It's, I'm sorry, Peter. And I was just asking you for Gary. Gary, uh, do you know whether or not uh, Number 7 had been fully evacuated in the course of the last seven or eight hours? Uh, no, not, not firsthand, but I can, I can tell you that if it was possible to be evacuated, it would have been cleared out. Uh, you know, that, that's one of the first jobs that a firefighter will undertake is getting the civilians out of the buildings. And I think it's reasonable, since they've had this much time, and it wasn't terribly structurally damaged in the initial mm -hmm. blast, that they probably got everybody out. Okay, Gary, thank you very much. And George, we'll let you all go back to working our sources at the minute. The, ma the mayor of New York, uh, Rudolph Giuliani, is going to have another 
a news conference uh, in, in a little while to now, and there's probably there's no person in the city who has a better handle at this point on everything that is happening. Um, he was a little reluctant, understandably, to 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 give some sense of magnitude uh, early on in terms of casualties, but he surely knew this was coming as as we did. And while we are waiting for him take a slight right turn here for the moment and talk to our aviation expert John Nance. It's actually not a it's not a right turn. It takes us back to the very beginning of this day. John, are you there on the phone? John Nance? Yes, I sure am. Peter, can you hear me? Um, yes, Peter, can you hear me? Well, I can indeed, John. And one of the things that just comes as I think a shock to people today is that for the most part we thought that uh, U.S. airliners were, if not immune from hijacking, were far better able to handle such situations and we get three major aircraft on two major airlines in one day how, how is it possible peter I, I think we've all been aware in commercial aviation that no matter how we hardened up the system against the casual hijack or in other words the the metal case or somebody who uh, who really isn't terribly well organized we've always known that our vulnerability level remained very high for somebody who intended to commit suicide and who was determined to do a lot of planning to know exactly what to do and how to do it to break in and i think that's what we have seen today this is the type of threat that has been our worst nightmare uh, as commercial aircraft and, and the commercial aviation business because if we tried to harden our system against this we'd get fewer than 20 percent of the normal air traffic in the air every day what do you mean that by that by harden the system against it you'd only get 20 percent up every day well peter we don't know exactly how these people got on board we don't know what happened but uh el al is a good example they have not had an incident in a long long time because they're extremely careful the you, Israeli you travel with them Yes, correct. You, if you travel with them, you are going to answer questions, you are going to be very carefully looked at. They know who they carry, and that's one reason they've been so safe. But if we tried to apply that same level of security to the entire civil air traffic system of the United States, we would cut down the amount of air traffic uh, by, well, down to one-fifth, and that's probably being conservative. Is it your feeling, John, that at the moment, I, I realize you can't say agree to this wholly, given what's happened today, that the system is about as tight as the public will tolerate, given the extraordinary amount of air travel we do? That's well, an issue, I think right? we can do what we, yeah, I, it is difficult, but I think we can do what we do a lot better, Peter. But I don't think that, uh, uh, basically, that we have a, a situation here in which we can get much more tight. Now, John, I think it was you, or, 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 can you still hear me, John? John Nats can't hear me for a second, but while they try to, uh, while they try to reconnect us with him, because he's so good on this particular subject, I think it was John or earlier who said that the modern airplane, the 757 and the 767, we're both involved today, are, are such sophisticated aircraft in the cockpit that they're actually simpler to fly. And, and so it is, it is clear, John believed earlier, that whomever did this today on board the aircraft itself had to have some knowledge of how to steer a plane into a building. Because no one today has been able to believe that a commercial airline captain on a U.S. aircraft would not sacrifice his own life rather than fly his own airplane into a building full of people. John, I'm just reviewing... You back with me now? John Nance? Yes, I'm back with I'm you. I'm just reviewing this yeah, notion you brought up earlier. I'm reviewing this notion you brought up earlier today that someone who was determined to fly an aircraft into two buildings like this, three including the Pentagon, didn't have to be an expert yes. flyer to get at the controls. Explain again, would you? Well, I think anyone who has, in our terms, a licensed pilot, even somebody who flew a smaller airplane, could manipulate controls of a jetliner once it got in the air. The problem is that if you wanted, if you're doing the planning for something this heinous, and you want to make absolutely sure that all of your aircraft reach their targets, you're going to want to put pilots who have some exposure to this type of airplane, or at least this class of airplane, into those seats. And that's why I don't believe that uh, we had anything other than pilots that were put into this position, and probably the air crews, I'm speculating wildly, obviously, but I would imagine that the air crews that were assigned to those flights were probably killed very rapidly. So it would take a minimum of experience but some familiarity with a cockpit of a 757 or a 67 to do what was done today. I believe so, Peter, you know because, saying, again, John? you know, I, I, that is what I'm saying. I, I'm saying that you, any pilot could get into those cockpits with an airplane in flight and physically pull and push and turn and manipulate that airplane. But if you're planning this and you want to make sure that they do it right and they, they don't mess it up somehow, 
you're going to want people that have had exposure to that class of airplane. And that's where I think uh, we may end up seeing this investigation go. And I actually think, if I recall correctly, that many hours ago, you raised the notion, you raised the possibility that someone who did this had some time in a, in a simulator. There is a high likelihood uh, that if you were going to plan this again over a period of time, a year or two, uh, that you could, if you were the planning organization, find a way to get your pilots that you wanted trained into a simulator someplace in the world. There are a lot of 757 and 767 training, or a lot of it available. And, uh, you know, our people train air crews from all over the world, our people meaning in the United States. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily have any clue of what was in their hearts or what they were planning to do if they came in the door from a legitimate carrier or even a private operator of a 757, because there are some private ones out there. Thank you, Josh. Anything else you need By to add? Way, the, please, go ahead. Yeah, just one other thing. I, this is an unusual situation, and one of the little flags in this, Peter, at this early stage is the fact that we're talking about only 757s and 767s. That is the only combination of big airplanes that have what we call a common type rating. In other words, if you're rated in one, you can fly the other. The cockpits are almost identical. And that may be of no consequence here. It may have simply been coincidental, but it also raises a little flag that maybe we are dealing with somebody who planned this on the basis of having trained for this type of airplane. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed, which uh, certainly speaks to the point that uh, any number of analysts of terrorism, somebody said this morning nobody wants to be described as an expert on terrorism today, as analysts of uh, terrorism and terrorism activity, and who try to monitor it around the world as effectively as they can have said, uh, this was today a very sophisticated operation. We do know now, we believe, that about a hundred people are believed to have been killed or injured in today's attack on the Pentagon. And as John McCrethy from the Pentagon has said to us on several occasions, there is no guarantee that that is the final number. But currently the information from the Pentagon is that a hundred people are believed to have been killed or injured in today's attack. And you recall that Mayor Giuliani of New York, the closest he has come to, uh, to giving a uh, casualty figures, which he's very understandably reluctant to do, that 2,100 people were injured, 600 taken to hospital, 1,500 walking wounded taken to Liberty State Park, which is on the other side of the Hudson River, actually in New Jersey, uh, where the Statue of Liberty, all this in full, full view of the Statue uh, of Liberty, um, and, that, and that various hospitals from New York City all the way to Canada are treating people today who have been somehow injured in this. Now, I want to talk to Lynn Schur, who has been following the, the aircraft all day. That is the American and United Airlines planes involved in these incidents. Lynn? Uh, Sir, as you well know, the only video that we've seen of an actual crash was of that second flight. That was the United flight that, uh, that crashed into the second World Trade Tower. What we're going to show you now is some very crude animation of the first flight. That was American Airlines 11. That's the flight from Boston to Los Angeles that went into the first World Trade Tower. What this is is animation based on the track of the plane, uh, data coming from the FAA. You're going to hear Walter Cross, the programmer, uh, describing it. Uh, the flight took an immediate hard left turn due south. Uh, the speed initially decreased uh, by over 100 miles an hour and then uh, increased to over 500. And then as it approached the New York area, it uh, slowed to uh, uh, all the way down to about 300 knots. So it, and then tragically it impacted in the World Trade Center. American 11 was indeed the first flight, we have confirmed that, of the two. And that, again, that was the voice of Walter Cross, the programmer who put that animation together. What that shows you is this flight on its way to Los Angeles headed due west and then made that very sharp turn. Mr. Cross also told us that there was an indication of some air violence right before that left-hand turn, violent changes in airspeed as the plane went off track to head into the World Trade Towers. On that flight, 92 people not counting the hijacker. And Peter, I've done some very quick calculations. Of course, all of the planes involved in today's incidents were headed to California. Uh, three of them to Los Angeles, one to San Francisco, two had left Boston, one from Dulles, one from Newark Airport. Total number of passengers and crew, 266 people, 
not, of course, counting the hijackers. Peter? Thanks very much, Lynn. And, and the, the, the issue of taking off from Boston and Dulles and all headed for, for California, John uh, Miller uh, raised the subject before, raised the issue before of whether or not, there are lots of reasons, and again, we'd be speculating, but he makes the point that, that aircraft taking off from Boston and Dulles outside Washington to go to California would have full loads of fuel on them, thereby creating a far greater explosive potential without having had to have explosives on board and getting them past U.S. security either at Dulles, Air, Air, at Dulles Airport or at, at Boston. 266 people on the aircraft alone today who have died in this attack on the United States and on the American people. Now, in our control room, somebody says there is a... Let me go first to Bill Blakemore and then perhaps to Joe Torres. Um, of WABC, our affiliate in New York. Bill Blake, were you there? And I gather you saw number seven come down. Yes, I did, Peter. I'm standing right on the West Side Highway. The skyline of the financial district has changed again. Just a few minutes ago, I was talking to some people. I was facing north. I saw a shock in their face, heard screams spun around, and then we just watched the building fall in it on itself. I believe we have a little bit of tape here. That's, uh, Peter, it was uh, an astonishing thing because the, the civilians who were standing around here were all amazed, but things have become so bizarre down here that the hundreds of firemen who were standing around looked at it, felt a bit shocked, but then just said, well, we're going to have even more work to do. Uh, associate producer Lucy Kerrigan had been over near that building just a little bit earlier, and the policeman had told her that they feared the building was going to come down, that they were evacuating people from around it, so that's one little bit of good news is that there may have been fewer casualties from this latest collapse than there otherwise might have been because they knew of the potential. But it's now um, still a very hot day here. The uh, search and rescue operation is mounting even larger. There are dozens and dozens of fire trucks backed up on the West Side Highway, police trucks. There are what look like hundreds of volunteers who have showed up who have been marshaled by the Red Cross, all with masks to avoid breathing in dusk, but nobody can go in yet. We're still looking at buildings that are on fire down in the center of the financial district, and it's clearly a great deal of devastation. It's uh, not too strong a word at all. It's going to take a while even to assess how bad it is. B Bill, do you have any idea whether or not other buildings in the immediate area are vulnerable at the moment, whether there's concern about any other building as there was about this additional one after the towers? Well, from the angle I'm looking at, um, we can see one other building still on fire, and it seems to be on fire through the length of it. I would estimate that's like a 30 or 40, about a 30 or 40 story building. Uh, the problem for any one of us, of course, is that because of the other buildings down here still standing, which are so tall, you can't get a very clean view of the whole thing from the ground. But there's at least one, and it's clearly uh, going to go on into the night. There's a lot of black smoke pouring out of that building now. Thank you, Bill. Just, we just stay with this photograph or this graphic for just a second. Well, no, there's number seven coming down. When you think that, that, that part of the component of news coverage around the country every year is the excitement and the fun that people get watching an old building being demolished and they wired very carefully for days and it's a very careful operation in order to make sure that a building comes down safely. I think the last one we saw was when they brought down one of the old casinos in Las Vegas. I mean, this is just stunning to see these things come down inside, in the case of the two, the north and south. Uh, towers there of the World Trade Center, you know, come down within a couple of hours as a result of the structural damage, weakening that was done when these aircraft hit them. And now, number seven, the World Trade Center, which is, which is 47 stories tall. We're talking with the World Trade Center north and south, 110 stories tall. Um, an eerie experience to be in them at, at the best of times. They sway in the wind and. and and, and people uh, and long had experiences with them, but but those and as Bill Blakemore said just a moment ago, the 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 landscape of New York City has changed one again. And in this instance, it's not New York City, it's not New Yorker cities, it's everybody in the country city at this moment, because this was an attack on these on the United States. No question about it. Everybody said it all day. A declaration of of war, an act of war against the United States. We've had a number of politicians and commentators, us included, who were reminded that the last time there was an attack like this on the United States was Pearl Harbor, which, in, which finally induced the United States to get fully involved in, in, World, War, in World War II. 
And we're going to go on all day, and we'll continue throughout the night trying to get some grasp of this. What do we know at the moment? The president is on his way back to Washington, uh, and uh, we've, we're not certain whether he's going to be helicoptered in from Andrews Air Force Base, which is tradition. But the security apparatus is concerned, and so he may come in a motorcade. I can't remember the last time a president went to went or came from Andrews Air Force Base in a, in a motorcade. Even a pres maybe the last time was Bill Clinton. No, I don't even think Bill Clinton at the end of his inauguration went out. But but there's another example. And the president wants to speak to the nation. And Linda Douglas reports from Capitol Hill that that the that the leadership in Congress today tonight <coughs> wants to have. You have who on the telephone? I didn't know that. I did not know that. I apologize. Thank you. First time I've heard about it. Judge Webster? Yes, Peter. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know you were on the phone. No, this well, it's is... been very interesting, and I'm, I'm glad to listen. Thank you, sir. This is Judge William Webster, the former director of, of the FBI, on the phone, one of the... And the and, and, and the CIA as well, as, as my friend John Miller points out. Judge Webster, I, maybe you could help us understand many things, but at, at, at the outset, when this happened today, does this overwhelm the FBI and drive the CIA into some kind of turmoil at the same time? When it happened today, is that your question? Yes, sir. Uh, it seemed to me that they responded uh, quickly. Uh, the FBI's uh, emergency uh, operations centers were in place. Uh, CIA, of course, is going back to its, uh, to its intelligence and uh, see what, uh, what they had, what they didn't have. Uh, I think what you usually find in a situation like that is grim determination to do a good job. I don't think it's any kind of uh, frustration or uh, frenzy. And as you have watched these events unfold today and perhaps even talked to your colleagues, your former colleagues in the FBI and the CIA, what's your appreciation of this as a whole event? Well, it's an extraordinary event and it, uh, it brings uh, home what we've been saying about the change of terrorism in the last 20 years is it moves from fewer numbers uh, trying to uh, make a political point to uh, doing extreme damage uh, and uh, this reached a high level of capacity to do damage in that way and it needs to be addressed as such. Uh, when you think about what has happened today and the tremendous uh, tragedy and calamity uh, it didn't involve nuclear weapons. It didn't involve biological weapons. Uh, it didn't involve equipment, artillery, scuds, or anything. It involved the ability to steal four or five airplanes uh, and, to, uh, and to send them on a course of destruction. Uh, that's within the capacity of non-governmental organizations uh, such as the kind you've been talking about. And do you believe, Judge Webster, because there's a lot of <coughs> armchair observation today, and I don't mean to include you in that, a lot of armchair observation from many of us, do you believe that this in any way, shape, or form could have been prepared for, if not prevented? You'd like to think that you could prepare for every kind of calamity, but you also like to think that we live in a society that we're very proud of in terms of the freedoms we enjoy and the freedoms to travel is one of those uh, freedom from uh, from uh, violence is another one to the extent that we can know about it knowing is the difficult thing it's, in, in my years of experience terrorism was the most difficult because of the cellular nature cellular nature of uh, decision making at the top even the people who are in the organization would not know until the last minute what was going to take place I hope we can develop uh, better means of uh, profiling the kinds of, uh, of, of uh, people who could do damage, and I'm not talking about highway racial profiling, or anything. I'm talking I'm about saying. looking for people that fit profiles of, of behavior uh, that would be more helpful. As I listen to you say that, Judge Webster, I think about Timothy McVeigh. Nobody had Timothy McVeigh down as a profile. No, they didn't. <laughs> in, in, in Oklahoma. We're going to switch now to our sister station in New York, WABC TV 7 for another look at today's event. Now this inspector, he is in charge of the mobilization here at the foot of the Brooklyn Bridge. Can you tell me, at what time did you come here? Uh, we were here shortly after the incident occurred in Manhattan. And our, our main concern here is for the, uh, to assist the thousands of pedestrians who have left Manhattan by way of the Brooklyn and the Manhattan Bridge. What we have is we have several shelter-like uh, two schools that we have in the area. We have a triage set up. 
uh, hundreds of people were treated for minor injuries and where we are providing with the city buses transportation for these people either to various locations throughout the city or we're going to have them eat something and wait for some uh, family members to pick them up. Now this is a tremendous effort. Tell me, has it been smooth? What has been the biggest challenge? Right now, the biggest challenge has been the traffic. The people themselves who've come over the bridge have been very orderly, they've been very ruly, they've been very cooperative. Uh, a lot of the people who come over are in shock. We have several churches and synagogues that are housing them temporarily, and we have two schools in the area. The biggest problem here is the traffic. The traffic is virtually at a standstill. Also, some people have come up to me asking that they want to go into Manhattan. What are you telling them? Right now, unless you are a resident of Manhattan, we are not allowing people to cross the Brooklyn or the Manhattan Bridge to get into Manhattan. I'm sure some hours later that will change but right now that we are not allowing anyone into Manhattan and you're planning to stay here indefinitely we will be here indefinitely thank you very much for your time you know a lot of people are coming up to us asking questions such as how do I get into Manhattan one woman came up to me rather frantic because her brother is works inside the World Trade Center and all she wanted to know was if he is still alive I of course could not answer that question for her but you can understand that there is confusion on this end as well live in Brooklyn I'm Lisa Quintana ABC 7 eyewitness news it's a difficult time for all who live here thank you Lisa the West Side Highway also an exodus route today people trying to leave as emergency vehicles tried to get back and forth from lower Manhattan Michelle Charlesworth has been on the West Side Highway throughout the day she joins us now with details we're going back now to ABC's coverage with Peter Jennings in New York. Human intelligence, human, you call it in your trade, was, yes. was, was downgraded as part of the national effort against terrorism. Were you supportive of it being downgraded? Now, actually, that was before I came on board. It seems to me that we've been trying ever since 1978 to improve, uh, or at least 1980, to improve the quality of human intelligence. And in some cases, we were very successful. I recall the the ability in the Armenian terrorist incidents in the early 19, late 1970s and 80s, we were able to get there and interdict the bombs, one in San Francisco, one in Los Angeles, uh, one uh, with explosives en route to New York, and the other in Canada. Uh, we know what we need to do, and in some cases we can do it, but we're dealing with some very, very powerful and sophisticated competition here. Judge Webster, I just have, I'm very grateful you joined us. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, but I have one more question for you. Whenever there's, a, whenever there's a debate or a discussion about the freedom of Americans and the freedom of movement Americans should enjoy under these circumstances, the director of the FBI is always right there at the center. And there's always a debate that there's always an inclination to think that you and the FBI, you want to make it tougher for Americans to move about because it's easier for you to do your job under those circumstances. What's your message to the American people today about retaining their freedoms in the face of this kind of enemy? I think the message is that we can't have a pendulum swinging back and forth from repression to uh, anarchy. And I think we've done a pretty good job of finding that center which uh, Edmund Burke 300 years ago called ordered liberty. Mm -hmm. We need to have liberty, but it has to be one accompanied by order. And professionals are very willing to do their job under court orders and the appropriate procedures. All that they ask is that they not be unduly burdened uh, by uh, restrictions that, that in, in times like this get in the way of finding the culprits and bringing them to justice. Judge Webster, thank you very much for giving us the time. We'd like to hear from you later on, so we're very grateful to you at the moment. Thank you. Two things the judge said, thank which... You, welcome, sir. Uh, two things uh, the judge says, which just leap off the page, John Miller, to me. Clearly, one is the Edmund Burke quote when he talks about liberty. It has to be ordered liberty. And the other, in terms of talking about the capacity of the terrorists, today said there were no scuds involved. There was just the capacity to steal four planes. And we had talked earlier about airline security. How do you get a gun on an airplane? Um, unconfirmed reports from these cellular phone calls that were made to 911 from one of the flights uh, saying that uh, a flight attendant had been stabbed. Uh, perhaps they didn't have a gun. Um, certainly, the, uh, the GAO and the General Accounting Office right. of Congress uh, and the FAA and uh, airline security's consultants have demonstrated over and over again that uh, if you're careful enough and you plan it, you can get a weapon onto a plane. And they've demonstrated exactly how, which I won't describe here for obvious reasons. Right. So um, this is security that's designed to harden the target, the airplane. Um, certainly uh, there's no such thing as total security there. And terrorism, I mean, if you look at 
this most incredible, unprecedented, historic act of terrorism, mm -hmm. it still harkens back to what we see in the World Trade Center, Oklahoma City, the embassy bombings. Uh, we talk about the level of sophistication in planning, maybe, but the actual act is usually very low tech. A bomb made of uh, fertilizer. Uh, fertilizer and fuel oil, things you can look up and buy on the internet, uh, hijacking an airplane, uh, perhaps even with sharpened instruments. Um, now, the aspect that there may have been people trained to fly these planes, mm. that's a new wrinkle. That is a uh, Certainly on, on conventional hijacking. I can give you an update from the scene as please, things are developing please. there. Um, if there can be any good news about a day like today, the collapse of Seven World Trade Center, the building they were so worried about injuring rescue workers, has freed up um, rescue workers to now go into the area, and they are moving in in groups of 20 and 50 as their teams are designated. Um, so the, the principal danger, the principal danger to the rescue and recovery the, teams has been eliminated. The so biggest danger has literally removed itself. Right. Um, one of the first teams going in is uh, a team of tow trucks, which is literally going to pull uh, rigs that are uh, fire trucks, police trucks, that are buried in rubble out of the way so that they can clear a path and bring in other vehicles. And uh, they've requested uh, a number of dogs. Additionally, 100 just, doctors... Just, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. Sure. Explain why they want dogs. Um, they, uh, they want bloodhounds, cadaver dogs, the kind of dogs that can climb up in the rubble with them and, and catch the scent of people um, that they can dig for in such a, such a big pile of rubble. It is a strange name for specialty, but there are indeed things called cadaver, cadaver dogs. Anybody who called it the Condit investigation know that they were used in, and et cetera. Come on, right. Uh, 100 doctors, 100 nurses are, are standing by uh, the main police facility that is now the command post for the NYPD, mm -hmm. not police headquarters, but a, an off-site location further up in the Midtown, um, has them standing by waiting for, the, for somewhere to send them. And uh, essentially, this, uh, this long operation, uh, which will be the longest night for New York's rescue workers, has just begun. And thank you, John. Cynthia McFadden, uh, I believe, is now at Chelsea Piers, a large sports entertainment complex on the west side of Manhattan, or at least close to it, which, Cynthia, I, is, was described earlier as a makeshift morgue. Is that really what it's going to be? No, it's not, Peter. What they've decided to do here is make this the triage center. We've been told that all victims now who are taken out of the blast site are going to be taken here first. They'll be tagged before they got, get here, uh, determine what the severity of their condition is, and then once they arrive here, uh, it'll be, they'll be treated initially and then sent on to other hospitals. I should also tell you that inside this has been described to me, I, you can see behind me, uh, ambulances. What you can't see probably is that there are probably 200 or 250 ambulances lined up here on the west side highways uh, waiting. These are empty ambulances waiting to distribute patients or potential victims all over the tri-state area to hospitals. Now, Peter. Inside, uh, it's been described, we, we got a look inside earlier, it really looks like a MASH unit. It's 50 operating suites set up, hundreds of doctors and nurses here to treat the wounded. They have been here, standing here for hours now. There are no patients here yet. Uh, the latest estimate is that there won't be any people here for several more hours. Mm. Uh, what we're told is, and I was just listening to John Miller, uh, part of the problem initially was that when the first rescue workers went in, and we've talked to some of them who have, some, some of the second wave of rescue workers, the first wave of rescue workers who went in were trapped, many of them killed by the second blast. Mm -hmm. And so when the second workers came out, many of whom are now here, um, uh, th they, they wouldn't allow anyone back in the area, which is why there aren't any mm -hmm. patients here at the moment. Well, I, I, Cynthia, let me just go a little farther with that. You say 250 ambulances are standing around waiting to pull people out. You'd be talking about pulling people out of the rubble at at this point. Uh, the mayor said, the mayor reminded people across the country, there are 170 hospitals in New York City, and aside from St. Vincent's, the principal nearest hospital, <coughs> which lost, among other things, its emergency power, I think, and lost its gas operating facility at the time, wasn't it, John? Uh, that was uh, Beekman downtown, or New York infirmary, that right. lost its steam power. Uh, St. Vincent's then actually had to bear the brunt of this. And, and so the people have gone directly to hospital. I don't quite understand, C Cynthia, the the, who's going to come to Chelsea Piers unless, until they begin to 
rescue people, hopefully, from the rubble itself. Peter, the, the initial thought, and of course, as you know, we've, we've, been to, we've been to Bellevue today, a couple of other places. There have been hundreds of people at area hospitals, as you know, but they don't believe that anywhere near the full weight of this has yet been uncovered, that there are, are hundreds and thousands of people who have been injured in this blast, and that's the people that they expect to bring here. Okay. Let's transition now to CNN, where there are reports of explosions in Afghanistan. In the direction of the airport, the city at this stage still very well illuminated. The electricity supply is still on in the city, illuminating the city. Uh, detonation coming in from uh, towards the airport. Multiple detonations now going off again towards the perimeter of the city in the direction of the airport. We see one fire on the horizon at this moment. Uh, Kabul is surrounded by mountains. The detonations reverberate from those mountains, so it's difficult to get a difficult to get an accurate fix uh, on exactly where the impacts are happening. Certainly, uh, our certainly it would appear that the Afghan defense systems have detected a uh, threat in the air. They are launching uh, what appears to be anti-aircraft defense systems at the moment. Certainly I can see that fire that was blazing on the horizon. It was a, a, a faint yellow. It's now a bright orange blazing. Uh, several other detonations uh, going off around the city, multiple areas. Rockets appear to be taking off from one end of the airport. I can see that's perhaps located about eight or nine miles away from where we stand, Joey. We want to ask you uh, to keep, please keep your line up to us. We're, we're having difficulty reaching you on another line, but please keep your line up. We can see the pictures coming to us by the video phone. Again, this is very advanced technology that CNN is using, but you will see some of the digital effect. It is not quite as clear as your average television signal, and so to our viewers, we apologize for that. But this is certainly the only video that you're going to get from Kabul, Afghanistan at this point, and you're watching it on CNN. Again, we are hearing from our correspondent, Nick Robertson, who is on the scene in Kabul with his team there, and he has reported the sounds of tracer fire. He has reported the fire burning there in Kabul, the seat of Afghanistan's power, the seat of its Taliban government. Uh, again, we are watching their picture coming to us on the video phone, and it is very hard, of course, to see exactly what you're looking at, but you are looking at Kabul. Again, you see some tracer fire there coming across the scene. Nick Robertson, can you, yeah. can you Joey, hear us? We're being, we're being told, jo Joey, I, Joey, I can, Joey, I can hear you if you can hear me. Certainly, big detonation there, missiles flying across the city. We're being told from sources in Kandahar, that's the spiritual capital of Afghanistan, 300 miles south of here, that there is uh, no uh, rocket activity like this south of here in Kandahar. Certainly in Kabul, very, very active at this stage. Multiple detonations. It is nighttime here. It is dark. It is difficult to get an accurate fix on exactly what we're seeing and exactly what we're hearing. Certainly the sound, what appears to be the sound of large missiles incoming and landing in the city. Certainly a big fire on the horizon of the city at the moment. Uh, and certainly anti-aircraft fire uh, coming up from the city and rockets being launched uh, and flying across the horizon of the city. Uh, rockets perhaps going at the speed of uh, several hundred miles an hour, the sort of speed that one might expect to see uh, cruise missiles traveling across the horizon at burning with a, a, a white glow coming from their tails rather than, rather than a yellow glow. The fire on the uh, horizon that we can see from here burning furiously now. Uh, perhaps it would be accurate at this stage to suspect that that was a fuel dump that's been hit uh, by the way that it's burning, flames leaping, and that fuel dump must be perhaps five to eight miles from where I am. Flames leaping up from that fuel dump now leaping up right into the air. Um, it was a low burning fire before, but it's now really increased in its ferocity, perhaps indicating that it is a fuel dump. Looking across the rest of the city, uh, that fuel dump, perhaps the only big fire we can see at this time. From our vantage point here at the Kabul Intercontinental Hotel that overlooks the whole of the city of Kabul that is in a basin surrounded by mountains, uh, the, the whole city is laid out in front of us. The gunfire that was coming up from the city seems to have subsided for now. We're not hearing 
any more detonations at this moment. And as I say, the fire on the horizon really burning uh, furiously at this time, flames leaping way up in the air this moment. Joey? Nick, if you can talk to us a little bit about your circumstance, it is 6 o'clock in the evening here in Atlanta. It must be quite late at night there in Kabul. Indeed, 2.30 uh, in the morning uh, here, Joey. We're eight and, an, eight and a half hours ahead of East Coast time in the United States. Uh, and it was about uh, five hours ago that the Foreign Minister of Afghanistan, Ahmed uh, Wakil Ahmed Mutawakil, briefed journalists. I hear more detonations going off now. Um, he said that the Taliban had not taken precautions against, uh, the, like, against the possibility uh, of there being an air attack against Afghanistan. He said because it was not necessary. Uh, the Taliban spiritual leader, Mullah Omar, had also made a statement saying that they felt Osama bin Laden wasn't responsible for what had happened in the United States. He said his country was a peaceful country, he wanted it to be at peace, and he wanted uh, peace in other countries around the world. Certainly what we're seeing in Kabul, uh, in these early hours of this Wednesday morning, is, is very far from peace. Uh, certainly multiple explosions happening in and around the city. We, there is a front line uh, about 50 miles north of the city where the uh, Taliban are fighting a, a battle against the, uh, the Northern Alliance here. We could hear detonations coming from that uh, northern area as well. But on the perimeter of the city, particularly in the direction of the Kabul airport, which is about five to eight miles from where we are, detonations coming from there. I remember standing on this balcony about four years ago watching, uh, watching fighter jets bomb that airport as part of Afghanistan's ongoing civil war. The uh, flash uh, at the airport to us hearing the detonation of the hotel is about the same duration, so I, I am using that as an estimate uh, to gauge that those missiles again are falling in the area of the airport. First we're seeing the flash and then we hear the detonation some several seconds afterwards and they appear to be coming from that airport area, in some cases uh, several miles away from it. There is still uh, a lot of flashing uh, we can see in the air reflected off clouds that could be thunder and lightning. However, there's a possibility that those reflections are missiles landing elsewhere, uh, the flashes as they explode and reflecting off the clouds. But it's not a good indication. We certainly don't hear uh, any detonations coming from that particular direction at this time. Um, the anti-aircraft fire that we were seeing a little while ago is not uh, coming up from the city. The city, uh, apart from the detonations we were hearing a few minutes ago, appears very, very calm. The visibility here is excellent. We can see all the way across the city. It lies on a plain that's surrounded by the mountains here in Kabul. We have high mountains to the right. These mountains were used by the Mujahideen as vantage points for shelling the city uh, several years ago during the Mujahideen in fighting in Kabul. The last five years, the Taliban have been in control of this city, have been trying to extend their control over and across Afghanistan. And the foreign minister this evening uh, telling journalists and CNN that he didn't believe that uh, Afghanistan would be attacked. He said if Afghanistan was attacked, then they would call it, the Taliban would call it, an act of state-sponsored terrorism, Joey. All right, that is CNN's Nick Robertson. Again, please keep the line open to us, Nick Robertson, there in Kabul, Afghanistan, for our viewers who are watching this with us on the air. Again, this is we're getting this from video phone technology. You're seeing this exclusively on CNN. It is a very new technology, and so you, you could tell from the audio line, it is not as clear as our typical TV feed, and the visuals obviously are not as clear, but you are looking at the city of Kabul in Afghanistan. This is the seat uh, of the uh, of the Taliban. And let's go back uh, from CNN to ABC, Governor George Pataki briefing the media. We are taking the investigation. We'll take a back seat to search and rescue. Obviously, personal safety is number one concern even for us in law enforcement. Uh, I have talked, uh, just generally speaking, this is going to be uh, coordinated, it is being coordinated by FBI in Washington at our headquarters. Uh, we have the various offices already actively engaged where some of the planes were hijacked, such as Boston, uh, where it crashed, crashed in Somerset, Pennsylvania. We're doing all of that. Uh, the lead office and coordinating office will be the uh, New York office with the 
primarily because of the Joint Terrorism Task Force that we have here with uh, NYPD as well as all the other federal agencies we are gathered. We want to take a brief break from our network coverage to bring you up to date with what is happening here in Metro Detroit. Tonight, America, and certainly Detroit is no exception, is shocked and outraged after a triple blow at the hands of terrorists. We have just gotten some exclusive video showing the second attack on the World Trade Center. This is closer than you've seen at a fresh angle. And as you can see, it was taken by a freelance photographer leaving the building after the first attack. He pointed his camera upward, and you see the second hijacked plane slam into the South Tower. It was almost like a bullet going through. You could almost see the nose of the aircraft coming out the north end of the building. Unbelievably, it was just swallowed up by the building before turning into a giant fireball. And a short time ago, still more destruction in New York City. Number seven World Trade Center, a 47-story building, just disappeared from the skyline as it collapsed. The building had been heavily damaged when tower, the North Tower fell. It had been evacuated. Diana? And here's how today's tragic chain of events unfolded. Just before 9 this morning, a hijacked plane slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Then at 9.03, another crashed into South Tower, wiping out several floors and any hope that the first crash was an accident. Forty minutes later, the Pentagon was attacked. A third hijacked plane flew into the building and exploded into a ball of flames. Then at 10.30, the horror grows. The World Trade Center collapsed. The streets were filled with people running for their lives. Thousands are feared dead. But the nightmare was not over. Just outside Pittsburgh, an American Airlines passenger jet crashed, killing everyone on board. Reports are the plane was heading to Camp David. Now, today's horrific attack has led to heightened security and extra precautions being taken in downtown Detroit tonight. And that is where Action News reporter Cheryl Choden is live, where local police and federal agents are all on high alert. Cheryl? Absolutely, Guy. Actually, downtown, many parts of it are like a ghost town. You can see right now there are barricades in front of certain buildings. I'm in front of the old federal building. The street is blocked off, also in front of police headquarters and the McNamara Federal Building, the Sheriff's Department, the jail. All those streets are blocked off. Federal, state, and local police are on almost their highest alert. What's going to happen or where the next attack is going to be directed at. And so, you know, there's certain things that are just automatic when things like this happen throughout the country. What would your uh, message be to the citizens, Chief? Well, just to go about being good Americans right now. Uh, embrace each other. Uh, come together as a country. And Assistant Chief Winkler said he had some other advice for the people. He is telling people to stay close to their homes tonight. Also, he said, though, get out and vote if you have not done so. He also said, make sure that you don't point fingers. You don't blame your neighbors or any particular ethnic group. And that's what Congressman John Conyers, many people are saying today, urging people not to blame others right now. Let's wait and see what happens, especially Arab Americans. They are Americans who are horrified and outraged by this as well. Finally, Chief Winkler said, say some prayers for all the victims and, of course, their families on this dreadful day. Reporting live, I'm Cheryl Choden. Back to you. And we join him in that, Cheryl. Commercial aviation has ceased here in the United States. All U.S. airports shut down. Action News reporter Heather Catalo is live at Metro Airport with the latest on that. Heather? That's right, Guy. Metro Airport is still shut down and in the highest level of security alert. If you look behind me, you can see just how deserted it is here at Metro Airport. No flights will be leaving here or anywhere else until at least noon tomorrow. And even though Metro Airport did not receive any direct threat, the control tower here has been evacuated except for the most essential personnel. Also, a state of emergency was declared in Wayne County at 11 o'clock this morning that will stay in effect throughout the night. That essentially gives the county the authority to mobilize all of their police, all of their anti-terrorism squads if they need them. Also, all Wayne County buildings that were shut down today, we have just learned those will be reopened tomorrow, so all employees should report for work. As for the passengers who've come into Metro, they've either been taken to hotels or bused to different locations. Reporting live at Metro Airport, I'm Heather Catalo, Channel 7. Action News. All right, thank you very much, Heather. The impact of this attack has ripped through all branches of the government. That includes military bases across the country, now on a higher state of alert. 
Channel 7 Action News reporter Val Clark is live at Selfridge Air National Guard Base in Harrison Township with more. Val? Diana, but other than confirming for us that this base is indeed on a heightened alert status, the only thing that can be released to us officially is that this base is the only one in this country that has a combination of National Air Guardsmen and active duty service people from all four branches of the armed services. As far as the possibility of those soldiers being activated and or deployed though, that word, those orders will come directly from President Bush. Normally, during peacetime, this base is under the jurisdiction of the governor. You may be able to see this line of traffic and see those officers there armed officers. That is because this is the one visible sign of heightened security that we can see from this vantage point. Obviously, we cannot go any further. Each car is being thoroughly searched. And some people, why there are so many folks here, because some of them are actually reservists. They haven't been able to get through on the phone. They haven't been called in, but they have shown up here just to try to find out what's going on, if and when they might be needed. Reporting live from Harrison Township, I'm Val Clark, Channel 7, Action News. Oh, Diana, back oh, to you. Thank you very much, Val. Channel 7's John Kleekamp is live at the Oak Grove AME Church in northwest Detroit. John? Diana, the pastor here decided early this morning, even as events were still unfolding in Washington, in New York City, that the faith community would have to respond and provide people a place to go to deal with their pain and their suffering. And the Reverend Robert Brumfield says the purpose of this special service is to pray for peace, pray for the nation's leaders, and pray for the families that have loved ones who were hurt or killed in these attacks. Already, he says he's talked to two congregants who had family very near to the World Trade Center when the planes hit the two towers. He says one was actually briefly trapped inside a cab as debris was falling on the streets of lower Manhattan. Fortunately, now he is okay. Reporting live from Northwest Detroit, I'm John Kleekamp, Channel 7 Action News. So prayers of thanks, prayers of grief, certainly throughout the United States tonight. The, the headlines are startling. Uh, seeing it in print doesn't make it any easier to believe. This is the front page of the Detroit News, the special edition. One word, six letters that say it all and strikes at the very heart of Americans who watch this unfold today. It certainly does, and terror is that word. Terror in America. America under attack. And we do need to come together as a nation and pray. We will continue to monitor the effects of the attacks on the Detroit area and bring you the most up-to-the-minute information. In the meantime, let's go back to ABC. Uh, and putting our ducks in a row to, to, to and conduct the investigation. Uh, to, uh, we, have, we have no, we have no, we've had a number of reportings, as you can imagine, with any type of this type of incident. They are being run out by the Terrorism Task Force as well as the PD. We've had a number of them so far that have all been unfounded. So that's going to continue. We obviously want to solicit the public's help uh, if they saw anything unusual. We will be establishing, I don't have it just yet, we will be establishing an 800 number which will be manned by our Atlanta Georgia office because right now, uh, as is the mayor and the PD, we're suffering down at 26 Federal Plaza with uh, phone calls. We're not able to make phone calls out. So uh, in lieu of that, uh, I would give you the... Now we want to take you back to CNN and these startling pictures of the attack in Afghanistan. In the very beginning, the Taliban officials, Afghani officials, have said we had nothing to do with this. Osama bin Laden had nothing to do with this. How do you hear that? Was there any nuance in the language that sent a different message that maybe the rest of us might not have heard? Perhaps we have lost at least the uh, the audio for portion here. Jamie McIntyre has been uh, outside the Pentagon. Jamie, can you hear us? I do hear you. Uh, are, uh, are you hearing? Cola? Are you hearing anything from the Pentagon, uh, wherever the Pentagon might literally be right now, or at least officials about whether there is an American involvement in what we are looking at in Afghanistan? 
I have talked to several senior officials, and they've told me they uh, are not aware of whether or not this is a U.S. military strike. But the most senior officials are in the Pentagon. And in fact, uh, several busloads of reporters are being taken over now to the Pentagon briefing room, where we expect shortly Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, flanked by uh, the Republican and Democratic leaders of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator Carl Levin and Senator John Warner, uh, to brief us on developments today. And if this is in fact a military strike or part of a U.S. retaliation, we would expect that Secretary Rumsfeld would uh, tell us at that time. Secretary Rumsfeld has been in the Pentagon all day. He went outside briefly to make an inspection tour of the damage uh, behind me. Uh, many, many casualties here today, but the Pentagon is refusing to give any numbers or even estimates of how many people were killed and injured in this uh, terrorist attack uh, today here at the Pentagon. But again, no confirmation at this point from any of the officials that I've talked to about whether what we're seeing in Afghanistan is part of a U.S. military retaliation. Uh, Jamie, just to make sure that I, I've heard this correctly, no one is saying yes it is, but no one has said to you no it's not either, have they? No, uh, no one has steered us away from it. They've, uh, the officials who have been over here with the press, and we're just about a uh, half a mile or so from the Pentagon, uh, simply said that they, were, they had not been briefed and were not aware of this action when we told them that CNN was reporting explosions in uh, Kabul. So, uh, uh, but again, uh, several officials uh, speculated that if this were the case, uh, that that might explain the reason for Secretary Rumsfeld's appearance. And of course, uh, being flanked by, uh, by the bipartisan support of Congress, Congress uh, is clearly designed to, s to send the message that when there may be squabbles uh, between the Pentagon and Congress, but when it comes to something like this, there's absolute unanimity. That may also account for the reason that despite the uh, damage to the Pentagon, that they want to hold this event in the Pentagon briefing room, which is on the other side of the building, which was not damaged by the uh, plane crash into the side of the building, in order to show uh, a portrait to the world that the United States uh, military headquarters is still up and functioning and that the United States is still capable of, uh, of reaching out and touching its enemies. All right, thank you very much, Jamie. Right now, we're going to have Senator Orrin Hatch join us to provide some insights as to what might be going on. Senator Hatch, I don't know how much of uh, our coverage you've been listening to, but there seems to be a conflict of opinion as to whether we would be capable of pulling off this kind of attack if indeed that is what we are witnessing. What do you suspect is going on in Afghanistan right now? Well, let's understand we're capable of pulling it off if that's what it is, but it, uh, it's probably more likely the followers of Shah Massoud who was uh, deliberately bombed just yesterday and who was uh, seriously injured if not killed. Now, the, uh, his representatives say he was injured, but he's, he's all right. But there is some indication that he may have died in the attack. And he was, of course, the opposition to the Taliban over in Afghanistan. So it's a very serious situation over there as well. But what about what uh, former Secretary of Defense William Cohen just mentioned, that you would want to know who actually carried off these attacks before you planned any kind of retaliatory, stri retaliatory strike if this is not uh, a result of some conflict within Af Afghanistan? Well, I agree with Secretary Cohen. We have to be very cautious. On the other hand, I thought Secretary Eagleburger was very honest when he said that, uh, look, these, the, the Taliban have been harboring Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden has uh, said that uh, it is the duty of every Muslim to kill Americans. Uh, there's, no there, there's every indication that he has been behind some of the attacks against American I installations. And we happen to know just today that we've got information that, that uh, uh, indicates that uh, uh, re representatives who are affiliated with Osama bin Laden were actually saying over the airwaves, that, uh, uh, the private airwaves at that, that uh, that uh, they had uh, hit two targets. Uh, if you go back to the Millennium uh, problem scare that we had uh, before the year 2000, Osama bin Laden was in the middle of all of that, and the people associated with him and affiliated with him was in the middle of that. So this is a very serious situation. So they should not be harboring this criminal, and, and we've got to, it seems to me, go after him. And it does look, although the evidence is fragmentary, as though he's had a uh, major role in what's happened here today. Secretary Cohen, are you as convinced as Senator Hatch is that Osama bin Laden played some role in this tragedy here today? 
I think uh, if you were to cast the, uh, the searchlight of probability on these uh, footprints, they would lead uh, to Osama bin Laden, but I still think that we have to get uh, more evidence. This is not evidence uh, of a, uh, that you would need in the prosecution of a, of a criminal act. Uh, I uh, distinguish between terrorism and, uh, and a criminal act, uh, and so I would think you just need uh, more evidence than we have right now, but it doesn't have to be something you can uh, use in a court of law. I think that the probability is it points to... Osama we're going to go back to New York with Charles Gibson talking about the attack on the Pentagon. ...on many of the networks a lot during the Gary Condit situation. She is the wife of Ted Olson, who is the Solicitor General of the United States. He is the man who argued the case of George W. Bush in front of the Supreme Court when the uh, Florida results in the election were at issue. Uh, he is the man who argues the United States cases in front of the Supreme Court. She was on the plane, as I say, that had taken off from Dulles Airport bound for Los Angeles, American Airlines Flight 77. She made two phone calls by cell phone, as we understand, to her husband. Chris Vlastos of our investigative unit has been checking through friends of the family as to what happened. Now, we have reported previously that United Airlines Flight 93, which crashed outside Pittsburgh, that there were men on board that flight wielding knives. Somebody had been able to call out from that flight, said that the hijackers had knives, had cut a couple of the flight attendants, and had gained access to the front of the plane. Barbara Olson, when she called her husband in these two phone calls, said that she could see at least two hijackers. Uh, they had herded all the passengers to the back of the plane, and they were wielding box cutter knives. Those are the kinds of knives, to, you know, where you slide forth a razor blade. They had box cutter knives that they were threatening people with. Um, she said they were circling over the Pentagon, which is curious, as if they were waiting for something. That plane, after having, leave, uh, after having left Dulles Airport, was diverted to the area of the Pentagon and was circling. Uh, we don't obviously know why or for how long, but it crashed into the Pentagon uh, moments after the planes had hit the two towers of the World Trade Center. And she said to her husband in those phone calls, what should I do? What should I do? But of course, there was nothing she could do. Peter. Thank you, Charlie Gibson. Barbara Olson uh, giving us inadvertently, <coughs> or maybe not inadvertently, giving us a new piece of information, John Miller, because of all the things that you try to smuggle into an aircraft, if her eyewitness report is, tri is, is correct, that the hijackers on that particular plane were cutting box cutters, are easier to smuggle than a lot of other things. Well, yes, and especially because there are box cutters that are... Uh, Take them apart are, and put them back together again. Right, and that come in plastic sheets as opposed to metal. Um, the, the blade itself is, uh, is a razor blade, so even in a, even in a metal scan looking for guns or knives, it's not going to show up as a high-profile item, especially if you put it in a carry-on bag that's very busy with other items. It is, as you were talking, I just keep thinking, when we'll ever learn about this. We will learn, perhaps, someday what actually happened in those cockpits if the cockpit tapes um, survive these horrendous right. incidents. But this is not like the, this is not like the black boxes necessarily, which keep automatic records of the plane's systems. The no, cockpit but I mean, tape is more vulnerable. The cockpit, uh, the in-flight recorder uh, will be invaluable here, I think. The best shot, obviously, is the one that went down in Pennsylvania because they can search for that within the wreckage of an airplane. Uh, it is an uphill struggle um, to find a cockpit voice recorder in the wreckage of the two twin towers on top of the wreckage of an airplane. Uh, so perhaps some of the earliest clear answers may come from the plane that crashed in a field. People will remember around the country the painstaking effort to reconstruct and find what actually occurred on board TWA 800, TWA 800, which 10 years ago exploded. Am I right? 10 years ago? 10 uh, years ago. Uh, TWA Flight 800 was, uh, I no, think, no, 97. 97, big and uh, five years the, ago. And uh, the uh, cockpit flight recorders um, and the black boxes were were found um, in a remarkably short time, given that under they the were sea. under the sea. And uh, yielded uh, very little useful information. Um, in this case, I think you're going to hear a lot more dialogue. If you recall uh, the crash of uh, Egypt Air, Air Flight 990, um, you know, the cockpit voice recorders uh, were very telling um, as to what unfolded, or at least many people believe they were. Um, so in this case, uh, I think 
you'll probably see your first answers about what occurred on the aircraft in Pennsylvania. We do have an advantage here that people with cellular phones other than uh, Mrs. Olson did call out to 911 to emergency numbers because they were low over land and started to report these things and the National Security Agency which records Everything a variety of signals yeah. in the air is, is backtracking and looking for cellular signals that they have on tape to see if they can capture more of those calls and they have. Just to review New York City itself, because it's New York City at which we are currently looking. Uh, the mayor and the governor have just held a news conference. Most of the news forthcoming from the mayor, of course. He says it's difficult to move in the city. The city will be open tomorrow. Um, there are 2,000 people in terms of walking wounded, and he's been very careful from the outset uh, not to guess at casualties and suggest that there's a real urgency in the press corps and the news media to know about them. I don't think there is. I just think that people want to get some sense of the magnitude of this and it's for families and friends around the country who, who want to know on a personal basis what's happened to their friends and their relatives so he's not going to give his account he's urged people in new york city tonight not to feel any hate and anger he said that prejudice actually caused this and he went on to say the united states government will find out what happened but now it is up to the people of new york city to put the best face on behave like new yorkers that was a there was nothing that actually full. And uh, Governor Bataki then said that, uh, you know, they were seeking help from a lot of people. And we'll come back to that in, in a long time. But for many people around the country, it is time for World News. This is an ABC News special report. Hello again, everybody, and for those of you joining us now who uh, I cannot imagine under any circumstances expected to see a normal World News Tonight broadcast at this time. We've been on the air for the last 10 hours as the country has endured uh, or is trying to, uh, to get through, as one official here in New York said, this horrendous attack on the United States today in both New York City and outside Washington at the Pentagon, and an attack that may or may not have gone wrong on Camp David in Maryland, the president's country retreat, but certainly resulted in the deaths of some people on yet another airliner today. Uh, so this is going to be a very different broadcast and try to deal in the next half hour as we have deal with today in a comprehensive way um, exactly what the United States has been through today. It began a little more than 10 hours, a little less than 10 hours ago, and first one aircraft will take you through the, the video scenes of the day. Um, when first one aircraft and then another hit and ultimately destroyed the twin one trade towers 110 stories high on the west side of Manhattan. We didn't see the first one happen even though television was on and that is the astonishing second one as seen by a freelance cameraman who joined us a short while ago um, and he then stayed on to record this extraordinary, which we've seen from many angles, collapse to first one of the trade towers and then of the other. And the attack uh, brought down these two towers upon themselves, ultimately, and has left this extraordinary pile of rubble, video brought to us from yet another person. Meanwhile, um, we have this crash at the Pentagon, 200 feet wide, concern at the White House, Obviously, the president was in Florida early today, but then particularly when word that a fourth plane had been hijacked, which ultimately crashed in the Pennsylvania countryside outside Johnstown, Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh. The president of the United States has spent part of this day in an underground bunker in Nebraska. Uh, he's on his way back uh, to Washington now. He's going to speak to the nation tonight. Uh, the Navy's Atlantic fleet was at one point diverted to come and bring aircraft carriers to New York Harbor so that they could assist. There's, there's help and assistance uh, descending on New York and Washington from a variety of places. And, and it's probably not at all unfair to say that the entire country is, in some measure, in shock uh, as to what has happened uh, to the United States in a psychological, symbolic, and very physical way uh, on this uh, particular day. In this half hour, we're going to try to um, put together um, just some of the more cogent reporting of our reporters who've been watching this throughout the day. And I want to go first to ABC's Diane Sawyer, who's been in Midtown Manhattan all day, gathering what she can. Diane. All right, Peter, forgive me if I don't respond to you carefully, because it's still very noisy down here, and I'm going to kind of tell you what happened to me. We're now 
about four blocks from the scene. And as you can see, even at this hour, it's like being on the edge of the crater of a volcano. The smoke is still pouring out. The air is still acrid with fumes. Everywhere around me, I see haggard firefighters, exhausted policemen. And then in this eerie disconnect in New York, occasionally you see people just succumbing to the everyday and walking by. But still, if when you look at this, it is clear it is not over because as we know, within the last hour, another building came down, number 47, a 47 story building. And also they're saying they're evacuating now the Millennium Hotel. So this may not be over in a number of ways. As I said, when you walk around the streets of New York, and it's too easy probably to say that it's like one of those techno future thrillers where everything seems wrong and yet people are carrying packages they've been shopping while firefighters are still streaking their way down here i also want to bring in if i can don daler peter because don has been down here all day he was with us this morning as well and about an hour ago you made your way up to the scene and you've had those pictures from from the private photographer peter but i want don to tell us what he saw when he went to the scene himself right well about an hour ago we made our way down Broadway, past where there were a large number of firemen gathered, very frustrated, very exhausted, because they were not being allowed to put out these fires in the number of the buildings around the, the site of the World Trade Center itself. There was too much danger for them to be going there. They wanted to go and work. We made our way past the firemen and got about half a block away from where this building on this side would have been standing. And there was billowing smoke. It was hard to see everything, but I clearly saw something worse than I, what Dante would have imagined. There was there was rubble, there was twisted metal, and I clearly saw bodies and what appeared to be body parts strewn on the street, on the, on the rubble itself. And people still working on the evacuations? Working on evacuations. Yes, but, but they were forcing, at the point I was there, the police were forcing everyone uh, from emergency workers to the firemen away because there was such a fear, as you saw later, of, of a building collapse. Well, I want to give you a sense again, Peter, of what it is like here when one of the buildings collapse. We have here Jeff Rosson, who's from WABC, our affiliate, which has done great work today on this story. And Jeff, we have footage, and I hope we can cue it up, because we see this wall, this thunderous wall of smoke streaking down the street, and you were just ahead of it. And for all of you who were trying to escape it, what was that like? Well, what happened was we saw this big cloud coming at us. It was dust and it was smoke. And we knew the people inside of it couldn't see anything because we saw them running at us. So our job was to just get out of the way. What happened was we couldn't get out of the way fast enough and it caught up with us. We have people crying. They were creating a human chain, literally walking around like this because they couldn't see anything. At one point, we were stuck. We were at a store with a glass front and we couldn't get in. There was no way to go. We couldn't breathe. We didn't have masks. So an officer, a police officer from New York, came in with an ax and literally just bashed in the window and led us into that store. If it wasn't for that, I'm not sure what we would have done. And that's been a huge problem all day. Couldn't just see anything, and that was the problem. What was the heat like, and how suffocating was it for those trying to escape? It was hot, but luckily we were a couple of blocks away, and, and the bigger problem was all the dust. And it got into your lungs, and you just kept coughing, and you couldn't speak, and you couldn't see. That I mean, you kept, people were walking at the poles. People were crying and screaming. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Well, again, these are just a couple of people who have been on the scene all day, Peter. And as we said, we have watched this footage. We have seen people both heroic, terrified, and mystified. And the scene out here tonight is really just one of complete, almost wounded numbness. And there's no other phrase I can summon at this moment to convey it to you. Thank you very much, Diane. Diane Sawyer, who's been in Midtown Manhattan all day trying to get a grasp of the city and, and very effectively what's going on around her. Don Daler from ABC News, Good Morning America, has been down uh, with a couple of freelance photographers. It's freelance photographers who brought us uh, the, most, uh, the most intimate, the closest up video of what actually happened at the Twin Trade Towers today. It's a reminder of the world we live in. There's a camera pointed by somebody almost everywhere. Catch up very quickly on a story to say again what we said before World News Tonight came on, which that U.S. officials speaking for some reasons on the conditions of anonymity say the United States is not involved in any of the violence going on in Kabul, the Afghanistan capital tonight. This appears to be an intra-Afghan affair that the, uh, that the supporters of, uh, of a leading anti-Taliban leader who was killed the other day have been rocketing the city tonight so it has nothing as best we can tell uh, to do with this and then of course there was the pentagon and it just 
think back 10 hours, it just began to pile up on us, one thing after the other. One was horrible, the next was third horrible. By the time the Pentagon attacked, shortly after the attack on the Twin Trade Towers, it was amazing. And here's ABC's John McCrethy, who's been there all day. John? Peter, it was at 9.38 this morning. I was innocently sitting in my office at the Pentagon when there was a jolting blast on the other side of the building. You can see it over my shoulder. Uh, a large aircraft came down 395, which is a major highway. It clipped off the tops of many of the light poles on the way in, and it slammed into the building. Uh, you can see on the one side of the huge gash uh, that windows, 25 windows down along the Pentagon were destroyed. Uh, the building, the section of the building that was hit by the fuselage of the aircraft collapsed several minutes after the aircraft hit it. Um, I was able to get an exclusive walk up to the damage site uh, with some officials who got me through police lines. Uh, the area is uh, surrounded with police evidence uh, uh, markings all over. There was a huge area for medical triage uh, that is quiet now. And now they are continuing to fight fires inside the building, Peter, so they can go ahead and try and get anyone who may be still trapped in the rubble. It took them five hours before they were able to get into the building initially and begin to look for people who might be trapped and injured. John, we heard a while ago, and there's some chaos here too, as you can understand, about, the ca about a preliminary casualty figure at the Pentagon. Do you feel you have a good handle on that? I do not have a good handle on it, Peter. There have been wild rumors from several hundred to over a thousand. It's impossible to know at this point, uh, and I will not speculate. And you may have said this most recently, uh, and we would never want you to speculate, John. Um, we, we believe, I believe you said now what you said earlier before, that the senior military officials of the Pentagon, none of them have been hurt to the best of your knowledge. Don Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, is in just a few minutes going to hold a briefing inside the Pentagon for a very few number of reporters that are over there. Um, and all of the military chiefs have been accounted for, and they have been spending the day in the National Military Command Center. Presumably, they have initially been looking at rescue uh, options, but we also believe they are looking at retaliation options. But before that can happen, of course, the United States has to determine who they believe is responsible for this attack. I'll tell you, Peter, there is a pervasive sense of anger among the military officers I've talked to today. They have mentioned again and again Pearl Harbor saying that it is going to be dwarfed, the number of people killed in Pearl Harbor so many years ago, just about 2,600. They say the casualties from this one are going to be so much worse. They are ready to go to war. There is a sense of war here at the Pentagon. And thank you very much, John McCrethy at the Pentagon. We'll be coming back to you many times in the course of the evening. The question is, go to war with whom? Uh, because uh, from the FBI, from the CIA, from the Pentagon today, no warning of this whatsoever, no knowledge of who's involved. No clues yet as to who's involved that we have heard about in any respect today. It has been interesting today to try to focus on the president, too, because the country does so clearly focus... I can't read that, I'm sorry. ...does focus on the president in a moment like this for leadership. And I believe that Ann Compton, who's been with the president all day in a very tight group of people with the president, is on Air Force One and can talk to us at the moment. Annie, can you hear me? Yes, Peter, I can. We're just getting off of Air Force One. He has arrived back in Washington with a dramatic flight with F-16s and F-15s on either wing as he came into Andrews Air Force Base. And the president feels it's important to address the nation tonight. Later this evening, he will give what we are told is a message of reassurance to Americans that the United States has been tested before and has always passed those tests. And uh, when we saw him briefly toward the back of the plane, he was resolute. Annie, thank you very much. And the president will take a helicopter, I gather, from Andrews Air Force Base um, downtown, or do we know that? Well, we do know that, but it's one of the things we aren't going to talk about until he's safely at home. Well, we just did, inadvertently, <laughs> and, and as we had not been told not to talk about it, but there was yeah. some question. The president does traditionally come from Andrews Air Force Base down, and one assumes given the extraordinary security that's uh, surrounded the president today and how the Secret Service has moved him first from Florida and then out to Nebraska and now to, to Louisiana, first of all, then to Nebraska and back to Washington, president all over the country. Here's the Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, who's been in the Pentagon all day. 
and we're having difficulty hearing him, and one should not be surprised if there isn't some kind of, if there's some kind of hookup that didn't work today. Very, very rarely today have we had a problem. So we'll have our reporter on the scene listen to this, and the moment that we can hear him, we will go back to him. But in the meantime, Claire Shipman is just outside the, uh, the White House across Lafayette Square. Claire, I want to check in quickly with you, if I may, to know that if we know anything about the President's plans for this evening, that we, in some respects, haven't had on the air today or go beyond what Anne's reporting is. Well, what we do know is that we're told by sources who've been with the president today that he is extremely upset, of course, about what has happened, but agitated and angry. Somebody told us that the language he will use tonight will be retaliatory. He will express his impatience. In other words, he will say there won't be a long time spent thinking about how to act once Claire, the U.S. is confident. I apologize. I wouldn't interrupt you if sure. we couldn't go back to Mr. Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense. Well, the best laid plans for so here we are. Kind enough to uh, come down and has been with us. Uh, we've very recently had a discussion with the President of the United States. Uh, Chairman Hugh Shelton has just landed from Europe. Um, Secretary of the Army Tom White, who has a, a responsibility for incidents like this. Uh, as executive agent for the Department of Defense is also joining me. Uh, it's an indication that the United States government is functioning in the face of this terrible act uh, against our country. I should add that the briefing here is taking place in the Pentagon. The Pentagon's functioning. It'll be in business tomorrow. I know the interest in casualty figures, and all I can say is it's not possible to have solid casualty fi figures uh, at this time. And uh, the various components are doing roster checks, and we'll have uh, information at some point in the future, and as quickly as it's possible to have it, it will certainly be made available to each of you. Uh, I'll be happy to take a few questions after uh, asking uh, First General Shelton, uh, if he would like to say anything, and then we will allow the others to make a remark or two. General Shelton, Thank outgoing you, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Secretary just said, today we have watched the tragedy of an outrageous act of barbaric terrorism carried out by fanatics against both civilians and military people. Acts that have killed and maimed many innocent and decent citizens of our country. I extend my condolences to the entire Department of Defense families, military and civilian, and to the families of all those throughout our nation who lost loved ones. I think this is indeed a reminder of the, tragic, the tragedy and the tragic dangers that we face day in and day out, both here at home as well as abroad. I would tell you up front, I have no intentions of discussing today what comes next, but make no mistake about it, your armed forces are ready. Chair. Chairman of the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, Carl Levin. Our intense focus on recovery and helping the injured and the families of those who were killed is matched only by our determination to prevent more attacks and matched only by our unity to track down, root out, and relentlessly pursue terrorists, states that support them, and harbor them. They are the common enemy of the civilized world. Our institutions are strong, and our unity is palpable. Senator John Warner. Thank you. As a past chairman, uh, preceding Carl Levin, I can assure you that the Congress stands behind our president, and the president speaks with one voice for this entire nation. This is indeed the most tragic hour in America's history, and yet I think it can be its finest hour, as our president and those with him, most notably our Secretary of Defense, our Chairman, 
and the men and women of the armed forces all over this world uh, stand ready not only to defend this nation and our allies against further attack, but to take such actions as are directed in the future in retaliation for this terrorist act. A series of terrorist acts unprecedented in world history. We call upon the entire world to step up and help because terrorism is a common enemy to all and we're in this together. The United States has borne the brunt, but who can be next? Step forward and let us hold accountable and punish those that have perpetrated this attack. Again, I commend the Secretary, the Chairman, and how proud we are. We spoke with our President here moments ago. He's got a firm grip on this situation, and the Secretary and the General have a firm grip on our armed forces and in communication of the, the world over. The Secretary of Defense, uh, Carl much. Levin, Senator we'll Democratic take Senator Carl Levin. Oh, they're uh, going to take questions. Let's stay we'll here with adjourn. this and see if, we, if, if anything Charlie. is revealed. Mr. Secretary, did you have any inkling at all, in any way, that something of this nature and something of the scope might be planned? Uh, Charlie, we, we don't discuss intelligence matters. I see. And, how, and how, how would you respond if you find out who did this? The uh, obviously the president of the United States has spoken on that subject, and those are issues that he will address in good time. Mr. Yes. Secretary, we are getting reports uh, from CNN and others that there are bombs exploding in Kabul, Afghanistan. Are we at the moment striking back, and if so, is the target Osama bin Laden and his organization? I've seen those reports. Uh, they, in no way, is the United States government connected to those explosions. What about Osama bin Laden? Do you suspect him as the prime suspect in this? Um, it's, it's, it's not the time for discussions like that. Mr. Secretary, you said you could not be specific about casualties. Can you give us some characterization of whether it's dozens <coughs> or hundreds in the, in the building? Well, we know there were large number, many dozens, in the aircraft that flew at full power, uh, steering directly into the, between, I think, the first and second floor of the uh, uh, opposite the helipad. Uh, you've seen it. Uh, it there, there cannot be any survivors. It, it just would be beyond comprehension. The, um, there are a, a number of people that they've uh, not identified by name, but identified as being uh, dead. And uh, there are a number of casualties. But uh, we're, the FBI has secured the site and the um, information takes time to come. People have been uh, lifted out and taken away in ambulances, and uh, the, the numbers will be calculated, and it will not be a few. Mr. Secretary, could you tell us what you yes. saw? Mr. Secretary, do you consider what happened today, both in New York and here, an act of war? Mm -hmm. There is no question but that the attack against the United States of America today was a, 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 a vicious, a well-coordinated, um, massive attack against the United States of America. Um, what words the lawyers will use to characterize it uh, is for them. Is this the does Secretary that mean of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, uh, being asked all the obvious questions, and let's just quickly review them before we move. Did they have any inkling of this in advance? The answer is they don't discuss this. Every single piece of evidence we have seen all day says the United States in, in no way had any inkling of what was going to happen, and if they did, boy, somebody missed something somewhere. Uh, Secretary, reaffirming what we reported to you already, the U.S. has no, or saying again what we've said already, that the U.S. has no involvement in Afghanistan, uh, the violence occurring in Kabul tonight. This is not a time to discuss or whether or not the United States suspects Osama bin Laden, but he's been at the top of the list of American suspects for international acts of, acts of international terrorism for so long now, it's impossible not to imagine he wouldn't be at the top. Casualties in the building, he says there are many, and then he goes on to make the point that we sometimes forget in covering New York and the Pentagon today, and that is the people who died on the aircraft. 266 people died on, on three aircraft today, uh, four aircraft today. The two that crashed into the Trade Towers, the one that crashed into the Pentagon, uh, and <clears throat> the one that crashed uh, in Pennsylvania today, whether or not it was on a mission or not. Was this an act of war? 
Secretary of Defense and everybody else in the government today, uh, you can expect to be very careful about using the phrase an act of war because it imposes on the United States um, certain requirements to respond in certain ways if they find themselves involved in a war, especially with, with another country. We believe this is now the President coming from uh, Andrews Air Force Bay to the White House, but it was Senator John Warner, one of the most senior politicians involved with the military for many, many years in that year now, and a man with a real sense of history and knowledge of history, surely, who describes this as the most tragic hour in America's history. I think there will be people, not least of whom are historians throughout the country, will, will argue with the senator about that today, given the attack on Pearl Harbor, given the invasion of Normandy and heavens knows given the first and most tragic days of the of the Civil War in 1861 who will argue with that characterization but it does give you some real sense at the moment of how intense the feeling is not only in the political establishment in the country as a whole as well and all sorts of other countries I'm getting messages from countries all day today people deeply profoundly shaken uh, by the experience that the United States has had today. I want to go to Washington now because Claire Shipman is there right opposite the White House. We'll come back to Charlie Gibson. And I, I don't know that there's a day that's gone by uh, since I've been in this job that there haven't been threats somewhere in the world to some facility somewhere. It's a, uh, it's one of the uh, complexities of the intelligence business that you have to um, sort through those kinds of things. Um, but. Uh, uh, we don't get into the specifics, yes. You raise your hand, sir? Yes. So, I wanted to say, rumors earlier in the day... Let me interrupt uh, the Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, to report uh, that this is, uh, we believe, Marine One, the President's helicopter, now landing on the south yeah. lawn of the White House, which is the usual procedure, bringing President Bush back to uh, the White House from Andrews Air Force Base. The President began this day in Sarasota, Florida, where he was going to be promoting his agenda on education, then flew to Louisiana, uh, where he, later this evening he will be addressing the nation, Air Force One, about to touch down on the south lawn of the White House. So John King, our senior White House correspondent, is standing by. Uh, John, uh, what do you have over there? Wolf, as you watch Marine One land here on the South Lawn, we have just been allowed back into the White House. We were evacuated as well earlier today. First, let me read you a statement from the President. This, during his travels back to Washington, the President telling his National Security Council, quote, we will find these people and they will suffer the consequences of taking on this nation. We will do what it takes. No one is going to diminish the spirit of this country. Now, the President will return to the White House. One of our cameramen, Mike Vanagan, also just a short time ago shot pictures of Laura Bush coming back to the White House in her motorcade. We do not know where she was being kept in a secure location at this time, but the First Lady is also back in the White House. Also, after Secretary Rumsfeld finishes his briefing at the Pentagon, a number of Bush administration cabinet officials will brief here at the White House to bring us up to date on the activities of their agencies. One, we're told, the Health and Human Service Secretary, Tommy Thompson, who is involved, of course, in the medical help blood banking and others. He will bring us up to date on his agency. Attorney General John Ashcroft also on his way to the White House as well. We are told all of this leading up, all these briefings from administration cabinet members leading up to a nationally televised address from the president tonight to the American people from the Oval Office. You see there Marine One sitting on the south lawn of the White House, a virtual ghost town throughout much of the day as it was evacuated. The president now back in Washington and at the White House. We'll John, uh, the uh, trips to Louisiana and Nebraska that the president took today, that, that was designed, we're told, and we see a Marine officer uh, uh, walking off Marine One as the president we expect uh, to emerge from Marine One any second now. Uh, we assume that was because uh, security personnel thought it was too dangerous for the president to come right back to Washington. Is that right? The first stop at Barksdale in Louisiana was designed so the president could get to a command and control center that is fortified and structured so that he could be in contact. You see the president there emerging from Marine One, saluting his Marine escort on the south lawn of the White House. The direction he turned, it appears he is heading straight into the Oval Office. Had he gone straight, that is the path into the White House residence. The president turning left, indicating he will go straight into the, his office, the Oval Office. The president saying nothing as he walks by there. The first stop was to get him to a command and control facility so that he could have secure conversations with the vice president. not be affected by that. This is what is coming up next on TSN. We will have... Uh